Hi guys, how are you all? I hope everything is good at your end. Yes. Okay, so basically this video is for the much awaited thing that is the yes as you can see here on the board it is for the revision lecture it is for the revision lecture of economic laws paper 4 law and in that it is about the economic laws in around 9 nine and a half hours okay approximately in 9 hours we are going to try to revise entire economic laws from paper 4 point of view since it is a super quick revision okay since it is a super quick revision we will try to cover 90 to 95 percent of the entire syllabus but in a super quick manner we are going to touch upon each and every provision okay almost each and every provision i'll try my level best that we do that yes and uh, this can be referred by the new syllabus students right this can be referred by the new syllabus students plus it can also be referred by the old syllabus students for the common topics right it can be referred by the old syllabus students also for the common topics which are included in this particular video now coming on to coming on to ma'am from where have you taken okay what notes are we supposed to refer along with this so let me tell you for this i have used my fifth edition book the book which i authored uh, the fifth edition book which was applicable for the November 2020 examinations I have used that particular book and if you do not have the book and if you wish to study if you wish to revise from this particular book you can just buy it out from our website that is arpitatulsian.com which uh, uh, I feel I feel if you are in a dual mind that should we go for the book or should we not then in that case yes if you are using these particular revision lectures uh, revision lectures plus this particular book will definitely help you to get an exemption don't worry about that okay so so in these nine hours i hope i hope these nine hours would be really productive for you it will be really helpful for you to revise the entire economic laws right and and if you feel if you feel that you enjoyed these lectures if you feel that those were good for you those were helpful for you do let me know it you know it adds on a motivation for me also right so this was all about this was all about this was all about the introduction for the revision lectures and now you can just go ahead and you can start these revision lectures right thank you so much all of you enjoy the revision lectures and do let me know if you love them right thank you so much okay so let's start with a super quick revision of uh, money laundering act 2002 first of all the basic meaning the basic meaning of the term money laundering as we always understand is conversion conversion of illegal money right first of all earning the illegal money and then converting that illegal money into legal money or trying to show that or trying to show that trying to show that illegally obtained money as if we have earned it from the legal sources then uske baad mein, next thing next thing is your purpose of the act purpose of the act we had three things in the purpose of the act first one first one was to prevent money laundering second one was confiscation or arrest of that particular person third one was to combat combat means to reduce the channelizing of money into illegal activities right then after that we had seen the three stages of money laundering okay just close your eyes and try to recollect okay three stages of money laundering what were the three stages of money laundering the three stages of money laundering first one was placement placement was a stage where the money is earned right the money is put in through the system the money is earned from illegal activities next thing the second step was your layering right second step was your layering layering was such a step where the money whatever illegal money we have earned we were just dividing that money into different different transactions right maybe give, giving some amount as gift or depositing some amount into bank accounts etc in different different uh, places we were just spreading that particular transaction so that it becomes very difficult to find out the origin of that particular amount and the last one the third stage was your integration integration is such a stage that where your black money or your tainted money or not so clean money gets mixed up with your white money and now it becomes almost uh, near to impossible to find out that this is an uh, this is the money which was earned from the illegal sources then after that we did the definitions we did some important definitions in the definitions the first one okay everyone concentrate the first one was the definition of money laundering 
uh, for which I told you to remember the section. It was section two one P, right? And when we go to section number two one P, they had told us that two one P. Uh, it's written in two one P that the definition has been assigned the meaning in section number three, right? In section number three, when we were studying, any person whosoever is directly or uh, whosoever directly or indirectly does that akka a k k a where that person attempts to indulge. Or that person is knowingly assisting, or that person is knowingly is a party, or that person is actually involved in any in what in any process or activity in any process or activity connected with connected with proceeds of crime, including its CPU and CPA. CPU CPA stands for concealment, possession, acquisition, right? Then uh, claiming it as untainted property, then projecting it as untainted property and its use. Then such person shall be guilty. Then such person shall be guilty of the offence of money laundering, right? Then after that they had just inserted an explanation which we are not yet sure that whether the ICI is going to notify it or not as on today. That if this is going to be this process of money laundering is going to be a continuing activity. That is till the time the person enjoys the proceeds of crime. Till the person enjoys this particular proceeds of crime, till that time he will be guilty of the offence of money laundering, right? Out. The next thing, the next thing was the definition of proceeds of crime. Proceeds of crime was what? Proceeds of crime was nothing but a property, any property, any property which was derived. Okay, any property which was derived by any person directly or indirectly out of what? Out of the criminal activity, out of the criminal activity. Which criminal activity, ma'am? Which relates to your scheduled offence, right? And this can be held in India or this can be held outside India. So it should be basically derived from some criminal activity which pertains to the scheduled offence. Right then, after that, the next thing that we had taken the example was if suppose if suppose uh, we have uh, we had derived some cash out of the scheduled offence and if that cash is also put in a bank account, the interest earned on this particular cash will also be treated as the proceeds of crime. Okay, connecting definition will do immediately. That was the definition of property. Then we'll come back to the old ones. Okay, property definition because we had just seen the term property here. Right, we had just seen the word property. That's why I'm just going to the definition of the term property. Property was nothing but any immovable assets, any immovable assets, any tangible, any intangible assets, whether corporeal, that is material or immaterial, including any deeds, title, rights, etc. In that particular property, wherever located, whether located in India or whether located outside India, that is treated as property as per the Act PMLA. Right. Next thing. Next thing was nothing but a very simple definition. That is payment system. Payment system is what? Payment system is nothing but a system that enables a payment to be made between two persons. Who two persons, ma'am? Between the payer and between the beneficiary. I had told you to write the examples for all these things. We had discussed about uh, settlement. We had discussed about debit card, credit card operations, NEFT, RTGS, ECS, etc. All these are the examples of your payment system. And the next definition which comes up here is the definition of the schedule offence, which is very very important just for your understanding, right? What was this uh, definition of schedule offence telling us? Definition of schedule offence was it is nothing but three parts. We we had made three bifurcations for that. Any offence specified under part A of the schedule or any offence specified under part B of the schedule, but provided provided the total value involved in such offence is more than or equal to rupees. One crore. That customs offence which we had seen, customs offence section number one hundred and thirty-two of the Customs Act, and the last one was offences specified under Part C of the Schedule. Okay, offences specified under Part C of the Schedule. And for your knowledge, I had at the end of the book, I had just shown you that which all uh, offences are covered in all those parts. Right now, going on to the main section, that is section number four, which is very very important. Section number four basically talks about the punishment for the offence of money laundering. If any person is convicted of, for the offence of money laundering, then in that case, by default, punishment is imprisonment ranging between three years of not less than three years, which can go up to seven years, and fine of any amount without any limit. But if that person commits the offence of money laundering under 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 para two of part A, under para two of part A of schedule, that is the schedule offences. That is under Narcotic Drugs and Psychotropic Substances Act 1985. Then that person will be liable for punishment. That is imprisonment, not less than three years, but which may go up to ten years and fine of any amount without any limit. Right? This was the punishment given under section number four. The next one. Next one was a very simple section which was talking about verification of identity by the reporting entity. Whenever, whenever any particular they are, they were focusing mainly on the reporting entity, saying that, saying that 
this is the person through whom there are very high chances that the black money gets converted into white money right so they there were four methods of authentication first one was your online authentication under aadhaar we had discussed about otp systems biometric retina etc second one second one is your offline authentication under the aadhaar act third one was use of passport under the passports act and the fourth one was talking about any other officially valid document as notified by the central government can be used for authentication in this they had told that banks banks in reporting ngt also specifically the banks banks of uh, banks are supposed to give the uh, or they are supposed to do the authentication uh, by way of online authentication method but suppose if uh, that uh, any particular person is not required to obtain aadhar then the bank has to make all the other three modes also available to its clients okay and the other entities other than the banks the other reporting entities they have to go by the three last three methods and if they want to go with the online authentication method then in that case they have to make sure okay they have to make sure that they fulfill they have to make sure that they fulfill all the privacy and the security standards and how to fulfill that etc everything will be prescribed by the central government and whenever any authentication is done like uh, online authentication etc and aadhar etc is done then in that case uh, none of the reporting entity should save our aadhar number in their database right and plus they should not uh, save the biometric thumb impression etc also with them this is what we had studied in section number 11a now going to the next important answer that is section number 12 right section number 12 was talking about section number 12 was talking about obligations obligations of the reporting entity in this we had studied mainly three obligations if you remember it very nicely and i know you remember it very nicely the first one the first duty of the reporting entity is to maintain the record of all the transactions for a period of 5 years from the date of the transaction second point was to furnish the information to the director director means that government official that is the directorate right and the third one third one was maintaining the record maintaining the record of all the documents maintaining the record of all the documents between the client and its uh, uh, between the client and the reporting entity and that has to be maintained that has to be maintained for a period of 5 years 5 years after the business relationship between the client and the reporting entity has ended or the account has been closed whichever is later so for that much time it has to be maintained and whatever information whatever records whatever documents etc are maintained furnished etc everything should be kept confidential this is what we study right the next important thing coming up there is section number 12a okay section number 12a section number 12a talks about access to information in this i had told you to remember only three terms my dear students only three terms first one is the director can call for the information it can call for the information which we maintained above in the above section number 12 or in the next coming section that is section number 12 double a whenever it calls for the information it is the duty of the reporting entity to furnish this particular information and whatever information is sought by the director here okay whatever information is now with the director even that has to be kept confidential right even that has to be kept confidential going to the next section going to the next section next section is section number 12 double a what is this section 12 double a ma'am section 12 double a was your enhanced due diligence done for some specified transaction only for those high cash deposit or cash withdrawal transaction forex transactions high import transactions etc for them the reporting entity was supposed to exercise enhanced more care right more prevention was to be done in this particular section and in that in that there were uh, some methods by which three three methods by which we were doing this enhanced due diligence first one was first one was authentication online authentication should be done under aadhar if aadhar is not required then the authentication should be done under by any other processes right then second one second point was we have to check for the ofs ofs stands for ofs stands for ownership right f stands for checking the financial means checking the ownership checking the financial position and checking the sources of the funds from where is the client earning the money right and then the last point was last point was to take some more additional steps to find out the purpose of the transaction that why is the client and the third party entering into such type of transaction and what is the relationship between these two people okay if we are able to check each and everything okay if we are able to check each and everything then in that case then only the reporting entity will allow the client to do the uh, specified transaction if even one of the thing is not fulfilled then in that case then in that case it won't allow the client to do the specified transaction suppose if all the conditions are fulfilled suppose if all the conditions are fulfilled then the specified transaction will be done 
no doubt in that right the specified transaction will be done but later on if they come to know that something is you know something is not clear something is suspicious etc or it might involve proceeds of crime then in that case it will uh, do now greater scrutiny it will uh, impose greater scrutiny on these particular transactions and whatever documents you had or whatever information you had gathered in this a b and c points as you can see here on the board whatever information you could gather in this a b and c point that has to be maintained for a period of 5 years okay that has to be maintained for a period of 5 years as you can see here it has to be maintained for a period of 5 years from the date of the transaction this was your section number 12 double a right the next section comes up is section number 13 which talks about the powers of directors in relation to the reporting entity means the director can uh, do the inquiry okay it can do the inquiry in respect of the reporting entity it can either do it suo moto or it can do when someone has made an application to the director then director can tell the reporting entity to get it books of accounts audited this audit will be done by the chartered accountant but the expenses will be borne by the central government and the third one was if if the uh, reporting entity its employees its director still does not obey or still does not complies with the obligations etc then it has four options available with it it can give warning right it can give the directions to comply with any instructions it can tell the reporting entity to do periodic reporting do a periodic reporting and the last one if nothing works then it can impose a penalty ranging between rupees 10000 to rupees 1 lakh for each failure right but but your only penalty can be imposed but no civil or criminal proceedings can start against the persons mentioned right that is no civil or criminal proceedings can start against them we cannot make a case out of it right we cannot give any imprisonment etc also for not giving any particular uh, information because we know that if the director does not get information from here it can get information from any other sources also and how to maintain the information how to furnish the information under section 12 remember where we were maintaining it for a period of 5 years etc how to maintain it when to, when to how to furnish it in what format it has to be done everything everything will be done everything will be done by the central government in consultation with the rbi okay everything will be prescribed by the central government in consultation with the rbi right now the next important section which comes up here the next important section which comes up here is section number 5 which talks about the provisional attachment mainly right whenever whenever the director enforcement director whenever the director or the officer but not below the rank but not below the rank of the deputy director means at least you should be of the rank of deputy director who is authorized by the director okay if they have the reasons in writing okay if they have the reasons to believe in writing in writing that so and so person is having the proceeds of crime or so and so person is likely to conceal it so and so person might transfer it to some other person and because of that it can lead to a bigger case then in that case okay whenever they have got such a doubt okay whenever they have got such a doubt then in that case the property can be provisionally attached before attaching the property there is a small legal requirement there is a small legal requirement that they have to forward a report to the magistrate or the court stating that sir we are going to do the sir that we are going to do the provisional attachment this can be done under pmla also and this can be done okay whenever we receive a request from the other country's government also for doing this right now suppose if suppose if it's an emergency case that we cannot wait until we you know till the time we go and file it with a magistrate or the court etc then in such case filing the report with a magistrate is not a prerequisite requirement then first you can do the provisional attachment and then you can go and file the report with the magistrate once the provisional attachment is done once the provisional attachment is done it will be valid for a maximum period of 180 days from the date of the order right in between if we get any stay order okay if the proceedings are stayed by the high court then whatever number of days by which it was stayed that much number of days will be added right that much number of days extra we are going to get plus ad hoc period ad hoc period of 30 days also we are going to get right but this is only applicable when when there is a stay otherwise normally it is going to be valid for a maximum period of 180 days okay and as soon as as soon as the provisional attachment order is passed as soon as the provisional attachment order is passed from that day within a period of 30 days the director will go and submit all its facts it will just file a complaint before the adjudicating authority who is the next level of authority stating that sir i have done the provisional attachment because of so and so reasons right in provisional attachment in provisional attachment that particular person can still enjoy the property that particular person can still enjoy the property the only restriction that we are making the only restriction that we are putting on that particular person is you cannot 
the only restriction that we are putting on that particular person is you cannot sell off this particular property right you cannot sell off this particular property that is the only restriction next thing next thing which next thing which comes up here is section number 6 okay how do we ma'am what is this adjudicating authority ma'am what is this adjudicating authority what was this adjudicating authority or how do we form it first of all adjudicating authority adjudicating authority is constituted by the central government right it is formed by the central government it can form whatever number of adjudicating authorities it wants in adjudicating authority in adjudicating authority it should have one chairperson and two other members and these two other members should have the experience in lafa right lafa was law accounts administration finance or law accounts finance administration whatever you want to call it right these many members right these many members would be there now ma'am what is the work of this adjudicating authority let's study that in section number 8 Okay, once the adjudicating authority receives that complaint, from whom did it receive the complaint? It received the complaint from the director. Once it receives the complaint under Section Five, then in that case, then in that case, it is going to issue a show cause notice. It is going to issue a show cause notice on that particular person, asking him to give the reasons that why we should not declare as if your property is involved in money laundering, and please show the sources of your income and sources of your funds that from where have you. earned it for that particular period uh, for that particular purpose we are going to give him a time period of at least 30 days okay if the property is kept in someone else's possession we are going to issue the notice on that particular person also if the property is co-owned then we are going to give the notice to both of them means it will be given to all the co-owners now now once we are after that we are going to receive the reply okay now depends suppose if we receive the reply okay and if the reply received is a satisfactory reply then in that case the case gets closed then and there itself if suppose the property was provisionally attached if it was earlier provisionally attached then it will be released now but if the property that we have received uh, sorry if the reply that we have received is not at all satisfactory if that is a nonsense reply okay or it is a obviously non unsatisfactory reply for the adjudicating authority then in that case then in that case the adjudicating authority will confirm the attachment it will confirm the attachment if suppose earlier provisional attachment was done then now attach it will be attached if earlier no provisional attachment was done then now it will be directly attached and if at all there is no reply received at all then it is by default assumed as if the property is involved in the offence of money laundering and then the again the attachment order will be passed okay once the attachment order is passed this attachment is valid for a period of 365 days right this is valid for a period of 365 days and this becomes final as soon as as soon as the special court passes as soon as the special court passes the order of confiscation okay this order of confiscation is passed by whom this is passed by the special court for for this particular 365 days again if there is any particular stay levied then we are going to get that many number of days extra but remember here we are not going to get what here we are not going to get any ad hoc period okay now now when the case goes to the special court special court will finally determine whether it is involved in money laundering or not if it determines that yes it is involved in money laundering then the property stands confiscated property stands confiscated to the central government and if the property is not if there is no offence of money laundering then finally the case is closed and the closure report is submitted to the special court by its judge right then after that suppose if there is any particular person who claims that okay say for example if there is any particular co owner who claims that i was totally unaware about this particular thing and i have suffered a loss because my other co owner had uh, you know had hidden uh, this fact from me that had uh, that this particular property is involved in money laundering then if you prove this fact if you prove this fact before the special court then the special court can direct the central government to compensate the other person with the particular interest then whenever the property gets confiscated whenever the property gets confiscated to the central government it goes to the central government free from all the encumbrances that is no liability goes along with the asset the central government will just enjoy the asset the liability will stay will still stay on your head only means we are not discharged from the liability right another thing till here we were studying everything about the confiscation now comes now comes the pointers about the arrest okay now comes the pointers about the arrest now suppose if suppose see now if property is not involved say for example there was no property involved but if we just want to arrest any particular person or if along with confiscation we want to arrest any particular person then ma'am what is the process 
Okay, now see, uh, just remember one thing: any offences under PMLA is a cognizable offence, right? That is a cognizable of offence. Cognizable offence means arrest can be done without an arrest warrant, right? Arrest can be done without an arrest warrant. So now, ma'am, who has the powers to go and arrest? I'll tell you: director, deputy director. or any other officer authorized by the central government okay any order will be passed by that uh, by the central government on the officer so director or dd or any particular officer authorized by the central government if they have reasons to believe they should have reasons to believe uh, otherwise a separate penalty is there for them if they do it for time pass right they should have reasons to believe with them in writing that so and so person is guilty in the with the offense of money laundering then in that case we can <coughs> then in that case we can arrest that particular person okay now when you are arresting that particular person okay when you are arresting that particular person then on what reasons you have arrested etc this order copy will be forwarded also to the adjudicating authority just to keep him in the loop right in a <coughs> sealed envelope we are going to forward him the copy the person who was arrested the person who was arrested will be taken to either to the special court or judicial magistrate or metropolitan magistrate whatever is there in their jurisdiction and he will be taken to the, these particular courts within a period of 24 hours of his arrest and this 24 hours this 24 hours is going to exclude the traveling time this is what we had studied right now arrest point gets over here right now after that acha one more thing applicable here is whenever we are arresting that any particular person then we'll have to first give a cognizance right we'll have to give the cognizance of the offense that is going to come up later in the notes so we are going to do it later don't worry then after that now say for example if the reporting entity okay if the reporting entity is aggrieved okay just try to understand if the reporting entity is aggrieved by the order passed by the director or director is aggrieved by the order passed by the aa or the person is aggrieved by the order passed by the aa then that person has an option that he can go and file an appeal before the appellate tribunal within a period of within a period of 45 days from the date of receipt of the order he can go and file an appeal if there is a sufficient cause example death etc then in that case this 45 days uh, means uh, the delay can be condoned even beyond a period of 45 days ma'am how many days that has not been specified in the act okay now then the matter goes to the appellate tribunal right once the matter goes to the appellate tribunal the appellate tribunal can pass either it can confirm the order or it can modify the order or it can set aside the order right but uh, Or everything will be done only after giving a everything will be done only after giving a reasonable opportunity of being heard. First, they are telling that AT should try to dispose it of as early as possible. Okay, AT should try to dispose it of as early as possible, and then they are telling endeavour should be made to dispose it of within a period of six months from the date of filing the appeal. And once the appeal decision is finalised, then that copy will be forwarded to whatever parties are there in the appeal, and additionally to the adjudicating authority or the director as the case mein ma'am who is the appellate tribunal here appellate tribunal under pmla is not directly given but we are taking the reference from the one specific act called as smugglers and foreign exchange manipulators act 1976 the appellate tribunal who is there under that particular act same person is going to act as an appellate tribunal under pmla okay so time period here was 45 days and 6 months don't forget that next thing ma'am what powers does this appellate tribunal have appellate tribunal has all the powers as mentioned in the code of civil procedure civil code powers it has minimum plus plus it can regulate its own procedure it can make its own extra powers it can exercise some things on its own also and plus it should be guided by the principles of natural justice that is before giving any particular conclusion before giving any particular conclusion it is necessary for it to give a reasonable opportunity of being heard to all the parties who are present before it ma'am what do you mean by the powers of civil court ma'am what do you mean by the powers of civil court powers of civil court is nothing but what summoning any person enforcing the attendance of any person and examining any person on oath second one was discovery and production of documents then taking the evidences receiving evidences on affidavit self sworn document right then giving orders issuing commissions for examination of books records documents etc then part, uh, passing any ex parte orders reviewing its own decisions etc right these all are the powers which are there with the civil court and same powers same to same powers are vested with the appellate tribunal also right now this appellate tribunal as we already know it works in form of benches right it works in form of groups generally there is a chairperson 
generally there is one judicial member and one technical member right if there is any dispute if there is or equality of votes between the judicial member and the technical members etc or between the members of the tribunal then they are telling first of all by default rule is all the decisions will be taken by majority but ma'am what if there is an equal majority then what are we going to do then either the chairperson will involve himself or the chairperson will put one more member in the bench and then we are going to take a revised majority and that will be final and that will be binding right now whenever whenever we want to go and file any appeal okay whenever we want to go and file any particular appeal then in that case appeal can for going and filing any appeal either we can go on ourselves or we can appoint any authorized representative who can appear before the appellate tribunal okay but when the party okay when the party is uh, the director etc director adjudicating authority etc then they can appoint the cg or the director can appoint presiding officers presiding officers to present the case right the next thing next thing which is coming up here next thing which is coming up here is civil court not to have jurisdiction means civil court will not entertain any particular case under pmla right civil court will not entertain any particular case under pmla because we have got authorities here who are going to deal with the respective cases at different different levels nor the civil court will grant any injunction any stay etc no orders will be passed by the civil court in this particular act it does not have any particular powers okay don't forget that next coming on to the next thing that is next level of appeal now till now the order was passed by the appellate tribunal now if any person is aggrieved any person is aggrieved by the order which is passed by the appellate tribunal that person can go and file the appeal before the high court within within a period of 60 days right within a period of 60 days which can be further extend by maximum another 60 days if there is any sufficient cause right and whenever we are going and filing any appeal before the high court it can be only on any question of law or question of fact so and uh, once the decision acha we are no one to tell to the high court that you have to dispose of the appeal within so and so time there is no time period specified under pmla for the same now coming on to the most important court in this particular chapter that is the special court ma'am what is special court special court is nothing but the session courts right session courts are designated these are designated by whom these are designated by the central government after consulting the chief justice of the high court whatever number of courts we require that many number of special courts will be designated for respective respective jurisdiction and as soon as as soon as it is notified it will be returned in the notification okay it is going to consider the offenses under section 3 of the act that is offenses of money laundering it is going to do the trial of the offenses which are punishable under section 4 of the act okay now special court is not only there only for pmla it is going to do the or try the offenses of other acts also and it is mainly regulated right it is mainly regulated by the code of criminal procedure code of criminal procedure 1973 right another important very very important answer section number 45 section number 45 says that offenses offenses under pmla like i mentioned just some time back was offenses under pmla will be cognizable and non bailable right what do you mean by cognizable ma'am cognizable means that person can be arrested without an arrest warrant right and non bailable means that person cannot be released on bail that person cannot be released on bail except under some circumstances right now first one ma'am what was the first exception public prosecutor should be given an opportunity to oppose the release and if he opposes the release if he opposes the release but still the special court is of the opinion that this person will not commit any particular offense even if he is released on bail then in that case that person can be released on bail right second one if there is any particular person whose age is under 16 years or if that person is a woman or if that person is uh, sick or infirm or if that person along with any other co accused person uh, is liable where the sum involved is less than is less than rupees 1 crore in all these cases if the special court directs if the special court directs then that person can be released on bail right now now here uh, they are telling that whenever that per particular person was arrested okay whenever that particular person was arrested at that time special court has to be given a cognizance of the offense that is we have to go and give a note of this particular offense to the special court ma'am who will give this this will be given by either the director or by the uh, cg officer or by any central uh, state government officer who is authorized by the central government right 
then after that some general points were given up there that who is this public prosecutor ma'am this public prosecutor is no one but a normal advocate a practicing advocate having 7 years of experience under union or state who is having good special knowledge of law then we had seen the types of authorities under the act right in our regular lecture we had seen it in the beginning itself we have director then we have the additional director then we have the joint director then we have the deputy director then we have the assistant director and then we have other class of officers etc right and these these authorities also these authorities also they have got all the powers as vested in a civil court right just like just like the powers were there with the appellate tribunal right same powers are there with the with these particular directors also then the last few sections left here is now uh, contracting state okay contracting state contracting state is nothing but the other foreign country or territory with which the indian government is having a treaty treaty or an arrangement right now for what purpose do we need this for cross border implications we need this ma'am what do you mean by the offenses of cross border implication now suppose if the conduct by uh, if any particular person has done any particular activity obviously this relating to this criminal activity of schedule offense etc which has been done outside india okay if that has been done outside india and the proceeds of crime has been brought to india or vice versa the activity has been done in india but the proceeds of crime has been taken outside india then in that case then in that case it will be treated as an offense having cross border implication so ma'am what to do for that so for that to be on a safer side what you can do is you can enter into an agreement with foreign countries ma'am what are the two primary reasons what are the two primary reasons or what is the benefit of entering into a treaty with some other foreign country benefits of that is first one we can enforce the provisions of the act right if we have agreement with any other country we can enforce the provisions of the act and second is mainly for exchange of information okay mainly for exchange of information ma'am suppose now ma'am suppose now suppose now uh if we if we actually want to use this make use of this particular treaty okay if we want to make use of this particular treaty then in that case there is a concept called as letter of request okay if we need the help if we need the help if the investigating officers under pmla any level of officers directors etc if any level of officers need any particular help then in that case they can go and make an application to the special court if the special court thinks fit okay they'll have to convince the spe special court that sir this evidence is available only outside india and if the special court is satisfied if the special court is satisfied then in that case the special court will go and make an application or will go and submit the letter of request to the authority of the other country and then accordingly we'll receive the information and we can proceed with the case after that next thing next thing is suppose if the other country requires any help from us if the other country requires any help from us then in that case we will receive okay central government will receive the letter of request from the other country and after that we can act on it right if when the central government receives it the central government will forward it to the pml authorities or to the special court and then we will provide them whatever information is available with us right then another thing was two important section section number 62 and section number 63 section number 62 was a search which was done for no reason that is a vexatious search done that is if any particular authority any particular director etc who does any search or who causes any search or who causes any arrest to be made without any reasons recorded in writing then that person on after conviction after conviction that person will be liable for imprisonment up to 2 years or fine up to rupees 50000 or both okay then after that the similar thing if any person gives any false information about the other person and he causes the search to be done of the other person or causes the arrest to be done of the other person then the person who has given false information that person will be liable with the same punishment that is imprisonment up to 2 years or fine up to rupees 50000 or both right then any person who willingly knowingly if he misbehaves that he does not answer the question which was asked by the authorities he does not sign the document which he was supposed to sign he uh, he was given any particular summon but that is he was uh, asked to submit any particular documents he was asked to attend the office of the authorities etc but he did not do it knowingly then in that case after giving a robh a penalty ranging between rupees 500 to 10000 can be levied for each default on that particular person right and for these particular section that is 62 and 62 and 63 one cognizance that is special court will not sue or to give imprisonment cognizance has to be given to the that is note has to be given to the special court that sir please consider this case and that note can be given to the special court only after obtaining the 
sanction of the central government so first the complainant has to go to the special uh, it has to go to the central government special uh, central government will either approve it or reject it within a period of 90 days and then only if it approves then only we can go and submit the note with the special court and then only the special court is going to act okay and all these procedures are regulated by the code of criminal procedure 1973 then whatever information was there with the directors or the prescribed authorities under pmla we had studied that all those information has to be kept confidential however they can share this information with the other law authorities also right they can share the information for the purpose of a levying of tax that is with income tax gst etc they can do it with the fema authorities they can do it with the drug uh, offense authorities etc then it can do it with any other authorities also which have been specified by the central government there is no harm in sharing the information with any other authorities right and then now the general provisions whenever any fine or penalty in the entire chapter whenever whenever the any fine or penalty has been levied then we have to pay it within a period of maximum 6 months if we do not pay it within a period of maximum 6 months then they are going to director or the other authorities are going to recover it from us uh, as uh, uh, as per the method which was given in the income tax provisions right another thing another thing was offenses by the companies whenever any particular company has committed any offense then they are telling the person in charge the person in charge will be guilty and he will be liable to be proceeded against right the monetary fine is uh, on the company and the imprisonment etc is on each and every defaulting person in charge okay but there are only two cases there are only two cases where he can be saved that is one thing if he proves okay subjective if he proves that this offense was done without his knowledge or he had exercised due diligence to prevent such kind of offense from happening right then in that case is all uh, suppose if he is not covered in this apart from this whoever was guilty or whoever was present at the time the offense was done that particular person would be liable right then uh, this pmla is going to have overriding effect on any other law right so if there is any contradicting provisions about money laundering in some other act also then pmla is going to override another thing last important thing coming up here is whenever that person who was you know who was the aggrieved person or who was a guilty person here if that particular person passes away during the proceedings or that particular person becomes insolvent then ma'am how is it going to happen okay then in that case say for example if that person was supposed to go and that person was planning to go and file the appeal before the appellate tribunal before he passed away or before he became insolvent then in that case and in the meanwhile he passed away or he became insolvent then in that case the legal hire the legal hire or the official assignee in case of insolvency that person can go and file the appeal before the appellate tribunal or the high court as the case may be and about the recovery of fine see imprisonment won't be applicable on the legal hire or the official assignee in case of monetary fine in case of monetary fine it will be recovered from the legal hire to the estate to the extent of the estate which was taken from the deceased person and in case of insolvency ma'am what to do with the fine whatever amount the official assignee could recover from the assets of the insolvent person that much amount we can recover in the law and in case of insolvency that insolvent person can still be sent to the jail because he is at least into existence then he can be sent to the jail and last then we studied was that money laundering is not siphoning of funds siphoning, siphoning of funds siphoning of funds is nothing but uh, where you are trying to remove the money illegally but the money was not earned from illegal sources in money laundering the source of money itself was illegal right so money laundering is way too ahead and way too advanced as compared to the siphoning of funds and after this amendment act 2009 has been passed they are trying to combat they are trying to reduce this money laundering activities they are trying to prevent the terrorist financing etc they are trying to keep a larger check on banks casinos financial institutions etc and uh, because of this yes india has also entered into the fatf that is financial action task force in which they are trying to combat uh, the money launderer right and these time periods etc whatever is given in your book at the end the, the all these things we have already considered so this was all about your pmla revision i hope you all have understood this properly let's start with the revision of surfaisi act 2002 full form of surfaisi is securitization securitization and reconstruction of financial assets and enforcement and enforcement of security interest there are three terms in the chapter 
फर्स्ट वन इज सिक्योरिटाइजेशन सेकेंड टर्म इज रिकंस्ट्रक्शन ऑफ फाइनेंशियल एसेट्स और वी कैन और वी कैन कॉल इट एज और वी कैन कॉल इट एज एसेट रिकंस्ट्रक्शन एंड द थर्ड पार्ट थर्ड पार्ट इज एनफोर्समेंट ऑफ सिक्योरिटी इंटरेस्ट राइट so now first first let's try to understand with the help of this particular diagram or if you have already studied then just try to recollect by closing your eyes just try to recollect this particular diagram uh, by which we are going to understand the entire concept of securitization so first of all first of all in your securitization you have you have your borrower borrower is the person who has already taken the money from the bank he has already given secured asset he has already given some security to the bank or to the financial institution who is called as a originator in this particular chapter so borrower has taken the money from the originator and it has given a secured asset to that particular originator but now the borrower fails but now the borrower fails to pay that particular money originator has tried its level best to recover the money from the borrower but the originator is now not able to recover the money from the borrower so for that purpose the originator or the banks or the financial institution goes and up, uh, approaches the uh, arc that is the asset reconstruction company or the spv that is your special purpose vehicle which is nothing but which is nothing but uh, a person who is going to act as a recovery person for you just like we called it as a vasuli bhai right so now the originator is going to go to the uh, arc or to the spv and it will tell that sir i am having a headache on my particular head that is i am having a, a loan that is an asset for uh, the originator it is an asset i have an asset on my head from which i am not able to realize any money and that asset as you can see there on the board that asset is called that asset is called as a financial asset so the originator as per the agreement with, between the originator and the arc the originator transfers the originator transfers the headache originator transfers this particular financial asset to the arc or to the spv it also in addition to the financial asset is it also transfers the secured asset which was taken from the borrower right so now basically the originator has given the financial asset originator has given the secured asset to the arc and in return in return arc will pay arc will pay the money to the originator right arc will pay the loan amount to that particular originator from where will the arc raise this money the arc is going to raise this money from the qibs or from the investors it is going to raise the money now when we take the money from the qibs we have to issue we have to issue them the security receipts right so the arc is going to issue the security receipts to the <coughs> to the investors or to the qibs and in return it will take the cash from them this cash will be ultimately paid to the originator and because of this the originator gets free from the picture right after this after this the arc or the spv <coughs> will utilize its powers it will utilize its powers and it will recover the money from the borrower after recovering the money from the borrower it will pay periodical returns also to the investors etc and on the respective due date it will redeem it will redeem the security receipt right as in when as in when the security receipts are redeemed can i say the qib is go out of the picture as soon as we borrow the as soon as we recover the money from the borrower even the borrower gets out from the picture the originator was already out from the picture earlier itself right so now ultimately this particular project this particular loan etc has been fully settled by this particular asset reconstruction company right so basically here the role the major role of the arc was just to help the originator by applying its extra powers to recover the money from the borrower and then temporary by working on the money of the investors because temporary we worked on the money of the investors temporary by working on the money of the investors we helped the originator by realizing the money from the borrower right this was the concept the same thing has been put up in the words here the same is the concept of your securitization right now the securitization the securitization is done by whom the securitization is done by the asset reconstruction company this is done by the asset reconstruction company so now let's learn something more about asset reconstruction company two sections are very very important here one is section number 3 and the other one is section number 4 section number 3 is going to talk about registrations of the arc and section number 4 is going to talk about the cancellation of certificate of the arc now first of all arc asset reconstruction company comes under the purview asset reconstruction company comes under the purview of the rbi so it has to first obtain a there were two prerequisite first of all it has to obtain a certificate of registration from the rbi 
and it will get the certificate of registration only if the first basic requirement is fulfilled that is it should have a net own funds it should have net own funds of at least of at least rupees 100 crore or any or any higher sum as may be prescribed by the RBI right this should be the basic prerequisite requirement right this is the basic prerequisite thing which is to be required only if only if this condition is fulfilled then only the RBI is going to grant you the certificate of registration but for granting this even though you have fulfilled the basic prerequisite requirement even after that it is going to check seven points okay it is going to check seven points of yours now let's try to recollect those seven points first one that ARC should not have suffered any losses during the last three years, right? It should not have suffered any losses during the last three years. ARC should have made adequate arrangements for three things. ARC should have made adequate arrangements for three things. First one, realization of the financial asset. Financial asset was nothing but the loan. That is, it should have made the plan that how are we going to realize the loan from the borrower. Second was to pay periodical returns. To whom are we going to pay the periodical returns? We will pay the periodical returns to the QIBs and the third one is to redeem whenever the security receipts becomes redeemable at that time we have to redeem. So adequate arrangement for these three things have to be done by the ARC. Right. Then the third point. Third point was the directors. The directors of the ARC should have adequate uh, professional experience. Okay. What professional experience ma'am? What degree? What qualification etc. That will be specified by the RBI to that particular ARC. Then none of the directors, none of the directors should be convicted of any offense involving moral turpitude, any grave offense, right? Then the sponsor, sponsor means the person who is holding the paid of share capital of more than or equal to 10%. That person should also be a fit and a proper person, fit and a proper person as per whom, as per the criteria specified by the RBI. Then ARC has complied with or the ARC is in a position. ARC either it has already complied with or it is in a position to comply with the prudential norms. Prudential norms as specified by the RBI. And the last point was an extra type of point where the ARC has to comply with any other one or more conditions as specified by the RBI. Okay, I am repeating these seven points again so that it gets fit in your mind. First point was ARC should not have suffered any losses during the last three years. Okay, ARC should make adequate arrangements for three things. First one, what was the first one? Realization of financial assets acquired to pay periodical returns and then to redeem, to redeem the investments of the QIB. Third point was, third point was the director should have adequate professional uh, experience. None of the directors should be convicted of the offense, of any offense involving moral turpitude. Sponsor, that sponsor should be a fit and a proper person as per the criteria specified by the RBI. ARC has complied with or is in a position to comply with the prudential norms as specified by the RBI and the ARC has complied with one or more conditions as specified by the RBI right if all of these conditions are fulfilled okay if all of these conditions are fulfilled then in that case the RBI is going to grant you the certificate of registration no issues in that but if any of the condition is not fulfilled then in that case the RBI will first give you a reasonable opportunity of being heard and only then only if the RBI is not still not satisfied then only it will reject your application and once listen try to understand try to recollect once the application is here rejected then no appeal is possible because now you are the RBI had already given the criteria that you have to fulfill so and so criteria if you have not fulfilled then in that case no appeal provisions are applicable here okay and once say for example if I have been granted okay if I have been granted the approval by the RBI then they are telling that basically three things basically three things whenever you are doing any changes in the three things you have to take the prior approval of the RBI okay if you recollect then without looking at the board you can just try to recollect the answer with me okay three things three things for which you have to take the prior approval of the RBI first one whenever there is a substantial change in management whenever there is a change in the address of the registered office and whenever there is any change in name if any one of the thing also changes if any one of the thing also changes then we have to take prior approval of the RBI right then after that now once we have granted see say for example if we have been rejected then you are totally out of the picture but if we have been granted the certificate of registration then there are seven circumstances okay mainly mainly there are they have listed seven circumstances where our certificate of registration can be cancelled again who is going to cancel the certificate of registration 
the one who granted us the one who granted us was the rbi so the rbi may cancel your the certificate of registration if two times sees to five times fails to okay if the arc ceases to carry on this main business of securitization or asset reconstruction if it ceases to hold investments from the qib if it fails to comply with rbi directions if it fails to comply with rbi conditions if it fails to maintain the proper books of accounts as per the law if it fails to submit the books of accounts for its inspection or if it does not take the prior approval of the rbi whenever it was required ma'am when it was required for the above three points which we just studied whenever there was any change in management address change name change etc right so now we can just repeat it without looking into the book seven cases seven cases first one it ceases to carry on the business of securitization or asset reconstruction then it ceases to hold investments from the qibs it fails to comply with rbi directions it fails to comply with any condition it fails to it fails to maintain the <clears throat> books of accounts it fails to submit the books of accounts for inspection or it fails to obtain the approval of the rbi whenever it was required okay if any one of the point is attracted then the rbi will first give us the reasonable opportunity of being heard and then if it is still not satisfied then it can uh, straight away cancel our certificate of registration okay now listen one important point here whenever your our certificate of registration is cancelled okay but if the arc is not satisfied with that particular cancellation then it can go and file an appeal before the central government ma'am to whom in the central government to the secretary of ministry of finance okay to that particular person we can go and file an appeal within a period of 30 days okay as soon as we get the communication from the rbi that your certificate has been cancelled from that day within a period of 30 days you can go and file an appeal you can go and file an appeal within a period of 30 days okay now after this the decision which will be given by this particular secretary of ministry of finance that will be full and final and this is not further appealable right now listen suppose if finally we come to a conclusion finally if we come to a conclusion that a certificate is going to be cancelled if we come to such a conclusion then in that case then in that case we will still be deemed as okay we, we will still be deemed as arc till the time okay they are telling here for the interest of the investors we will still be deemed to be the arc till the time all the investments have been paid back okay or all the money has been paid back to the investors this is done why this is just done to protect the interest of the investors or we can say to protect the interest of the qibs right this was one particular section then after that a few one time read sections coming up here now here they are telling that as soon as as soon as there is an agreement between try to recollect that diagram okay as soon as there is an agreement between the uh, between whom between the uh, this originator that is your bank pfi etc and the arc remember we were transferring two things the financial asset that is the loan was transferred from the banks etc to the arc then even the secured asset was getting transferred to the arc so every you know every right in that particular asset comes to the arc now and before this before this suppose if any uh, legal suit was filed by the bank or the financial institution in any court or the drt now there is going to be a substitution of name means that case is not going to get over uh, just by this transmission but as soon as as soon as the case comes or as soon as the loan comes from the bank to the uh, arc at that time even the case comes in the names of in the name of the arc that is arc will have to go to the court and it will have to get the name get its name substituted and after that it may uh, abate the case or it can apply for closure of the case okay then the next section next section was talking about consortium financing right in consortium financing what was happening in consortium financing a group of banks had funded a single borrower so all these group of banks were having a single security right they were having a single security which they had taken from the borrower so now now imagine all these say for example three banks were there all the three banks had funded a single person now these three banks have gone and filed a legal suit in their jurisdictional courts or the jurisdictional drt for recovery of money from the borrower but now now they all cumulatively they all mutually decide that let's go let's go and uh, approach the arc so now when the case comes in the hands of the arc arc will go to their senior 
okay arc will go to the senior of the drt means see now as of now the three respective cases were pending before respective drt now before any particular at okay before any particular jurisdictional at the arc can go and it can apply for substitution of the name okay the case gets merged into one particular case and then the name of the arc is substituted there the only difference here is the arc will go to the appellate tribunal ma'am which appellate tribunal will it go to it will go to any one of the three drts like in a, in our example here we had three banks so can i say all the three banks would have gone to the respective drts example one is drt of mumbai another one is drt of pune another one is drt of bangalore say for example so you can go to any one of the respective appellate tribunal and you can get the case consolidated merged and the name be substituted right and then whenever whenever the bank financial institutions etc whenever they get out of the picture okay means whenever they are handing over everything to the arc and before they exit they have to make an application they have to make an application or they will basically intimate the borrower okay the bank will intimate the borrower that now i am going to go off the picture i am going to go off the picture if you plan to make any payments okay if the borrower plans to make any payment please do not make the payment in favor of the bank financial institutions etc directly go and make the payment to the arc because now our case is with the arc right similarly they were telling us here that uh, whenever now we are talking about the transaction between the uh, qibs and between the arc okay we are talking about the transaction between the qibs and the arc whenever the arc raises money from the qib it has to issue security receipt right issuing security receipt is mandatory for that we'll have to frame a particular scheme right a particular scheme will be framed and then we are going to issue the uh, security receipts to the qibs right then in that case then in that case we are also going to make sure we are also going to make sure that the qibs are paid the periodical returns on time otherwise why would they invest in the arc and plus they are going to get their money on time at the time of redemption all these things we have to ensure ma'am we means whom means the arc has to ensure that they are not hampering they are not destroying the interest of the investor and whatever security receipts okay whatever security receipts are issued by the arc to the qibs all these are nowadays registered under the sebi act right these are registered under the sebi act so that's why registration under a particular act is not required okay if you have studied once you should be able to recollect registration under the registration act registration under the registration act 1908 is not at all required right so till here basically right from section number 5 till section number 8 you had all the one time read sections now comes the next important section that is section number 9 right section number 9 provides about measures for asset reconstruction which is the second part of the chapter okay first part was securitization second part talks about your reconstruction of financial assets or you can call it as asset reconstruction so now asset reconstruction as the name suggests this will be done by whom asset reconstruction will be done by the arc only ma'am how can it do asset reconstruction what are the measures of doing asset reconstruction so we have got a code in that particular answer and the code is management sale reschedules the specs right where management okay again here we are going to get seven points here first one is uh, either proper management means the arc can get involved in the management or the arc can take over the management of the borrower's business or it can sell or lease the whole or part of the undertaking of the borrower's business or it can reschedule the debt maybe it can provide more time period for payment of this particular debt s uh, inspects s stands for settlement it can agree with settlement with the borrower means it can say that okay instead of paying full 100% pay 80% pay 70% as the case may be so it can enter into settlement okay p stands for possession taking possession of the secured assets right if you want to realize the money from the security which was given by the borrower so before selling that we'll have to take the possession of that so we'll take the possession of that then we can even do the enforcement of security interest ma'am what is enforcement enforcement means actually selling of the security which was given by the borrower borrower at the time of taking the loan it had it would have given some security now first we took the possession of that particular secured asset and now we are giving the uh, and now we are selling of that particular asset okay selling of that particular asset is nothing but enforcement of security interest 
and the last word C S. Last word C S stands for conversion. Conversion of debt into shares. Can I say in our balance sheet, the bank, PFI, or uh, the financial institutions or the ARC would be standing in the liability side for us. Right. So now, if we are not in the position to pay off the loan, then in that case, we can issue them the shares in lieu of the loan. Means instead of loan, we can give them the shares. Okay, which is nothing but one of the method of your internal reconstruction. Okay, so I am revising again. I am again revising these points for you. Total seven points were there. First one, proper management or takeover of management of the borrower's business. Then sale or lease of whole or part of the under undertaking. Then rescheduling the payment of the debt. Then settlement of the debts, then taking possession of secured assets, then doing enforcement of security interest, and then conversion of debt into shares. Right? Any one, any one of them can be used for uh, the measures of asset reconstruction. Right? Any one of them can be used. So now we have just understood one thing is ARC can be engaged into two main activities. Okay, ARC can be engaged into two main activities. First one is the securitization thing, and the second one is asset reconstruction. Okay, securitization was the first answer that we studied, and the asset reconstruction was the last section number nine that we have studied. So now, ma'am, ARC can do only these, or ARC can do other things also. Yes, ARC can do other things also. ARC can do other things also, but only after taking. Only after taking the prior approval of the RBI, ma'am. What other things can the ARC do? ARC can, ARC can act as a recovery agent. ARC can act as a recovery agent for the banks, etc. It can act as a receiver. Okay, it can act as a receiver whenever it is appointed by the court or the tribunal, or it can act as a manager. Okay, manager for managing the property. We are going to study this in section number thirty. Manager as per section number. 13 okay so three things it can act in three capacities first one is a recovery agent for the banks etc then then it can act as a manager as per section number 13 and then it can act as a receiver okay receiver generally when it is appointed by the court or the tribunal right but it can act in these capacities only after only after taking the approval of the rbi because 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 initially we had taken the approval for the rbi only for two businesses that is for securitization and asset reconstruction Right then, then they are telling that while solving such a big dispute, okay, while solving such a big dispute, that is the main dispute is between whom? The main dispute is between the uh, banks and the borrower, or we can say it is between the borrower and the ARC now. Right, intermittent, that is in between, in between there can be disputes. Maybe between the banks and the ARC, maybe there can be dispute between the ARC and the QIBs, etc. So here they are telling that while solving such a big dispute. Okay, while solving such a big dispute, if you come across any small small problems, then make sure that those problems, make sure that you do not drag those problems to the court. Instead, you can settle those problems by way of conciliation or arbitration, as provided in the Arbitration and Conciliation Act, nineteen ninety six. Okay, so out of small problems, please do not create a big one. Already, you have a big problem to be solved there, right? Then after that, after that, now we have certain powers of the RBI coming up here. We have certain powers of the RBI coming up here. Now RBI is exercising powers on whom? In this particular chapter, RBI is exercising powers on the asset reconstruction company, right? So now they have just broadly classified into three parts. First one is RBI has the power to determine policies. Okay, policies for whom? Policies for the ARC and to give directions. Okay, this we have already studied before also that it. Uh, RBI can give directions to the ARC, and the ARC has to comply with those. Ma'am, what kind of policies are you talking about? It can be about how to maintain the books of accounts, maybe. It can be about income recognition. It can be about provision for the bad debts. It can be about the capital adequacy ratio. It can be about the risk weighted assets. About all these things, these are just the illustrative examples. Okay, about all these things, the RBI can issue directions or it can frame the policies for the ARC. Okay, this was one part. Okay, second part. Second part is it can call for information. RBI can call for information from the ARC. It can call for some statements from the ARC. It can call for some documents from the ARC, etc. Right. And the third one, last part. Last part is it can tell the ARC to get the audit done, audit or the inspection done. Right. To carry out the audit and inspection. And whenever the RBI tells us this, okay, whenever the RBI tells the ARC that you have to get the audit done, you have to get the inspection done, or we will appoint, 
the officers to do inspection etc at that time at that time it is our duty okay it is a duty of the arc it is the duty of the officers employees etc of the arc that they should cooperate and assist with the rbi person okay and if the rbi comes to a conclusion that there is some problem in the management then it can remove it can remove the chairperson it can remove any other director from the arc company it can remove it from the asset reconstruction company and instead of that okay instead of those defaulting persons it can appoint additional directors okay instead of the old management it can appoint additional directors plus it can appoint its own officer who can act as an observer it can appoint its own person who can act as an observer observer means a person who is going to report from time to time who is going to communicate to the rbi from time to time that how is the arc performing now right then after that the most important section of the chapter that is section number 13 right section number 13 talks about what section number 13 talks about enforcement of security interest right it talks about enforcement of security interest ma'am enforcement of security interest was a part it was a part of asset reconstruction also this we had studied in section number 9 so either you can do it as a measure of asset reconstruction or you can simply do it okay means a bank can also simply do it or it can be done by the asset reconstruction company also because because okay now i'm going into the content of the chapter uh, content of the section enforcement of security interest can be done by the banks by the financial institutions or even by the asset reconstruction company and that too without any intervention or without any prior approval of the court or the tribunal because it's always written in the loan agreement that if the borrower fails us to pay the loan amount okay then in that case we can do the enforcement of security interest okay now listen for this for this first we'll have to wait for the loan to be classified as npa okay we'll have to wait for the loan to be classified as npa npa classification happens after a period of 90 days from the due date okay once the due date is there once you get the due date after that means whatever is the due date of repayment of loan after that after a period of 90 days from this particular date the loan is classified as npa okay as soon as the debt is classified as npa then in that case the secured creditor ma'am secured creditor means whom secured creditor means the bank financial institutions or the arc okay it will give a notice okay it will give a just like a demand notice it will give a demand notice to the or just like a warning notice it will give to the borrower that boss you have to make the payment within a period of 60 days from the date of this notice we are giving you 60 days time from the date of this particular notice that you have to pay your liabilities in full and if you do not pay in full then we are going to do enforcement of security interest under section number 13 okay we are going to do this under section number 13 now there can be possibilities that uh, once the borrower sees that particular notice he plans to pay the amount right if he pays the amount then there is no problem or if he thinks that no there is some problem with this particular notice and he raises the objection okay the borrower raises raises any particular objection now when the borrower raises the objection then in that case the objection will be submitted by the borrower to the secured creditor okay now once the secured creditor receives that particular objection either it can consider it or it can say that this is not acceptable okay if it says that this is not acceptable okay if the bank or the financial institution says that no your objection is not at all sustainable then within 15 days okay within 15 days from the date when we have received the objection from the borrower from that day within a period of 15 days we are going to again intimate to the borrower that boss your why have we not accepted your objection okay so basically 60 days time period was given 60 days time period was given to the borrower to make the payment or to raise the objection if any and then once we receive the objection uh, once the secured creditor receives the objection within a period of 15 days within a period of 15 days we are going to intimate them if we have not accepted their objection okay now now in this case again a second round of raising the objection etc is not going to happen once we have intimated them that your objection is not sustainable after that we can exercise a few measures now what measures can be exercised ma'am what measures can be exercised for this for this pmnm was the code that we had studied p stands for taking the possession now see if we want to do enforcement then we'll have to take the possession of the secured assets right then next m stands for we can take over the management suppose if we think that 
the value of the security interest is not sufficient so in that case we can even take over the management okay we can take over the management we can handle their business till the time we don't realize the money right then in that case after that after that another option available with us is we can appoint the secured creditor can appoint any person as manager just like we had seen earlier any person can be appointed as a manager who is going to manage the assets maybe he'll see that is the asset saleable at what best value it can be sold are we supposed to incur any expenses for the selling this asset etc all these things will be handled by the manager and the last one was if the secured asset is kept with any other person then we are going to issue a demand notice to that third person that now the secured creditor is going to have the uh, right on this particular asset right so the code was p m n m where p was standing for taking possession of the asset m was standing for take uh, m was standing for taking over the management or uh, taking over the management of the business then another n n was standing for giving notice demand notice to the third party and m was standing for appointing any person as manager right this was applicable for section number 13 now here they are telling that what if the borrower now plans to pay the money what if the borrower says no no i don't want to get into all these things i will pay the money then no problem we will not do enforcement we will allow him to pay the money okay what if what if the company is not returning back the money of the debenture holders then in that case then in that case debenture trustee debenture trustee can do the enforcement debenture trustee can do the enforcement but only after waiting for a period of 90 days okay just like in banks we waited for npa you are also we are going to wait for a period of 90 days then only after following the full procedure of section number 13 only after that it can do the enforcement okay then in case of consortium financing okay in case of consortium financing there was only one asset given to all the banks together so now when are we going to do the enforcement suppose if one agrees if two disagrees then what are we going to do then we are going to check the value okay we are going to check that the secured creditors who say secured creditors who say that enforcement should be done that person those person should be holding at least 60% of the total outstanding debt okay if that person is holding at least 60% of the outstanding debt then in that case enforcement is going to happen okay so basically here if majority having 60% of the outstanding debt says yes enforcement should happen then in that case we will do the enforcement okay then suppose while doing all these process if the company decides to go for winding up if the company decides to go for winding up then in that case we shift from surprise act to the companies act and the winding up will be done as per the companies act okay and if we are not able to realize the money if we are not able to realize the full money from the enforcement of security interest then for the balancing amount for the balancing amount we can still go and make an application to the court or the drt saying that sir we have not received so and so amount sir we have not received so and so amount so we file a case for recovering the balance amount okay then then for section number 9 for section number 9 that is uh, measures of asset reconstruction and for section number 13 that is enforcement of security interest in both these particular sections we had studied we had studied that possession of secured assets can be taken okay if the secured creditor is not able to take the possession of the secured asset then it can go and seek the help of an authority called as cmm or dm cmm stands for chief metropolitan magistrate and dm stands for dm stands for district magistrate okay we can go and seek their help and if we go and seek their help they have to assist us within a period of 30 days okay we can tell them that sir please help us in getting the possession of the asset sir please help us in getting the uh, possession of the papers documents etc so whenever we make an application from that day within a period of 30 days they have to help us suppose if they are not able to help us within a period of 30 days then we are going to get an extension of another period of 30 days so maximum within a period of maximum within a period of 60 days the cmm or the dm as the case may be is going to help us right then then comes an ex section that is section number 15 a very important section section number 15 talks about manner and effect of takeover of management okay now takeover of management again came in two sections it came in section number 9 also the first point proper management and takeover of the management and it also came it also came in section number 13 uh that is uh, your enforcement of security interest okay now whenever the secured creditor takes over the management whenever the secured creditor takes over the management right in that case in that case they have to publish a notice about this in two newspapers 
ओके इन टू न्यूज पेपर नोटिस विल बी पब्लिश अबाउट दिस मैम इन विच टू न्यूज पेपर वन इज द इंग्लिश लैंग्वेज एंड अदर वन इज द लोकल लैंग्वेज और द वर्ना के लिए लैंग्वेज ऑफ दैट पर्टिकुलर प्लेस वेर द बोरोज ऑफिस इज सिचुएट okay once this happens after that once this happens once we give a notice then in that case the secured creditors will appoint new persons new persons in the management ma'am why new persons in the management because now we have taken over the management if we have taken over the management then the existing management persons will vacate their offices and now our persons will be appointed in the company who is going to or in the management who is going to run the show ahead right then then after that now here they are telling that once the management is taken over then shareholders rights get withdrawn okay shareholders rights get withdrawn ma'am which rights get withdrawn shareholders cannot appoint the directors okay shareholders cannot appoint the directors shareholders cannot pass any resolution without taking the approval of the secured creditors and shareholders cannot file any or cannot pass any resolution or they cannot proceed for winding up until unless secured creditors have given their approval because now there is a shift of control right there is a shift of control from the shareholders to the secured creditors because default has happened with these particular secured creditors right and once once these particular secured creditors uh, get their money back okay once they get their money back and once they are totally you know out from the company's balance sheet then they are liable to restore the management okay they are liable they have to compulsorily restore the management they have to appoint new persons before they exit the company okay but but in case but in case if their debt was converted into shares so now they become the part of the shareholding then in that case it is not their liability to restore the manager then now when the old managerial persons when the old managerial persons were told to vacate their offices okay can i say this is nothing but a premature termination so in this case of premature termination in this case of premature termination they are not eligible for any compensation for loss of office okay this term is important compensation for loss of office they are not going to get because you know it is kind of such a thing that they have done default they have defaulted with the secured creditors and that's why when we are removing them they won't be eligible for any compensation for loss of office but yes but yes if they were eligible for any salary or remuneration or sitting fees by whatever name you want to call it as for the period for which they have served earlier earlier they were serving in the company right so for that or any other amount is due to them from the company that will still be paid to them so only what won't be paid to them is the compensation for loss of office right now let's go to the next part next part is your appeal provisions okay next part is your appeal provisions now now if if any particular person okay generally the borrower etc if any particular person is aggrieved by the measures if any particular person is aggrieved by the measures which we had taken under section number 13 if we were aggrieved by the measures measures taken means that pm nm point if we were aggrieved from that then in that case we can go and file an appeal before the drt debt recovery tribunal we can go and fi file the appeal before the drt within a period of 45 days okay whenever the measure was taken 45 days from the date of the measure whenever that measure was done from that day within a period of 45 days we can go and file an appeal before the drt okay ma'am which drt you can go to any three drts any of the three jurisdictional drts where the cause of action arises location of the borrower where the secured asset is located where the secured asset is located where the possession of secured asset is there or where the branch of the bfi is maintaining this particular account any one of the three drts you can go and file the appeal you can go and file the appeal within a period of 45 days okay when you go and file the appeal when you go and file the appeal before the drt now it is in the hands of the drt to decide the case either it can give the decision in the favor of the borrower or it can give the decision in the favor of the secured creditor suppose suppose if it gives the decision in the favor of the borrower itself then the whatever possession had happened earlier that will come back to the secured creditor okay if any management of the borrower's business was taken over then again that will be restored etc so in whosoever favor in whosoever favor the appeals decision is given accordingly the steps will be taken ahead okay and the drt drt has to try to dispose of this appeal as soon as possible or as expeditiously as possible like they have called it here and they have to dispose it of within a period of 60 days okay they have to dispose it of within a period of 60 days from the date of application 
appeal we had to file within a period of 45 days and they have to dispose it off within a period of 60 days okay similarly now similarly now Suppose if here the borrower is residing, suppose if here the borrower, Acha, one more thing, one more thing here, one more thing here, if suppose, uh, if it is not disposed of within a period of 60 days, then this can be extended further and the total period, the total period should not exceed a period of 4 months. Okay, so filing, I am repeating it again, we have to go and file the appeal within a period of 45 days that has to be disposed of within a period of 60 days, 60 days can be condoned further but the total period should not exceed a period of Four months okay just remember just remember it's not 60 days plus four months okay it's four months including 60 days okay now in the similar case in the similar case suppose suppose if that particular borrower is residing in the state of Jammu and Kashmir and if he is aggrieved by the uh, you know measures taken under section number 13 then in that case he can go and file the appeal before the court of district judge right before the court of district judge no time period etc has been prescribed here right then in that case after that suppose going to the next level of appeal okay going to the next level of appeal uh, to the non jammu kashmir cases okay to the non jammu kashmir cases if any of the person okay if any of the party is aggrieved by the decision given by the drt then that particular person can go and file an appeal before the appellate tribunal okay it can go and file the appeal before the appellate tribunal within a period of 30 days ma'am 30 days from when 30 days from the date of the receipt of the DRT's order. So, whenever we have received the DRT's order from that day within a period of 30 days, we can go and file an appeal to the appellate tribunal. Okay. Now, here in this case, appellate tribunal is going to dispose of the appeal as per the provisions of some other act called as the RDD BFI Act. Okay. Called as the RDD BFI Act 1993. The appeal etc. Appeal provisions, disposal of appeal will be done as per the provisions of that act. Okay, one special point coming up, one special point coming up in this particular section is, in this particular section is whenever the borrower wishes to go and file the appeal before the appellate tribunal, he has to deposit, he has to deposit 50%, 50% of the outstanding debt, outstanding debt either as determined by the DRT or as determined by the secured creditor, whichever is lower. Okay, whatever amount has been determined by them whichever is lower into 50%, into 50% that much amount has to be given as a deposit to the appellate tribunal. But seeing to some circumstances, etc., they are telling that appellate tribunal can reduce this percentage from 50%, it can reduce this percentage to 25%. Okay, so instead of 50%, it can be any percentage up to 25%. Okay, and similarly, uh, talking about the person who was uh, the resident of Jammu and Kashmir, for that particular person, initially he had gone to the court of the district judge. Right now, if he is aggrieved by the decision of the court of the district judge, then it can go and make an application directly before the high court. Okay, it can go and make an application or appeal before the high court again within a period of, again within how many days? Again within a period of 30 days. Okay, now when it goes and files the appeal uh, within a period of 30 days, again that paying the deposit 50%, 25%, same to same, copy paste clause is applicable even for the residents of Jammu and Kashmir, right? And then the next part, a small part in the chapter, not very important, but we can just understand and we can just revise it once, that is caveat. Okay, if any particular person, if any particular person uh, has a hint or has an apprehension that some person is going to file a case against me, then I can go and file an application in form of a request to the court that sir, please do not pass any particular order until unless you give me a notice about the case being filed against me. Okay, then in that case, the document that we are filing with the court, that document is called as a caveat and the person who is filing this particular document, that particular person is called as a caveator. Okay, so I am going to go and submit this to the court and this caveat is going to be valid for a maximum period, for a maximum period of 90 days. Whenever I go and submit this document to the court, then the court, then the whenever any other person goes and files a case against me, then the court will first intimate me about the case being filed and then only it can pass any particular order. Okay, similarly, the caveator is also supposed to file that notice of caveat with the person, with the person on whom I have a doubt that this person can file a case against me. So it becomes an obligation on that third person also that whenever he goes and files a case against me in the court, even he has to submit all the document, papers, etc. with me 
also okay so that basically basically i get an opportunity i get an opportunity to represent my case before the court okay now <clears throat> whenever the possession <clears throat> whenever the possession of the assets etc take place but later on in the appeal we come to know that the borrower was not at all guilty okay the borrower was not at all guilty and for no reasons you know he was harassed he was aggrieved etc then in that case if he asks for any compensation okay if he asks for any compensation or if he uh, says that i have incurred some amount of cost etc for all these proceedings then the court can direct okay the court can direct the other party to pay to the borrower the required amount of compensation and the cost okay this will be decided by the court how much will be paid that will be decided by the court and then and then we have the last point coming up here we have the last point coming up here that is first of all in case of nbfc the law will be applicable to the nbfc is only if it has an asset base only if it has an asset base of more than or equal to rupees 500 crore and it can invoke surfaisi it can apply surfaisi only to only to those cases where the individual case value is more than rupees 1 crore okay and the uh, uh, next point npa classification we have already studied in ipcc also and now also we can just revise it that npa classification happens after a period of 90 days okay 90 days whenever the due date is there from that day we'll calculate 90 days only after that the debt is classified as a non performing asset okay why are they using the word asset the word asset is used because for bank financial institutions etc we use the word asset and surfaisi comes into picture surfaisi comes into picture only it came into force it it was deemed to have come into force from 21st of june 2002 may be relevant from mcq point of view maybe if they are just check uh, testing your uh, memory right so this was this was all about your surfaisi provisions i hope i am very very clear with these particular provisions of surfaisi Okay, so let's start with the revision of Arbitration and Conciliation Act, 1996. The Act came into force from 22nd of August, 22nd of August, 1996. The Act is applicable to whole of India. This was the amendment which I told you earlier. There were some uh, specific parts which were not applicable to Jammu and Kashmir, but now after amendment, now after amendment, the entire law, the entire law is applicable to the state of Jammu and. kashmir right the law has three main motives or the law contains of three main things first one was domestic arbitration second one was your international commercial arbitration and the third one third one was your enforcement of foreign awards right enforcement of foreign awards in india these were the three main things about which the law was talking right now but in our syllabus the most important things that we have in our syllabus is maximum things about arbitration or most of the things about arbitration and then we just had the overview of conciliation right conciliation was there only uh, thoda thoda then after that now we have uh, something called as alternate methods of dispute resolution alternative methods of dispute resolution the most traditional method of dispute resolution is going to the court apart from that apart from the ordinary court system the another methods that you have got for uh, solving the disputes is your arbitration first of all two most common methods are arbitration and mediation mediation was just like your litigation next thing uh, which came up was your arbitration and apart from that we have conciliation we have negotiation etc these are the other methods these are the other methods of your uh, alter uh, or um, other methods of dispute resolution right now the basic basic provisions about these uh, alternative methods of dispute resolutions are contained in mainly three laws okay which three laws one is the arbitration and conciliation act 1996 next one is the legal services authorities act and the last one is your normal one that is the code of civil procedure right these are the basic laws which deals with the alternative methods of dispute resolution now if i just ask you if i just ask you what do you mean by arbitration okay now we are get, getting into arbitration we just have two things to do one is arbitration and the next one would be conciliation so the first thing about which i can ask you is what do you mean by arbitration ma'am arbitration is nothing but a uh, alternative method of dispute resolution in which all the parties all the parties come together 
दे अपॉइंट अ पर्सन कॉल्ड एज आर्बिट्रेटर दे अपॉइंट अ पर्सन कॉल्ड एज आर्बिट्रेटर और दे अपॉइंट अ पर्सन कॉल्ड एज आर्बिट्रल ट्राइब्यूनल और आर्बिट्रल इंस्टीट्यूशन वॉट एवर यू वॉन्ट टू कॉल इट एज एंड देन आफ्टर दैट द आर्बिट्रेटर और द आर्बिट्रल ट्राइब्यूनल यर्स बोथ दी पार्टीज इट लिसन टू बोथ दी पार्टीज इट टेक्स रिप्रेजेंटेशन फ्रॉम ऑल दी पार्टीज इट कलेक्ट्स ऑल द डॉक्यूमेंट्स एक्सेट्रा फ्रॉम बोथ दी पार्टीज एंड आफ्टर दैट इट एडजुडिकेट्स द मैटर इट एडजुडिकेट्स द मैटर मीन्स इट डिसाइड्स ऑन दैट पर्टिकुलर मैटर एंड आफ्टर दैट इट गिव्स अ फाइनल डिसीजन एंड दैट फाइनल डिसीजन इज कॉल्ड एज एन आर्बिट्रल अवॉर्ड दैट इज कॉल्ड एज एन आर्बिट्रल अवॉर्ड राइट now going to the next answer which talks about your basic features basic features of arbitration now here we are just going to see the headers and we are trying we are going to recollect the content within that particular header okay so now here in the basic features of arbitration the first basic thing that is required is the arbitration agreement arbitration agreement is nothing but a return agreement it has to be mandatorily a return agreement not necessarily in any specific format but which shows that both the parties agree both the parties agree that they want to arbitrate their matter or they want to arbitrate their dispute right so now and in that it will be written that whenever there is any particular dispute they will not go to the court instead they will go to the arbitrator for resolving their dispute right this is written in your arbitration agreement now uh, along with this we can take up another answer which was talking about the arbitration agreement or the types of arbitration agreement so now arbitration agreement were of two types first one was your uh, what so first one was your arbitration clause and the second one was your submission agreement right arbitration clause was nothing but a uh, arbitration clause a clause or a paragraph or a provision which talks about arbitration which is contained in your principal contract i had given you the example of partnership deed say for example in the partnership deed one of the point talks about arbitration then yes that that paragraph will be treated as an arbitration clause and that clause even though it is contained in some other principal contract then too it will be treated that then too it will be treated as an arbitration agreement right another thing is say for example if you have not decided that how are you going to uh, set, uh, you know uh, settle your matters of dispute etc then in that case after the dispute has arisen after the dispute has arisen then also you can get into an arbitration agreement both the parties can mutually decide and then they can enter into an arbitration agreement that will be called as a submission agreement right and the third type a different type of arbitration agreement uh, that we had done was arbitration agreement through reference right arbitration agreement through reference where i had given you the example of that maharashtra class owners association say for example if in the admission form it's written that the uh, in the coaching classes admission form if it's written that any dispute between the coaching classes and the student will be settled by way of uh by in such a manner which is written in the or which is notified by the maharashtra class owners association now when we go and check their document when we go and check their method of solving the disputes we come to know that they say that all the disputes must be settled by way of arbitration so in that case even though even though my admission form has given a reference it has not directly stated that okay the disputes will be solved by arbitration but it is written that it is written there that the disputes will be solved as per that particular association so in that case in that case even the matter has been referred then to it will be treated as a valid arbitration agreement right then after that the next thing which is coming up here is your arbitrator right the next thing which is coming up here is your arbitrator arbitrator is nothing but a person okay he is a person who decides who decides or who solves the dispute between both the parties right he is just like he is just like a court judge just like in a court just like we have a judge same way here we are, we have a person who is going to solve all our disputes and that particular person is called as the arbitrator this person has to be independent this person has to be unbiased this person has to be neutral then only then and then only he will be able to give us a very good solution right then after that there was something called as there was something called as seat of arbitration seat of arbitration was nothing but the method or the legal system which you have chosen to solve your particular dispute it can be the indian seat or it can be the foreign seat if you have chosen indian seat if you have chosen see you have the right you have the freedom okay and by freedom you should uh, try to recollect one more point which i had told you that was the party autonomy party autonomy means the freedom 
so in that freedom you have you also have the freedom to choose the legal system that is whether indian laws would be applicable or foreign laws would be applicable you totally have the freedom to choose that generally generally we go for foreign laws only in case of international commercial arbitration not otherwise because suppose if it's a domestic arbitration if all the parties are of india only then there is no point uh, 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 for going with the foreign seat right then after that the next thing that we had done was party autonomy and the procedure party autonomy means the parties here as compared to your litigation as compared to the court procedure here both the parties have got a lot of freedom to choose many things one thing which we, uh, which we just discussed was the indian seat the seat of arbitration another thing is what will be the method of doing the arbitration will it be by oral arguments only will it be by written statements where are we going to meet when are we going to meet who is going to be our arbitrator all these things all these things are uh, because because of the concept called as party autonomy right then after that after that uh, now they are talking about the uh, finality of the outcome or we can talk about the arbitral award uh, arbitral award as we just discussed ar arbitral award is nothing but it is nothing but a decision which is final decision full and final and binding decision which is given by the arbitrator on the dispute which is submitted by both the parties right now uh, they are telling that this outcome okay the final decision which is given by the arbitrator that is full and final and that is binding but on some grounds on some grounds they have given the illustration here in the e point on some grounds the appeal is possible and we are going to study the appeal procedures further we will also see that to whom are we supposed to go and file the appeal right the next thing next thing which is coming up here is confidentiality which is very very crucial that an arbitrator as compared to your litigation as compared to your uh, court procedures etc in arbitration everything all the procedures etc everything is kept confidential everything is just between the parties and between the arbitrators nothing goes out so confidentiality is one of the most important feature as compared to your court thing and your 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 goodwill etc everything is intact because the matter does not go out at all right and now they are telling once the decision is given okay once the decision is given by the arbitrator that decision becomes enforceable means that becomes applicable on all the parties so you have to and say for example if it's a case of international commercial arbitration then it has to be made applicable here in india also and it has to be made applicable on that international party uh, who is there outside india also and as compared to a court judgment as compared to a court judgment it is very simple uh, as compared to that it is very simple to enforce this arbitration decision outside india because generally in arbitration we get a win win situation answer right then going to the next one next one here they are talking about some different authorities who come under this particular law in that we have a full we have a full gang and that gang is called as a judicial authority who all comes under this judicial authority in this judicial authorities we have the courts we have the special courts we have the quasi judicial authorities who are deemed as a court or who give the knowledge or who give the decision just like a courts etc so quasi judicial authority is a broad term and in that we have courts we have special courts we have quasi judicial authorities etc we also have we had seen this in the case law we are also going to have consumer forums in this right customer courts consumer courts etc will also come under this particular term called as judicial authority and that's why that's why we had come up with the conclusion here that every court okay so this is your judicial authority okay this is your judicial authority in that we have a court so every court every court will be a judicial authority but not every judicial authority will be a court right this was one statement which i had told you to remember another thing another thing now you are in courts ma'am which courts do we have so you are basically we have the district court we have the high court and we have the supreme court coming now let's see what are their powers in this particular law first of all if we want to go and file an appeal okay if we want to go and file an appeal then for the appellate we will see that first to whom are we supposed to go and file an appeal those things we'll see but now suppose when you have to go and file the appeal then in that case in that case against international commercial arbitration you can go and file an appeal only before the high court okay only high court has the power to accept the appeals and for other arbitration say for example a domestic arbitration for that we first go to the generally generally we first go to the district court the powers have been given to both district court as well as the high court but as of now practically when you go and see the notified court there is the district court right so basically for appeal for international we have the high court and for the others we have the district court and high court okay while writing you have to write both next 
Sometimes it so happens that we require the supervisory functions to be exercised by the courts. See now everything is done by the arbitrator. Arbitrator might go illegal somewhere. Right, so uh, to uh, supervise all these things, we again we can again take the help of the court, and in that also for international commercial arbitration, we can go with the high court, and for domestic or the other arbitrations, we can go with the district court and the high court. Right. Then after that, after that, one more thing, one more thing coming up here in co uh, in the court's power is, say for example, this we are going to learn further. Uh, that is the appointment of the arbitrators. Suppose if both the parties, okay, if both the parties or all the parties are not able to appoint the arbitrators. If all the parties are not able to appoint the arbitrators, then in that case they can go and make an application. In case of international, they can go and make an application to the Supreme Court, and in case of others, they can go and make an application to the High Court. Okay, so here the highest court is the Supreme Court, for to whom we'll go for the international commercial arbitration, and below that the next other for other arbitration will go to the High Court, right? and then the supreme court can also delegate okay supreme court or the high court may also delegate their powers to some other institution some other association some independent association some independent persons to do this particular task what is this what is the task which they are doing here is that is appointment of the arbitrator right now again here they are talking about the arbitration agreement about which we have already spoken arbitration agreement was an agreement where the you know the parties consent the parties come to a common consent that yes if there is any particular dispute we are going to solve it by way of arbitration and therefore therefore consent becomes the most fundamental requirement here for your arbitration okay without consent without consent arbitration is not possible and it's clearly written in the arbitration agreement which can be in form of a clause or which can be in form of a separate agreement it has to be compulsorily and clearly written there that instead of taking the matter to the court they are going to take the matter they are going to submit the matter to the arbitration right acha now now we had taken a few examples also that uh, in case of arbitration in case of arbitration there has to be an arbitration agreement that arbitration agreement that arbitration agreement has to be mandatorily in writing call etc any discussion on phone etc is totally not allowed so everything should be in writing right this is what we had seen but in writing it can be any format it can be in any format there was no specific format given for that right so it can be in form of letters it can be in form of telex it can be in form of emails etc everything is allowed right then here we have the answer called as types of arbitration agreement which we have already discussed then after that yes now the next answer coming up here is the general principles of arbitration agreement okay similar point many of the pointers which we have already studied are going to get repeated here first one is your arbitration agreement which we have already discussed which was a contract uh, between both the parties that they will take the matter to the arbitrator consent point we have already discussed what was there in the consent point that both the parties should clearly give their consent that yes in case of any dispute they will take the matter for arbitration next uh, two two three points were specifically very very important first one is ouster of jurisdiction ouster of jurisdiction is what ouster of jurisdiction is when whenever the parties okay whenever the parties have mutually decided that they will take the matter for arbitration if they have an agreement for this then in that case none, uh, none of the parties or neither of the parties can unilaterally proceed to the court one cannot get out of this particular arbitration and then they can go to the court for litigation okay if they want to go yes they can go but that has to be mutually agreed by both the parties they'll have to cancel this arbitration agreement and then only they can take the matter to the court right then after that the doctrine of separability a small point which i have already mentioned about this that even though okay even though even though that arbitration clause was there there right even though that arbitration clause was there in your principal contract then to then to it is treated as a separate agreement okay your partnership deed will be treated as a separate thing and your arbitration agreement will be treated as a separate thing and therefore therefore even though your principal contract okay even though your principal contract becomes invalid okay even though it becomes invalid then to your arbitration agreement survives it will not be rendered as invalid or it will not be treated as invalid right so now it basically the arbitration agreement is not dependent on the principal agreement and therefore it can rule on its own jurisdiction right it is totally because it is totally treated as a separate agreement next one now see again few points again few points they are talking about the arbitration agreement only see the headers you will now uh, you will now be able to recollect all these things 
first one it should be in writing that we already know there should be a clear uh, clarity of consent should be there then next one see the third point now there is a third point called as defined legal relationship right there is something called as defined legal relationship what is this defined legal relationship okay means now only those matters only those matters can be given for arbitration only those matters can be given for arbitration which are not restricted by the law or statute right example if there is any illegal case if there is any illegal activities or if there is any case which contains any illegal activities then that cannot go for arbitration so the case which goes for arbitration okay the case which goes for arbitration should be such which is permissible by the law right and therefore therefore you are in this point they are telling in the seventh point here they are telling that the disputes which are submitted for arbitration must be arbitrable must be arbitrable means it should be such matter means it should be such matter which can be determined by way of arbitration and the court does not exercise <coughs> sorry the court does not exercise the court does not exercise the sole jurisdiction on that particular case example if it's a criminal case okay example if it's a criminal case then in that case uh, it is such a matter which cannot be dealt by way of arbitration right then after that next thing that they are telling us here is final and the binding award okay final and the binding award this point we have already done that the decision which is given by the arbitrator that is full and final and that will be binding on all the parties but in some grounds in some grounds we can go for uh, appeal also okay that appeal point we are going to study here the next thing which is coming up here is specific words okay specific words example if the if any particular contract okay if any particular contract say for example a partnership deed if it contains if it merely contains some words called as arbitration if it just contains a word called as arbitrator then just putting these words does not make that particular agreement as an arbitration agreement right say for example if I, in a partnership deed like i had given you the example if in a partnership deed uh, in the description about one of the partner it's written that this person is an arbitrator also that does not make that particular partnership deed as an arbitration agreement because clearly it should be written clearly it should be written that yes we are going to if in case of disputes we are going to go for arbitration right and yes definitely for arbitration for for this arbitration there should be some dispute only for dispute only for dispute we enter into an arbitration agreement and this arbitration agreement has to be signed that has to be compulsorily signed by both the parties right or all the parties in that case the next thing which is coming up here is arbitration agreement through reference which we have already discussed which was which was talking about here that coaching classes point right next thing next thing coming up here is termination termination of an arbitrate arbitration agreement or a termination of an arbitral agreement means when does this get cancelled okay you are basically three points were very very important because the third point okay one two and four are specifically very very important and third point is just like an exception right the third point is just like an exception first of all if both the parties mutually say that okay we want to cancel it okay we want to cancel it then in that case it gets cancelled it gets terminated because maybe either the dispute is resolved or maybe they want to go to the court so they can mutually cancel it they can mutually terminate it or say for example when the principal contract gets over okay if the principal contract gets over say for example say for example say for example in case of principal contract the partnership period the partnership tenure has got over okay the partnership tenure has got over then in that case then in that case what is going to happen even the arbitration okay even the arbitration agreement is going to get over right next thing next thing is next thing is death of the parties which i told you that was just like an exception that was just like an exception that the uh, arbitration agreement does not get discharged okay it does not get over just because of death of any of the parties because then it gets continued in the name of the legal representative and the last one is operation of law operation of law means i had given an example here that if say for example any law comes and says okay this is such a matter which cannot go for arbitration okay then in that case the arbitration totally stops and the arbitration agreement if you have entered into any then that agreement becomes invalid or that gets totally cancelled it gets totally terminated so the three points three most important points here was first one was mutual consent second one was termination of the main contract and the third one is and the third one is your operation of law and the case where the arbitration agreement does not get over is the death of the party
now here now here we have something called as arbitral tribunal here we have something called as arbitral tribunal now they have given first of all they have given different different names of the arbitral tribunal which you already know it can be arbitral tribunal arbitrator arbitral institution etc whatever name by whatever name you want to call them you can call them there is no problem in that this person this person this arbitrator this person just adjudicates the disputes between all the parties right now the parties okay all the parties who are there in this particular dispute they have the right right because we are uh, using the concept of party autonomy so we have the right to select our own we have the right to select our own arbitrator and this person okay this person is going to act as a judge just like a judge because we are going to submit the papers we are going to submit some evidences we are going to submit some documents we are going to produce the witnesses etc by which by which uh, or after which the arbitrator is going to apply the normal law he is going to apply the law and then he is going to take out the conclusion right uh, the main thing the main thing here is the arbitrator should be independent because otherwise it will totally impact the entire process of arbitration and now accordingly okay according to our dispute according to our case we are going to appoint the appropriate arbitrator because now ma'am who can be an arbitrator Ar there was no specific qualification applicable for an arbitrator so arbitrator can be any person who is capable of contracting who is capable of contracting and who agrees who gives his consent okay and who has a desire to resolve your dispute that person can can act as an arbitrator right now ma'am how many arbitrators can we have we can have any number of arbitrators there is no problem in that we can have any number of arbitrators but that number should not be an even number except in one of the case laws that we have at the end of our book right so generally generally uh, you can appoint whatever number of arbitrators you wish to appoint but that number should not be an even number but there are certain things but there are certain things on which on which the number of arbitrators should depend or there are certain factors on which it should depend that is you know uh, the complexity of the case that if the case is too complex then maybe will require more number of arbitrators if the case is not that much complex you can keep lesser number of arbitrators the amount that you are ready to expend even uh, on that particular thing your number of arbitrators depend how much time will it take say for example if you have too many number of arbitrators definitely the time taken for solving the dispute will be more because everybody would be placing their own uh, view points there Accord, but uh, again at the same time if you need a very good conclusion if you need a good quality then sometimes even more people like if more people are there then more brains would be applied better uh, solution will get so keeping all these things and balancing all these things will have to decide because that has been left totally to the parties we can decide that how many number of arbitrators we want right now now we had discussed about this procedure for appointment if you remember yes for this procedure of appointment we had broadly studied four methods first one first one was both the parties both the parties will or all the parties will jointly appoint a single arbitrator right that was one of the methods that we had studied another another method that we had studied was each party each party will appoint one arbitrator and then these arbitrators will appoint the final one right then after that the next thing was uh, we can do the exchange of that list okay one party will forward the list of arbitrators to the other party the other party has to select from it then the other party sends the list to the this particular first one and then he will select from the list etc and this will go on this time pass is going to go on till till they agree upon a single or a common arbitrator and the last thing if nothing works if nothing works then you already know that we can go and make an application to the court right in case of international we can go and make an application to the supreme court and in case of domestic we can go and make an application to the high court and they can they can also delegate either they will appoint or they can uh, delegate this matter to some other association institution or any independent person and the most important thing here was if the court does an appointment for us okay if the court does an appointment for us then we cannot raise any dispute against that that this particular arbitrator is not a proper person for us right this is what we had studied now the another thing another thing that is coming up here is requirements is requirements of an arbitral tribunal okay requirements of an arbitral tribunal is nothing but requirements of an arbitrator now first point in that is he can be of any nationality right any nationality of any one of the parties okay say for example if one person is from india another person is from us so either he can be of indian national or he can be of us national any one of them is allowed generally generally nationality matters in case of international commercial arbitration because there only you know there can be a 
व्यू पॉइंट दैट ही वॉन्ट्स द अदर पार्टी वॉन्ट्स द आर्बिट्रेटर ऑफ हिज कंट्री एक्सेट्रा सो इन दैट केस बेसिकली द नेशनैलिटी इज वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट ही शुड बी केपेबल ऑफ कॉन्ट्रैक्टिंग ही शुड हैव द डिजायर ही शुड हैव द डिजायर टू सॉल्व अ पर्टिकुलर डिस्प्यूट ही शुड बी ही शुड बी ही शुड बी एन इंडिपेंडेंट पर्सन ही शुड बी अ न्यूट्रल पर्सन ही शुड नॉट बी इंडल्ज इन एनी partiality etc because ultimately that is going to affect the quality of the outcome which comes later on right then we had studied then we had studied a few cases where the arbitrator should intimate in advance only that uh, maybe his appointment is not proper okay if say for example if he is related if he is related to any one of the parties or say for example he had any past relationship with any one of the parties or he has present relationship with any one of the parties he has got interest in any one of the parties etc because later on it can give rise it can give uh, you know doubts relating to the independence so in that case the arbitrator should disclose this well in advance and one more thing even he should disclose a uh, one more thing that uh, suppose if he is not able to solve the case he knows today itself that he won't be able to solve the case within a period of 12 months then he has maybe because he is preoccupied or something like that and in that case he has to intimate even before you know his appointment gets finalized so that so that the parties don't waste time with this particular arbitrator and they can proceed with the new one right and here they had given a few cases okay here they had given a few cases because of which we can have a doubt that this arbitrator this arbitrator is not uh, independent or this arbitrator is biased or this arbitrator is acting partial is doing partiality or something like that say for example he was previously involved in this particular case he is having any relationship with any one of the party his relatives is having any relationship with the parties he is a legal advisor of any of the parties he is a legal representative of any one of the party etc he has got any financial interest etc if any such co uh, connection okay if any such connection is observed then in that case then in that case it gives a doubt it gives a doubt that this particular arbitrator is not acting independent or he is acting biased etc now now here they have given you certain duties and liabilities of the arbitrators duties and liabilities of the arbitrators first duty first duty of him is he has to be very quick right he has to be very quick he has to solve the case as soon as possible and he has to avoid all the unnecessary delays which can come into picture he has to make sure that he has to conduct the proceedings without any particular delay and another thing is he has to be independent that was a uh, that is again a repetitive point which we have been studying since uh, the beginning of the chapter because because in just like auditors okay just like auditors independence is important similarly your even the arbitrators independence is very very important he has to keep everything confidential just like the parties had to keep everything confidential even the arbitrator is required to keep everything confidential this is not like a court case that everything the final conclusion etc everything is made public no your everything has to be kept confidential whatever final decision he gives that is the arbitral award that he gives okay the arbitral award that he gives that award should be a reasoned award that is that is it should be reasoned award means whatever conclusion he is giving it should have a backing okay it should have a backing it should have a supporting reasons along with it that why the arbitrator has given such an award right this is one thing another one another one is he should avoid unilateral communication okay he should avoid communicating just with one party and whatever documents he is receiving from one party that has to be uh, communicated with the other party so that both the parties have established that particular trust in the arbitrator and there won't be any doubts there won't be any doubts relating to your independence biasness etc right the award the same award that he is giving okay the arbitral award that he is giving even that award should be a legal one and it should be such that you know we can uh, implement that particular award it should be exercisable it should be capable of doing first of all it should be legal he cannot say hey go and do the murder of that particular person close the case do the murder obviously that is nonsense okay so this is not going to work so the final decision that he is giving that should be a legal decision right and at every time at every point of time he has to fulfill all the legal requirements at all points of time he has to fulfill all the legal requirements right now here we are going to talk about the change of arbitrator okay here we are going to talk about the change of arbitrator now see what are they telling us in the change of arbitrator here 
say for example one thing is when the arbitrator himself says okay bye i don't want to work with your particular case then he can leave this case okay he can leave this case and he is not even required he is not even required to disclose the reasons for that okay he need not even uh, disclose the reasons for leaving the case voluntarily then another thing is another thing is when all the parties decide okay when all the parties decide that no this we had appointed this particular arbitrator no doubt in that but now we do not want this particular arbitrator to continue for our case maybe maybe he is not an appropriate person for our case or maybe he does not have he does not have the um what do you say the proper expertise which is required for this particular case so in that case the parties can voluntarily or the parties can mutually come together and they can remove that particular arbitrator right that is one thing another thing is say for example the arbitrator says now that he is not well or he won't be you know able to continue with this case maybe because he has, he has lost interest in that particular matter or he has got engaged with some other matter then in that case again in that case again we can remove this particular arbitrator we can remove this particular arbitrator here we are not removing because of uh, not having the expertise but because of any other reasons we can remove him or we can uh, you know we can take the help of the court not necessary but we can take help of the court to remove this particular arbitrator right then another thing is when the arbitration process uh, when the arbitration process ends then automatically the arbitrator's position gets terminated because now the case has totally got over or say for example the case we could not complete the case within a uh, period of 12 months then the arbitration process totally ends because the arbitration has to get over within a period of 12 months or say for example when one of the party thinks okay say for example when one of the party thinks that no this particular arbitrator is not acting independent or he is giving a biased opinion etc then that party can proceed to the court now ma'am to which court are we going to go for complaining this or for uh, asking for supervision we are going to go to that uh, for international we will go to the high court and for domestic we are going to, uh, uh, we are going to go to the district court and the high court okay don't get confused don't get confused with supreme court and high court supreme court and high court comes into picture only for appointment of the arbitrator right now now say for example arbitrator has given some particular decision okay arbitrator has given some particular decision he has given some particular conclusion and now any of the party is not satisfied okay if any of the party is not satisfied by chance the chances are very low but then too they have given a possibility if any of the party is not satisfied with the arbitral award which is given by the arbitrator then the first challenge the first challenge the first appeal has to be made before the same arbitrator okay we are going to go to the same arbitrator that sir we are not happy sir we are not happy with the decision we are not happy with the decision which is given by the uh, which is given by you so sir please review your own decision okay we, uh, please review your own decision but if the arbitrator says that no no i think that my decision is correct then in that case now we are going to go to the courts for filing the appeal again which court courts are we going to go for international we'll go to the high court for domestic we'll go to the uh, district court and the high court right okay another thing is uh, just the continuation of the previous answer was that whenever a arbitrator is removed okay whenever a arbitrator is removed now what now if we have decided to stay in arbitration only then we are going to appoint the new arbitrators considering the original methods of appointment okay just like we appointed the previous one similarly we can appoint the new arbitrator and in case we are not able to appoint then in that case we can go and make an application to the court for appointment of a new arbitrator right then after that after that now you are again you are on the board as you can see again they are talking about the arbitral award about which we have already discussed arbitral award is nothing but the final decision which is given by the rb trader okay whenever whenever you go and file an appeal before the court just like we studied before the high court or before the district court then that challenge can be raised within a period of 3 months okay once the arbitrator gives the decision from that day within a period of 3 months you can go and file an appeal and in that case uh, there is a condonation of delay suppose if you are not able to go within a period of 3 months then that period can be extended by another 30 days okay don't write one month that can be extended by another period of 30 days another thing another thing which is coming up here another thing which is coming up here is your types of arbitral award okay types of arbitral award there were four types of arbitral award there were four types of arbitral award first one first one was the normal one normal one that is your final award right that is your final award what was happening in case of your final award that is nothing but that is nothing but the final decision given by the arbitrator on the disputes which you had submitted to the arbitrator for decision right that award is called as a final award 
okay before giving the final award before giving the final award if the arbitrator thinks that there is a need to give a temporary decision on certain matters then those temporary decisions will be treated as interim award still it is finally documented then the next two next two one is your settlement award and the next one is your additional award settlement award says that when the case is before the arbitrator okay when the case is before the arbitrator now the parties themselves decide that okay we are going to mutually come to a decision we don't need arbitrator for giving a decision we just need the arbitrator to supervise then in that case whatever is the final decision which is agreed by the parties okay but documented by the arbitrator that award will be called as a settlement award okay here we are basically the arbitrator is not going to apply the laws the laws will be applied by the parties themselves that's why it is called as a settlement award and settlement award here is just similar to your final award okay this year also the final decision which is given even though they have just termed it as a settlement award but that is the final decision and the last one last one is your additional award right last one is your additional award if say for example once the decision of the arbitrator was finalized and both the parties were okay with the decision but later on they came to know that there were some matters okay there were some matters which were yet to be decided which were yet to be decided or which were left out then in that case we can go and make an application to the arbitrator again within a period of 30 days okay when he had given his decision from that day we can go within a period of 30 days to the arbitrator and we can say that sir so and so matters were left out so please consider these matters also and just give us a revised final award right next one uh, again they are talking about the arbitral award that is they are talking about the decision again uh, very common points which are going to come up here is here the arbitrators if suppose we have uh, you know numerous arbitrators if we have then the decision will be taken by majority the decision has to be in writing it has to be authenticated by the arbitrator it has to be very very clear it cannot be vague it should not be subjective it should not leave any doubt it should not leave any doubts in the minds of the readers or in minds of the parties right it should be capable of being performed it should not be like okay go and bring stars from the sky it should not be that way it should be capable of being performing right and it should not be against public policy definitely it should not be against the public policy it should be implementable it should be such that it does not affect adversely it should not affect india adversely in any manner right and it should be given as soon as it should be given as soon as possible right uh, it's not that uh, okay since we have been given 12 months time so we have to drag it and we have to give it on the last day itself so the decision has to be given as soon as possible then only we will be able to take the best out of the arbitration proceeding okay then only we will be taken we will be able to take uh, get the best out of this arbitration otherwise we go back to the same court proceedings where the case goes on goes on etc now listen now listen the next thing is challenging an award challenging an award that is in which cases in which cases you can raise an appeal or in which cases you can go against the arbitrator's decision so what were the things here what were the things here first we know that suppose you know if we feel biased if we feel that the decision given by the arbitrator is biased then in that case first we'll go to the arbitrator only okay and if the arbitrator okay if the arbitrator does not accept it if the arbitrator does not accept it then only we are going to go before the further authorities as we have already studied if the arbitrator goes beyond his his powers okay he has been given powers under some particular laws if he goes beyond his powers then we can challenge it okay then we can challenge it then we'll have to go to the court and we'll have to challenge it or say for example for any other reasons example we come to know later on okay later on if we come to know that the arbitration agreement was itself invalid one of the party to the arbitrator was a uh, minor person who was not capable of contracting or say for example the uh, there was some unilateral communication going on between and the other party has now come to know about it okay or it is such a dispute which cannot be solved by way of arbitration this we have come to know now or the decision which is given by the the decision which was given by the arbitrator is totally nonsense is, it is totally illegal which is uh, which cannot happen because we had studied that arbitral award should be a legal one or say for example any decision given by the arbitrator is against india's public policy or it was such a matter which was actually not solvable by way of arbitration these were some different different cases in which we can go and file the appeal before first before the arbitral tribunal and then next before the uh, court authority another thing that they were telling us there was what will happen in if we go and file an appeal okay if we go and file the appeal within that three months plus 30 days extra etc then in that case then in that case 
the types of decision which can come is either the court can set aside okay either the court can set aside set aside the order means it will say that it is assumed as if the arbitrator has not given any particular order it has no legal sanctity it has no legal validity etc it is null and void it becomes zero right another thing is it can confirm okay the court can confirm the at's order it can confirm the at's order means it will say that okay at's order is perfect absolutely perfect and there is no problem in that and the award is totally valid another thing which comes up there is modify here the tribunal uh, here the court itself will consider the order of the uh, arbitral tribunal it will do certain changes okay the court itself will do those minor changes in the order and it will confirm the final order and the last one last one is remit back to the tribunal okay it will remit back means it is not telling that your order is zero it is not making it void etc but it is giving it back to the arbitrator and telling to rectify some defects in that okay so now generally what happens is if certain things have to be changed then it goes under modification but if there is something wrong in the order only some things are wrong in the order and which can be solved by changing it then we do the remitting back to the tribunal and the final final award which is given by the arbitrator this has to be treated as if it is a court's order and its enforcement will be done as per the code of civil procedure because we had got those powers only in this particular law and now and now going to the last one going to the last one that is your conciliation okay conciliation uh, was also one of the alternative methods of dispute resolution this was such a process okay this was such a process where Uh, the conciliator just tries to bring both the parties together okay by not involving himself too much in the case here both the parties actually decide to come to a common conclusion maybe by way of some settlement etc and the entire process is supervised by a person called as conciliator right again it is a voluntary process you can decide whether you want to go for this conciliation or not either you can go for uh, your uh, arbitration you can go for litigation or you can come for this conciliation okay and conciliation the most important term used here is conciliation is non adversarial okay it is non adversarial means here the parties don't fight against each other okay we don't fight against each other we don't i don't try to prove that i am correct and you are wrong this does not happen in case of conciliation but both of them are sensible and both of them try to come to a common solution which suits which is going to suit both the parties in a very proper manner right and therefore the conciliator is just acting as an assistant okay he is just going to assist it is just going to assist the parties to come to that proper conclusion and here here also the final award okay the final award is going to uh, is uh, will be given by the conciliator which will be called as there are two names there are two names here one is either it can be called as a settlement award or it can be okay uh, settlement agreement or it can be called as a memorandum of conciliation i think it's written here yes see here it is known as it is known as settlement agreement or it can be called as a memorandum of conciliation same thing just like we had done this in arbitration so here it can be called as settlement agreement or memorandum of conciliation which will be authenticated okay which will be authenticated by whom which will be authenticated by the conciliator authenticated means it will be signed by the conciliator and if it is not signed by the conciliator then boss it cannot be treated as a valid award right now ma'am how many number of conciliators acha one more thing here is confidentiality point again just like your arbitration even the conciliate conciliation proceedings have to be kept confidential there is no doubt in that okay conciliation proceedings are mainly contained mainly contained in this arbitration law and in the code of civil procedure how many number of arbitrators would be there so now we can have uh, arbitrators ranging from 1 to 3 so it can be 1 2 or 3 any number can be the conciliator there is no problem of even odd etc here and suppose if you are not able to determine on the number of arbitrators or if you are not able to determine on the number of conciliators then you must have at least one right if suppose in conciliation if you are not able to determine then at least one should be there okay and here also here also the conciliator is appointed by whom conciliator will be appointed by both the parties only and the same thing is going to happen we are going to produce all the documents evidences papers etc it then only the conciliator will be able to supervise the entire proceedings and it will help us that the award award that has come out finally is a good award okay and now when the when the proceedings are going on okay when the conciliation proceedings are going on then the parties cannot go okay just like your order of jurisdiction the parties cannot start arbitration or your litigation proceedings because uh, because 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 you are since you have already decided you have already decided we are going to go for conciliation 
the conciliation law says that if you have thought on this particular thing, then you cannot go out of this conciliation during the process is going on. Except, except when you are going to go to preserve your own rights. Okay, when it comes to preserving our own rights, example, if everything is going biased, it was not it was not biased initially, but now everything is going biased. Then in that case, yes, you can proceed for arbitration or you can go for litigation, etc. Right. Then again, here the award, the final award which comes out, the final award which comes out as we have already discussed, it is called as your settlement agreement or it will be called as memorandum of conciliation. Right. And this award will be treated as if it is your court's order. It will be treated as if it's your court's order and the enforcement will be done as per the code of civil procedure. Last thing that they are telling us here is about the confidentiality as we already discussed in case of conciliation also in case of conciliation also everything everything has to be kept confidential everything has to be kept confidential and one important point here was any discussion any suggestions any proposals etc which was done during the process of conciliation okay during the process of conciliation that cannot be used for arbitration and that cannot be used for litigation proceeding okay final decision yes that can be taken reference of but the uh, the intermittent uh, uh, what do you say uh, suggestions proposals etc that cannot be used for litigation or arbitration and then here we had one uh, definition that is your international commercial arbitration in short you had told me that ma'am this international commercial arbitration is such a thing where one of the party should be a person uh, of outside India or a foreign national or a company which is located outside India or a government of other country. And then here we had the distinguishes between the litigation, arbitration, mediation, conciliation, etc. Which you, which I had told you just to read it once. Right. And in the case law, the most important case law. Okay. The most important case law here is this one. That is in one of the cases, even number of arbitrators were appointed, which is actually not allowed by law. But Supreme Court had told that since all the arbitrators agree at the same point itself, then in that case, even though there are even number of arbitrators, there is no problem in that. Right. This was the most important. This was the most important case law in our particular chapter. Right. So with this, with this, we are done with the super quick revision of Arbitration and Conciliation Act. Hope it helped you to recollect the provisions. So let's start with the super quick revision of FCRA that is Foreign Contribution Regulation Act 2010. The act is regulated or the provisions of foreign contributions are regulated by three things. First of all, the Foreign Contribution Regulation Act that, that is the act. Another one is Foreign Contribution Regulation Rules 2011 and the third one is any other notifications or the order passed by central government from time to time okay these three things these three things basically regulate your entire foreign contribution law this this particular act okay fcra fcra is applicable to whom fcra first of all it extends to whole of india if we just use the word whole of india then it means whole of india including the state of jammu and kashmir plus it will also extend to our citizens that is indian citizens who stay outside india and plus the branches or the subsidiaries of the indian companies of the indian companies which are located outside india so basically they are trying to make sure that every person who has an indian connection to that particular person this law is going to get applicable and this law had come into force from 1st may from 1st may 2011 okay from this particular date the fcra had come into force now the fcra is going to deal with two things fcra deals with two things first one first one is the regulation regulation of the foreign contribution and the second one is prohibition of foreign contribution okay when it comes to regulation at that time generally the government does not prohibit the government does not prohibit the foreign contribution but the government just makes sure that whatever we are doing that is being done uh, lawfully legally etc and even we are supposed to do the requisite reporting to the government but when it comes to prohibition prohibition is generally made applicable only when that thing goes against the national interest that goes against the sovereignty of the country etc in that case the central government or the government of india can prohibit can prohibit the foreign contribution as well as the foreign hospitality okay now the the chapter deals with mainly two things first one is foreign contribution and the second one is foreign hospitality right now uh, first of all first of all how do we call it as a foreign contribution okay or why do we call it as a foreign contribution because 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 either you get okay either i'm just going to cover uh, two to three or three to four definitions here altogether. please be there with me 
okay now first of all if you get if you get any article if you get any currency any currency or if you get any security okay this you are getting this you are getting from the foreign source without paying anything that is maybe in form of a transfer maybe in form of a donation etc if you are getting this from a foreign source if you are getting this from a foreign source then in that case whatever you are getting okay whatever you are getting in form of article currency or security whatever thing you are getting in your hand that will be treated as your foreign contribution right that is treated as your foreign contribution another thing in that there was a small exception there was a small exception that if any particular person if any particular person has got an article okay this exception is not applicable for currency and security if i have got any particular article from a foreign source as a gift okay as a gift as a gift and that is for my personal use then in that case if the value of that gift okay if the market value of that gift does not exceed rupees 1 lakh if that does not exceed rupees 1 lakh then they have totally exempted it from the definition of foreign contribution then in that case it will not be treated as a foreign contribution plus if it is not treated as a foreign contribution then fcra is not going to be applicable at all right this was the definition of the term foreign contribution which i was getting from the foreign source that is from some person outside india i'll just come to the exact definition of foreign source don't worry about that another thing that we can get another thing that we can get from the foreign source is foreign hospitality okay another thing that we get from the other country or the foreign source is treated as your foreign hospitality in case of foreign hospitality you are basically getting an offer in form of a service okay you're getting an offer you're getting an offer from the foreign source where they are ready to bear where the foreign source is ready to bear your uh, either either your traveling expenses or your boarding lodging expenses or your transport expenses or your medical treatment expenses they are ready to bear those expenses for you and these can be borne in two ways either in way of cash or by kind ma'am what do you mean by cash or kind say for example if if uh, they say that okay initially you only bear the expenses we will reimburse then that is called as foreign hospitality in cash okay and otherwise if they are going to tell me that okay we will directly sponsor we will directly sponsor your medical treatment or we will directly give you the air ticket or whatever it is then in that case i don't have to pay anything from my pocket so in that case the foreign hospitality is received in kind okay but yes obviously this foreign hospitality does not include a casual offer okay casual offer which is given which is given by every particular uh, which can be availed by any particular person example any offer given by a two foreign tourism and travel company to an indian customer just because he is a privileged customer of that particular tourism and travel company does not make it as a foreign hospitality right okay so this uh, either the foreign contribution or the foreign hospitality this was received from whom this was received from a foreign source so now let's go to the term called as foreign source now foreign source can be uh, the foreign government it can be the foreign national it can be the foreign citizen it can be a foreign company it can be a foreign corporation it can be a mnc it can be any particular person who is located outside india or basically who has been incorporated outside india okay one important person included here is a foreign company and so they have defined the term they have defined the term foreign company specifically okay they have specifically defined the term foreign company foreign company they are telling that it can be any company association body of individuals etc obviously which is incorporated outside india that's why we are calling it as a foreign company and it includes foreign company as per companies act definition it includes a uh, subsidiary it includes a subsidiary of a foreign company it includes their registered office their principal offices it also includes a mnc mnc means a company which is having its uh, operations its business operations in two or more countries so all these all these are treated as basically foreign company and more than the status of a foreign company that is treated as a foreign source okay so if we get any foreign contribution from them or if we get any hospitality from them then it, in that case it will be termed as a foreign contribution or a foreign hospitality right acha one important thing here is one important thing here is uh now the person the person from whom we you know we the agencies etc from whom we can get this foreign contribution etc uh the agency which is you know incorporated outside india even that is treated as a foreign source any international agencies which are incorporated outside india obviously if i use the term international then it means it is incorporated outside india then in that case from those agencies they have excluded they have specifically excluded 
three of them that is united nations they have excluded the world bank and they have excluded the international monetary fund so basically if we get any funding from there or if we get any foreign contribution etc from them then in, in that case they are not at all treated as a foreign source okay they are not at all treated as a foreign source so the amount received from them so the amount received from them will not be treated as a foreign contribution or hospitality right another important thing is say for example if you have received any foreign contribution okay if you have received any foreign contribution and if you are investing that foreign contribution here in india okay and if if, uh, if you have earned any accruals on that or if you have earned any benefits on that then in that case then in that case even that accrual or that increased amount even that will be treated to be a foreign contribution only that is deemed that is assumed it is assumed as if it is a foreign contribution right okay now now going to the main provisions of the chapter first of all there are two most important provisions or we can say conceptual provisions in the chapter apart from that everything apart from that everything is procedural so two main sections very important sections that is section number 3 and section number 6 first of all section number 3 section number 3 talks about your foreign contribution okay now they have listed they have listed a few persons they have listed a few persons in this particular section number 3 uh, for which they say that these persons these persons are totally prohibited these persons are totally prohibited from accepting the foreign contribution okay now the list goes on as follows now it includes an election candidate okay any person is going to stand for the election any person any person who is related or basically associated with the uh, media company in relation to newspaper and the news channel okay its publisher its printer its editor its cartoonist its columnist its correspondent etc any person basically because it is relating to your media which can be affected because of this foreign contribution then your government judge uh, government servants government employees judges these people will be uh, are included in the prohibited list then your member of legislature then political party or any office bearer of the political party or any other organization which has got a political nature uh, or um, and just like i told you before that is any company which was relating or any company which was engaged in this news thing that is it can be audio visual news it can be only audio news etc so that company also plus the people working in that particular company as a correspondent cartoonist editor etc even those people okay so mainly media related persons political party related persons government related persons election related persons all these people are totally all these people are totally excluded all these people are totally uh, prohibited basically prohibited from accepting the foreign contribution okay so now 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 the next point that they are uh, that uh, that they are going to tell us here is say for example if these particular people okay these group of people are totally prohibited from accepting the foreign contribution then in that case no other person okay no other person should also accept uh, the foreign contribution on these people's behalf okay if a political party cannot accept it because of section number 3 so now even i cannot accept it on behalf of any political party okay or i cannot accept it on behalf of any other person any other person if i feel that this other person is going to transfer it to the political party or any other persons who are there in the prohibited list right so in that case whenever i feel that directly or indirectly directly or indirectly the benefit is going to go the benefit is going or the funds are going to go to the prohibited persons then in that case all the people all the people will be totally prohibited from accepting any foreign contribution okay but then but then now they have given certain exceptions they have given certain exceptions they say that they say that if you have received any amount of salary or wages from the other country okay or if you have received any remuneration from the other country if you have received some amount in ordinary course of business if you have received some amount because of international trade or commerce if you have received if you have received any payment okay if you have received any payment because you are a agent of a foreign source any company which is maybe uh, any foreign company which is there outside india but you are acting as a agent of that if you are receiving any amount for that then these will uh, these people are not at all prohibited from accepting the amount reason reason because your this becomes a two way transaction right it becomes a two way transaction here the consideration is involved so this is not at all treated as your foreign contribution similarly similarly two very very important points coming up here is if we are receiving if we are receiving any gift or present if you are receiving gift or present we means uh, indians if we are receiving any gift or present from the foreign source from the foreign source as an indian delegate 
means we represented india somewhere outside and we received gift or present for that beat any amount okay beat any amount that will not be included we are not at all prohibited from taking that similarly if we are receiving any amount okay if we are receiving any amount from the relative from our relatives in uh, then there is no prohibition for that there is no problem in that just that a small formality is getting involved that that if you are receiving okay try to recollect the provisions along with me but it's, uh, it's just that if you are receiving more than rupees 1 lakh okay if you are receiving more than rupees 1 lakh then in that case we have to file a form to the central government in form fc1 okay the format was given in form fc1 and this has to be filed online this has to be filed electronically within within a period of 30 days from the receipt so whenever you receive after that within a period of 30 days you have to go and file this form with the central government and similarly they are telling that if you are receiving any amount through ordinary banking channels okay maybe by western union transfer or maybe by way of postal uh, post office etc then in that case even uh, in that case also there is no uh, such pro uh, prohibitions because you are already the transactions are regulate right similarly similarly comes up your section number 6 okay section number 6 talks about what section number 6 talks about restriction on acceptance of foreign hospitality okay section 3 and 4 were mainly talking about your foreign contribution now your section number 6 is talking about your foreign hospitality again here they have provided five persons okay again here they have provided five persons who are totally prohibited from accepting the foreign hospitality okay or we can say that not totally prohibited but yes these people before accepting the foreign hospitality they have to take the prior approval of the mha that is ministry of home affairs right we have to take their particular approval if we have not taken an app their approval then it is obviously totally prohibited okay five people who are uh, coming under this particular exception is or the five people who are coming in this particular category is it includes government servants it includes government employees it includes judges it includes a member of legislature and it includes the office bearers of a political party okay these five people whenever these five people have to accept any particular foreign country a uh, foreign hospitality then first they'll have to first they'll have to take the prior approval from the central government ma'am in central government from whom from the ministry of home affairs we have to take their prior approval okay but there was a, there is a small exception for this okay there is a small exception for this say for example if i have obtained the approval for foreign hospitality and now after going to the foreign country now i fall sick okay now i fall sick and i want an emergency medical treatment to be taken there and now the other person is ready to sponsor my medical treatment then that becomes an emergent medical treatment for that any prior approval is not required it's just that it's just that after you have received it okay after you have received that emergent medical treatment after that you have to intimate about that to the central government okay now let's learn about those procedures now when you are normally going and taking the approval for this foreign hospitality then in that case you have to take all the necessary documents okay that is the invitation letter any other departmental clearances papers etc all these you have to take it to the ministry of home affairs at least 2 weeks in advance okay the day when you are going to leave india from that day just before that day at least 2 weeks in advance your application must reach the ministry of home affairs that is mandatory and then again it is at the discretion of the mha whether to give you the approval or not okay and suppose if after going there if you require any emergent medical aid or emergent medical help etc then in that case you can first avail then avail that and then after that you can intimate it to the central government within a period of one month okay once you have received it then within a period of one month intimate it to the central government but again this intimation is not required if the amount does not exceed rupees One lakh. If that emergent medical aid does not exceed rupees one lakh, then in that case you need not, uh, you know, intimate about this to your central government, right? Okay. Then after that, after that, this uh, guidelines which has gone in between, this is just one time read. Please read it once. But uh, again, yes, one day before the exam you can totally ignore it. Okay, one day before the exam you can totally ignore it. Another thing coming up here is prohibition. Prohibition to transfer FC to other person. Now, in this particular chapter, in this particular chapter, we have two categories of persons. Okay, we have two categories of person. First one is now we are talking about FC only. Okay, we are mainly talking about FC only. FH is done now altogether. Now, uh, either we have prohibited persons under Section three, or we have the non-prohibited persons. Okay, one is prohibited persons, and the other one is non-prohibited persons. Okay, non-prohibited means I am not there in that list. 
then in that case in that also we have two bifurcations one is authorized person and the other one is unauthorized person okay authorized person is such a person who has either taken a registration certificate from the central government under this law or who has obtained a prior approval from the central government for accepting the foreign contribution okay if i do not have registration certificate also and if i do not have the prior approval also then i will be treated then i will be treated as an unauthorized person right then i will be treated as an unauthorized person so now say for example if i have accepted any fc i was a registered person okay i am a authorized person if i have accepted any fc there is a by default rule that either i can utilize it or or i can transfer it okay i can transfer it to some other person provided that other person should also be provided that other person should also be an authorized person okay but ma'am should shouldn't there be any exception so yes there is an exception here that if you want to transfer it okay if you want to transfer it to any unauthorized person then you can do it okay you can transfer it to any unauthorized person but maximum okay to unauthorized persons whenever you want to transfer it you can transfer maximum 10% of that particular fc okay from whichever fc you are transferring it you, you can transfer maximum 10% okay maximum 10% and even if you are doing up to 10% also then also you have to first take the prior approval okay the authorized person will have to take the prior approval from the central government uh, in form number by applying in form number fc 5 okay acha one small thing which i can just note here is when you went to the mha in foreign hospitality okay in foreign hospitality when you went to mha that application was supposed to be done in fc2 okay fc1 was for your relative fc2 is for your mha and fc5 year is for transfer to an unauthorized person okay and once you get the cg approval after that yes definitely you can transfer it to uh, the unauthorized person maximum up to 10% and now both of them both of them the payer that is the transferer as well as the recipient okay transferer as well as the recipient both of them have to file two two returns that is form of uh, two returns that is in form fc4 and fc10 individually and respectively individually basically so transferer also has to file this and recipient also has to file both of them so this was all about your transfer to an unauthorized person another thing when it comes to utilization okay now when i am planning to utilize when i am planning to utilize this foreign contribution then i have to first utilize it for the purpose for which i have taken it okay maybe charitable activity or something like that for whatever purpose i have accepted this foreign contribution i have to use it only for that purpose only okay A specific restriction here is you cannot utilize you cannot utilize this for any speculation activities okay you cannot use it for any speculative business you cannot use it for any speculation activities because it promises high returns but there is a uh, but there is an equal chance of losing the money or doubling the money what we call in our language right so speculation business is totally not allowed here and one more thing when you are using it for the same purpose for the for which you had obtained it then in that also there is a small restriction that if you want to use any amount for admin expenses for meeting the administrative expenses then maximum 50% of the contribution can be used for administrative expenses but again if if you want to use more than 50% if you want to use more than 50% for the admin expenses then you have to take a prior approval of the central government okay so you are more than 50% for admin expenses is allowed but only after taking the prior approval of the central government right then then the next one next comes here is your section number 9 right section number 9 says that apart from okay i am just simplifying it and telling it to you apart from the restrictions put in the chapter okay apart from the restrictions put in the chapter that is apart from the restriction put in section number 3 apart from the restriction put in section number 6 etc or suppose uh, say for example when the registration to you have been uh, given etc then all such cases in all such cases central government central government can any time impose an extra restriction on you it can any time say it can any time put your name in section 3 list it can any time put your name in section 6 list it can any time remove uh, cancel your certificate etc but 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 this can be done only if central government is of the opinion that it is necessary to do so okay whenever it feels that it is against public interest whenever it thinks that it is against the uh, integrity sovereignty of the country whenever it is affecting our relations with the other country whenever it leads to any communal harmony it affects the communal harmony uh, in our particular country 
or with the other country or it affects the friend, friendly relations of our country with any other country when it affects the election process which was going to be done in the country only only if it is affecting us in a negative way then only the central government can impose the restrictions on us right that was your section number that was the basic conclusion of your section number 9 right now when we go to the next one next one here they are telling that say for example i am such a person okay i am such a person who has accepted fc okay this was that section where in the heading the term currency is used but actually it is applicable to full fc right whenever i am i am say for example i am such a person who has accepted any foreign contribution who has accepted any particular foreign contribution uh, in contravention of the act that is i was actually not supposed to accept but then to i accepted then they are putting a restriction on me that i cannot give it to any other person right i cannot uh, transfer it to any other person i cannot spend it for my personal purpose etc no i cannot do anything basically a prohibition order is passed on me that arpita you cannot do anything and that prohibition order is passed under as per the unlawful activities act 1967 right then after that after that the next important answer which comes up here is your registration answer okay registration we are talking about the registration which can be in two ways either it can be in form of a registration certificate right either it can be in form of a registration certificate or it can be in form of a prior approval right now in first point we are uh, going to talk about the registration certificate if we have a definite program cultural educational social program etc to be done then in that case if i want to accept okay if i want to accept any foreign contribution then certificate of registration is mandatory and in all the other cases in all the other cases basically we can go ahead with this foreign contribution by taking a prior approval from the central government okay the main difference the main difference is when it comes to registration certificate it is valid for a longer period okay and when it comes to prior approval when it comes to prior approval that approval is there only for that particular transaction that means for every transaction for every transaction you'll have to take a prior approval right now ma'am how do we apply for this registration certificate yes the application has to be done to the central government online in form number fc3 along with a proforma along with proforma double a which is going to include which is going to include that affidavit which is going to be signed by the office bearer that whatever information they have given there that is absolutely correct and similarly when we want to take the prior approval okay when we want to take the prior approval then for that we have to make an application in form number fc3b again along with that particular proforma double a right all these documents all these documents electronically digitally signed etc all these will be submitted to the central government online along with the proof that yes you have opened a separate you have opened a separate bank account for receipt for receipt and if you have opened a different bank account for its utilization all those things okay all those things have to be intimated to the central government right acha and whenever you open a different account or whenever you open multiple accounts for utilization of the fc then in that case you have to again intimate this to the central government within 15 days of opening right within 15 days of opening the account you have to intimate it to the central government in form number fc 6d okay in form number fc 60 you have to intimate it to the central government then after that after that uh, they are telling that suppose if all of a sudden a private company or a partnership firm etc if say for example if it wants to do some charitable activity then in that case it can it can uh, seek prior permission or it can go with the registration certificate and it can also accept the foreign contribution there is no harm in that and similarly they are telling similarly they are telling that say for example if there is any particular association or organization whose accounts are to be compulsorily audited okay whose accounts are compulsorily to be audited by the cag then in that case the provisions of this act is not going to apply to them then going to the next one there are some people okay there are some people who will not get the registration certificate also and who will not get the prior approval also basically they are the non clean people they are basically the non clean people to whom the law specifically says that we are not going to give you rc also and we are not going to give you the 
uh, prior permission also okay say for example if that particular person is a benami person that person is a fictitious person that person has been already convicted for transferring that really uh, 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 transferring any person from one religious faith to another that person is engaged in creating disharmony that person is going against the national interest that person is already involved in misutilization of funds siphoning of funds that particular person is leading to violent methods or he is doing some he is undertaking some violent methods or he is going to use the foreign contribution for wrong purposes for wrong purposes or for his personal benefit he is going to use that or if that person has contravened any provisions of this particular act or if that particular person or if that particular person is already prohibited from accepting fc etc then then in such cases initially in itself we will reject their application because that particular person is not eligible that particular person is not eligible to take rc also and that particular person is not eligible to take the prior approval also right then i suppose uh, you know if su such a person applies for this foreign contribution which can lead to happening of an offense or which can lead to you know physical safety endangering the life of any particular person then we will de definitely not give him the uh, rc as well as a prior approval then going to the procedure what is the procedure okay whenever we want to apply now this procedure is for the registration certificate as i have written it here also this process is specifically applicable for the registration certificate okay for registration certificate you have to make an application to the central government okay now since this is rc so application has to be done in form number fc3a right ordinarily if all the documents etc are complete then the central government may grant us the registration within a period of 90 days okay within 90 days it will grant me a registration certificate and that certificate will be valid for a period of 5 years okay if the documents itself are incomplete then it will straight away rejected okay but if the documents are complete but the cg is not satisfied with our application then in that case it may not give us the registration within a period of 90 days it will communicate as the reasons for not giving us the registration but this communication is required only if it is made mandatory by the right to information act 2005 okay only if there is a legal obligation as per rti 2005 then only it has to make me a disclosure of all the information okay now listen now suppose if i have got if i have got the rc now later on if i you know violate or if i try to violate any provisions of the act etc until now the law is not sure okay the law is not sure the question is still pending to be considered that should my registration be cancelled or not then in that case it can to be on a safer side it can suspend my certificate right it can suspend my certificate for a maximum period of 180 days okay don't write it as 6 months it can suspend my certificate for a maximum period of 180 days and and during this period of 180 days i cannot accept any new fc and the fc which is kept with me okay the fc which is already kept with me that can be utilized but only after taking the prior approval of the central government okay here the central government says that if you want to utilize the unutilized amount which is kept with you then in that case you can utilize up to maximum up to 25% of such unutilized amount and ma'am then what about the balance percentage balance percentage will be utilized only after your suspension has been revoked that is suspension has been cancelled not the certificate has been cancelled uh, only after the suspension has been cancelled only after that you can utilize that 75% right and that too for that 25% utilization you still have to take even though you do it within the limit still you have to take the prior approval of the central government okay that is mandatory now now they have given you certain grounds okay they have given you certain grounds on the basis of which my certificate can be cancelled my certificate can be cancelled okay say for example i had on false information basis i had uh, obtained the certificate or say for example i have violated any terms and conditions written in the certificate i have violated any provisions of this particular act or if i have not been engaged in that particular activity for the last 2 years or i have totally become defunct dormant then then after giving a reasonable opportunity of being heard okay after giving me a reasonable opportunity of being heard my registration certificate my registration certificate can be cancelled and once it is rohs is mandatory okay and once my registration certificate is cancelled after that there is going to be a cooling period okay there is going to be a cooling period of how many years there is going to be a cooling period of at least 3 of 3 uh, years not at least there is going to be a cooling period of 3 years and during these 3 years i cannot reapply for getting the new registration certificate etc means i cannot accept any fc during this particular period 
right another thing another thing which is coming up here is the next thing that you can as you can see here on the board is section number 15 okay once my registration certificate has been cancelled okay once my registration certificate has been cancelled then in that case whatever fc was there with me okay whatever fc was there with me whatever assets i had created out of these particular fc that will now vest with the central government or with any particular authority under the central government so either they can use this amount for the same activity for ma'am which activity for which i had accepted the fc say for example i had accepted the fc for charitable activities then in that case the central government can do this charitable activity on my behalf okay and to do this activity if it needs more funds it can sell off those assets also which i had acquired out of uh, foreign contribution and another thing is another thing suppose if it is not able to utilize it uh, within this particular period of 3 years and after 3 years suppose if i get re-registered in the act then they have the right that they can return they have to return the balance amount to okay my punishment period is already done so no offense now so whatever amount was there that will again be refunded back to you okay and then again obviously i have to make sure that i utilize it in a proper manner another thing now say for example i was given the rc okay i was given the rc now the registration certificate validity has got over okay or it is just coming to an end then in that case in the last 5 years okay then in the uh, sorry in the last 6 months in the last 6 months you can get it renewed okay for renewal for renewal you can file the form with the central government along with the fees etc and then the central government can central government can provide you the renewal okay for renewal also the process is same whenever you make an application then generally within a period of 90 days they give you the renewal and after this renewal the uh, cert the new certificate will be valid for period of 5 years okay just like your previous one just like your previous one okay but it can refuse to renew it if it comes to know that we had violated any terms conditions provisions of the act etc then it can even say no to me for this renewal okay the renewed certificate will also be valid for another period of 5 years for renewal we have to make an application in form number fc 3c okay that was fc 3a 3b and now it's 3c application has to be done in fc 3c along with pro forma double a same along with pro forma double a and yes here there is a normal fee if you do everything on time that is in advance if you apply for uh, renewal etc then there is a fees of 1500 rupees that you are supposed to pay okay and if it gets cancelled say for example if it gets cancelled or if they say no for renewal then your fees etc everything is going to lapse okay everything is going to lapse now say for example if you give any reasons if you give any sufficient reason that sir i could not apply for renewal in advance so then they say that okay you can do it even after that period of 5 years okay once your certificate validity has ended even after that within a period of 1 year after 5 years within a period of 1 year you can still go and file a belated application we can call it as a belated application right you can go and file a belated application but along with a late fee normal fees etc is applicable along with that late fee of 5000 rupees will be applicable okay and if the central government is satisfied with everything then it will provide you the uh, renewal okay and suppose if it is not satisfied then in that case you can go and apply you can go and apply for a normal registration for a normal that will be called as a fresh registration right now now when you get the this uh, you know registration certificate etc then in that case you have to make sure registration certificate basically registration certificate as well as the prior approval thing you have to make sure that you use a separate account right as we have already discussed this uh, you have to use a separate bank account first of all uh, this foreign contribution should not get mixed with other receipts or with the local receipts okay so for that particular purpose you have to maintain a separate account okay you can keep one account for receipt as well as utilization okay it has to be a single account only for receipt but for utilization they say that you can open multiple accounts okay you can open multiple accounts for its utilization and as soon as you open more than one account then in that case you have to intimate it online we had already discussed this we have to intimate this online within a period of 15 days from opening of the account in form number fc 6g in fc 6g you have to make sure that you uh, intimate it to the government okay so receipt has to be through a single bank account only and that to of a single bank single branch but utilization can be through multiple accounts there is no problem in that right then so we intimate it to the central government that is one thing plus apart from us even even the banks even the banks are supposed to intimate it to the central government okay even the banks are supposed to intimate it to the central government within 48 hours from any transaction 
be it receipt be it utilization even the bank is going to give the information to the central government so central government gets the information from two sources one is from us and another one another one is from the uh, banks right central government gets the information one is from the customer that is from the assessee and another one is from the bank okay then another thing another thing just like we studied even we have to intimate okay even we have to intimate it to the central government so that intimation is done as per the section number 18 we have to intimate from whom we have got for what purpose we have got how did we get it etc plus for its conversion we'll have to take that certificate etc from the authorized dealer also that is that forex dealer also that document etc we are going to submit it to the central government for this just like you opened a separate bank account you also you are also supposed to keep separate sets of books of accounts right the books of accounts are also supposed to be maintained separately for these particular fc okay for local receipt for other receipts it will be different for fc it will be totally different right now whenever the central government comes to know that there might be any contravention or it needs to check something it needs to check whether we are doing everything legally or not then in that case it can appoint any gazetted officer of a particular level that is holding a group a post under the government it can appoint such a gazetted officer who can come and do the audit who can do who can do the audit of our books of accounts that particular person can enter our premises after sunrise but before sunset they have just told you about entry ah they are not telling you anything about exit they are just talking about the entry thing that entry should be done at these reasonable hours okay and whatever information they get that information has to be kept confidential so basically this is a specific order whenever the cg tells then this particular person can come and this particular person can do this audit okay another thing another thing say for example if we have not done any contravention but we cease to exist or we have become defunct the fc is still left with us the assets are still left with us for example uh, uh, suppose we had some fc we utilize the fc okay fc utilization is done but we are left with some assets then in that case those assets will be disposed of as per the regulatory law okay the law which regulates me the law which regulate me maybe the companies act etc or if nothing is told in that companies act etc then in that case uh, it will be disposed of as per the directions given by the central government okay when was this point when was this point applicable this point was applicable this point was applicable when we have ceased to exist or we have become defunct and we are left with some assets we are left with some assets which were created out of this foreign contribution right another thing another thing which comes up there another thing which comes up there is adjudication okay coming to the uh, last last part another thing which comes up there is adjudication okay whenever they get a doubt okay whenever the authorities get a doubt on us that uh, you know the fc that we had accepted article currency security was it in contravention or not then in that case first they can do seizure okay after getting the doubt first thing that they'll do is they'll seize it after that they are going to adjudicate okay after that they are going to adjudicate after that they are going to determine whether whether it should be confiscated or not okay so now who is going to determine this who is going to determine this this will be determined either by either by the court of session okay either by the court of session the jurisdictional court of session or by an officer who is not below the rank of the assistant session judge okay this assistant session judge level person is going to come into picture only when the value of fc does not exceed rupees 10 lakhs only then the small cases basically we can say that it will be handled by such officer otherwise any other case okay be it less than 10 lakhs 10 lakhs or be it more than 10 lakhs that can be handled by the court of session okay they are going to basically determine okay they are going to basically determine that whether it should be liable for confiscation or not obviously after that if they come to a conclusion that yes it will be liable for confiscation then yes they will confiscate it they will confiscate it but only after giving me a reasonable opportunity of being heard right another thing now say uh, now our conf the, our uh, fc con uh, confiscation etc is going to happen so can i say we can get aggrieved because of that right we can get aggrieved because of the order passed by the session court then we can go and file an appeal to the high court if we are aggrieved by the order passed by the officer not below the rank of assistant session judge then we can go and file an appeal before the session court okay and this appeal in in both of these cases the appeal can be filed within a period of one month okay whenever we got to know about the order from that day within a period of one month we can go and file an appeal and this one month can be extended by maximum one more month okay if obviously wherever extension comes okay wherever extension come extension can be given only if there is any sufficient cause for that 
Okay, now if we are aggrieved by any other decision of the central government, okay, if we are aggrieved by any other order of the central government, then in that case also, initially we were aggrieved because of that confiscation thing, etc. Now we are aggrieved by any other order of the central government, then we can go and file an appeal before the high court directly within a period of 60 days. Okay, and now suppose if I don't want to get into this appeal thing. If I don't want to get into this appeal thing, then I can simply go and make an application to the central government to revise its order. I can tell the central government, sir, please revise your order, right? Either the central government can so more to revise the order uh, uh, within a period of one year, okay, within a period of one year from the date of the order. Or if, uh, if we go and make an application to the central government for revising it, then we have to at least make the application within a period of one year. Definitely, if there are sufficient causes, then this one year period can be extended. Okay, but revision is such a thing where we just try to avoid the appeal procedures. Okay, we don't want to take the headache of appeal, so we can simply go and uh, make an application to the central government for revising its own. Right, now here, here they have given you certain provisions about these offenses and penalties which I have already told you in the uh, main lecture also. Even if you don't, uh, you know, by heart these penalties, it's absolutely alright. But just remember one point here, that is the last one. Let us say for example, if I do a particular offense once, okay, then I will be punishable as per the above table. But if I again do, if I again do a, a subsequent offense, okay, second time, there is no time limit here. Okay, if I any time do a second time same offense, if I do it, then in that case, once I do the second offense, after that I cannot accept any FC, after that I cannot accept any FC for a period of 5 years. That is a punishment given to me. Right? So, any time in the life if you do a second offense, then in, uh, you get a restriction on yourself that you cannot accept any FC for a period of 5 years. Okay, now some miscellaneous pointers coming up here. This first one is offenses by companies. Say for example, if any company is liable under this FCRA, okay, then in that case, in case of company, generally when it comes to your imprisonment etc., we treat, we say that the person in charge, okay, the person in charge, every person in charge who was there in the company at the time of that particular offense, that particular person will be liable until unless he proves that, he proves that he had exercised, he had exercised due diligence, he has exercised due diligence and this offense was done without his knowledge. Only then and only then that person can be saved, okay, but if it is proved, if it is proved that it was done because of his negligence or he had given the consent for doing this particular offense, then boss, you will not be saved and all the officers in charge will be liable at that particular point of time. Okay, whenever any imprisonment etc. comes, then we'll have to go to the court, right, or say just like we did for this confiscation thing also, the session court etc. came into picture. They are not going to deal with our case, okay, they are not going to deal with our case until unless we go and give a cognizance, okay, we go and give a cognizance of the offence, note of the offence, okay, after taking the prior approval of the central government, that is a complainant, the person who goes and files the complaint, that person has to first take the prior approval of the central government or, or the prior approval of any particular authority under the central government. We have to take their approval and only after that, uh, we have to give the note of the offence and only then the court will take up our case for consideration. Right, the next thing, the next thing which comes up here is compounding of certain offences. Okay, whenever, whenever any such offences come where there are imprisonments, right, where there are imprisonments, then in that compulsory imprisonment, then in that case, those offences cannot be compounded. But apart from that, apart from that, if there are any such offences where maybe fine etc. is only imposed, then in that case, in that case, it may be compounded. Compounded means it can be reduced, it can be reduced by the CG officers if they think fit okay if they feel that it's not so serious we can reduce it etc then that can be reduced but but say for example if i have done a first offense if I, if I have done a first offense and if i commit a similar offense within a period of three years okay within a period of three years from the first offense if i do a similar offense again then in that case for the second offense i am not going to get any compounding okay then no compounding benefit is going to be available for me and once compounding is done, then they cannot, you know, go reverse from their own decision. Means no other prosecution, no increasing of penalty, etc. will be applicable after that. Right? Then, after that, the next one, after that, the next one, uh, central government. Central government has the power. Central government has the power to call for information. It has the power to call for documents. It has the power to call for, uh, call us along with any documents, etc. 
बिकॉज इफ इट रिक्वायर्स इफ इट थिंक दैट यू नो इट नीड्स टू फाइंड आउट सम इन्फॉर्मेशन अबाउट द फॉरन कॉन्ट्रीब्यूशन इट्स रिसीव इट्स यूटिलाइजेशन एक्सेट्रा देन डेफिनेटली इट हेज गॉट द पावर्स टू कॉल अस कॉल एनी पर्टिकुलर पर्सन कॉल एनी पर्टिकुलर डॉक्यूमेंट्स एक्सेट्रा इट हेज गॉट ऑल दोज पावर्स एंड फॉर डूइंग दिस इंस्पेक्शन इंक्वायरी इन्वेस्टिगेशन इट कैन अपॉइंट एनी ऑफिसर विद इन दैट राइट इट कैन अपॉइंट एनी पर्टिकुलर ऑफिसर विद इन इट्स सेल्फ हु हैज गॉट द पावर्स ऑफ अ ऑफिसर इन चार्ज ऑफ अ पोलिस स्टेशन इज गॉट सेम पावर्स विच आर देयर विद अ ऑफिसर इन चार्ज ऑफ अ पोलिस स्टेशन right now central government central government has two powers basically the entire law entire law is regulated by whom the entire law is regulated by the central government right so all the powers etc are also there with the central government so central government can either delegate its powers to some other person it will say that okay from today you have to do all my work or it can give directions to some other person it can supervise some other person who is doing the work on behalf of central government right these powers are there with the central government it can give directions also it can do the delegation of work also a delegation of powers also but only one small thing is there which cannot be delegated is making of rules okay whenever it comes to making of any rules etc then those powers are solely there those powers are solely there only with the central government right these powers cannot be exercised by any other person and whenever the central government thinks okay whenever the central government thinks that it is in public interest that it is in public interest it should be done then the central government can provide exemption from the provisions of the act or rules okay it can provide uh, exemptions it can say that okay so and so rule is not applicable to you it can say that so and so section is not applicable to you and this exception it is exemption can be either in full or it can be a partial one either it will say okay full uh, section is not applicable or it will say okay with this so and so condition it is not applicable etc but that is generally done only when it is in public interest this is what they say another thing that they tell us here is whenever there is any transaction okay whenever there is any transaction between two governments between government of india and government of foreign country then the application of this act is not at all there means this act is not applicable to such transaction which is there between government of two countries and the last section and the last section which comes up here last section which comes up here is application of fcra plus the other laws so they are telling that along with fcra along with fcra other laws can also be made applicable it's not that only fcra can be applicable and we had seen this uh, point that whenever uh, you know any uh, prohibition order is passed on me okay whenever any prohibition order is passed on me that prohibition order is passed under the unlawful activities act 1967 something like that was there so along with fcra along with fcra other laws can also be made applicable right so this was all about your fcra which we have tried to revise in 49 minutes i hope this was helpful for you let's start let's start with the revision of scra and scrr secra as well as the scrr secra stands for your securities contract regulation act securities contract regulation act and scrr scrr stands for securities contract regulation rules secra is 1956 scrr is 1957 Uh, now the main objective, the main objective of this particular law. First of all, we are doing it for the secra. The main objective of this particular act is is to prevent the undesirable transactions, to prevent the undesirable transactions which happen, undesirable transactions which happen in the securities market by uh, regulating, by regulating the business of the recognized stock exchange, by regulating the stock exchange. We are trying to prevent the undesirable transactions. now now there is uh, a particular section that is section number 28 as you can see here on the board also section number 28 which talks about uh, non applicability of the secra act secra is not applicable to total five points secra is not applicable to total five things we can say first of all it is not applicable to government it is not applicable to rbi it is not applicable to local authority it is not applicable to any other corporation or uh, association established under any other law any special law it is not applicable to that also and the last one the last one it is not applicable to the convertible bonds in which we get an option to convert these bonds into shares at an agreed price at an agreed price which will be converted at a later date uh, so to that particular terms to that particular term the 
secra is not going to apply so five things i am repeating again first of all government rbi local authority any corporation established under a special act or the convertible bonds convertible bonds uh, having an option to get converted into shares at a at a later date at an agreed price these were the five things to whom the secra was not at all applicable then apart from that now going on to the main sections now going on to the main sections first one is section number 3 first one is section number 3 which talks about application for recognition application for recognition means uh, whenever there is a particular stock exchange whenever there is a particular stock exchange which wants to get itself recognized because uh, now only the recognized stock exchanges can exist so if there is any particular stock exchange who wants to get recognized first of all it will have to go and make an application to the central government uh, practically it happens to the sebi because now the powers have been delegated from the central government to the sebi so the application will be done a uh, stock exchange will go and make an application to the cg that is sebi after that after that for that application first of all it will be done in form a that application will be done in form a uh, ma'am from where did you get this this i am getting this i am getting from the rules this i am getting from the rules as you can see here rule number 3 uh, says that application has to be done in form a plus it says that rule number 4 says that they, we have to pay a fee we have to pay a fee of rupees 500 okay when we make an application we have to pay a fee of rupees 500 along with that particular application form along with that particular application form we'll have to pay the fees plus we'll have to submit plus we'll have to submit the rules and regulations and we'll have to submit the bylaws okay these are just like your charter documents just like your statutory documents just like in case of uh, companies act we have it as moa and aoa similarly secra says that you have to submit bylaws as well as the rules and regulations plus okay so application form is done then your uh, fees is done bylaws is done rules and regulations is done then since your stock exchange since your stock exchange is actually a company only after corporatization it has become a company only so in that case we have to submit the uh, your moa and aoa also and we have to submit four four copies again this was given in the rules we have to submit four four copies as you can see in rule number 5 you will find that we have to submit four copies of that and along with that we have to submit details on four information we have to submit the details on four things first of all we have to give the details about the governing body we have to give the details about the governing body of the stock exchange means the management of the stock exchange its powers etc then we have to submit the details about the office bearers office bearers the post holders in our recognized stock exchange then we have to give the details about the classes of members means which category of members can be accepted which category of persons can be accepted as a brokers in the recognized stock exchange what will be their qualifications etc and the last point was if any uh, partnership firm etc is going to be appointed as a member then in that case who will be the authorized representative in those cases uh, what we have decided for our recognized stock exchange all these information we are going to go and submit it to the uh sebi we can say we will go and submit it to the sebi and if they are satisfied if they are satisfied then in that case it can lead to granting of recognition right it can lead to granting of recognition these rules rule number 3 4 5 any rules any rules basically scrr is applicable only to the new code but anyway i am taking it together itself so that we can correlate next next comes is your section next section which is coming up is your section number 4 which talks about granting of recognition next section which comes up is talking about granting of recognition now once we made an application once we made an application in section number 3 once we made an application to the sebi in section number 3 then in that you can write cg or sebi as the case may be or you can just write cg slash sebi that is the powers have been delegated now once the application form reaches them okay now they are going to check three primary things okay they are going to check three primary things first of all whether the rules regulations bylaws are in conformity okay whether the rules uh, bylaws etc are in conformity means they are proper or not they are legal or not second one whether the stock exchange whether the stock exchange is willing to comply with any conditions which might be imposed by the cg or sebi in the near future okay we are just checking the willingness okay we are just checking the willingness whether the central uh, whether the stock exchange is willing to comply with those conditions which may be imposed in the near future and the third one we are going to check whether granting of this recognition is in the interest of trade and public right if all the conditions if all the conditions are fulfilled then in that case cg or sebi whatever you want to write there cg or sebi may grant the recognition
right now ma'am which conditions which conditions may be imposed in future we have got an illustrative list for that now it can talk about the qualification of the members qualification of the brokers it can talk about the manner it can talk about the manner in which the contract may be entered into between the stock exchange and between the investors or between the members and between the investors then will there be any representation of the central government on the board of the recognized stock exchange means central government can also have some control here in the board of directors of the recognized stock exchange just to have a proper control nothing is no other motive just to have a proper control in this recognized stock exchange even central government can have a representation in this particular management and the last one talks about the maintenance of books of accounts and its audit means the cg or sebi can make certain rules about maintenance of books of accounts and its audit and and the main purpose here is whatever rules okay whatever rules whatever regulations whatever provisions are made by the cg or sebi in the near future uh, at least the stock exchange at least the stock exchange is willing it should be willing to comply with those conditions okay i am repeating i am repeating the four points again the extra four conditions uh, illustrative pointers first of all that was talking about the qualification of the members then the manner in which the contract note may be entered into then the third one was talking about representation of central government in the governing body of the stock exchange whenever i say governing body governing body means they are talking about the management okay board and then and then the last point last point was talking about the maintenance of books of accounts and its audit right this is what we uh, studied in this is what we studied in section number 4 mainly and yes once all these conditions are fulfilled once all these conditions are fulfilled after that yes if everything is good then the recognition can be granted to us and once the recognition is granted to us once the recognition is granted to us that recognition will be published in that recognition will be published in the gazette of india as well as the official gazette of the state where the recognized stock exchange is located right and suppose suppose now till here we were just talking about the case where our application got accepted say for example if the application gets rejected say for example if the application gets rejected then in that case if they want to reject if they want to reject our application then they have to compulsorily give us then they have to compulsorily give us a reasonable opportunity of being heard they'll have to give us the reasons in writing and only after that the rejection can happen right and once once it is approved just like your surfizi once it is recognized as a stock exchange then after that whenever it wants to change its rules regulations bylaws etc we have to take the prior approval of the sel right we have to take the prior approval of the sel then uh, the next rules coming up here see corresponding rules which are coming up here is whenever whenever the recognized stock exchange is going or whenever the stock exchange is going to get the recognition before getting the recognition cg or sebi okay practically it's sebi sebi can conduct some enquiries okay before giving you the recognition it can conduct some some enquiries it can do some questioning it can do some inspection etc and after that after that it can grant you the recognition whatever recognition is granted to you okay whatever recognition is granted to you that is in form of a certificate which is there in form b in a format called as form b and its validity will be of at least its validity can be of any period but at least it should be of one year okay it has to be at least of one year and if it fulfills all the conditions which we have just studied in section number 4 okay if it fulfills all the conditions then in that case that form b can be issued to you means the recognition can be granted to you right and now now say for example if your uh, form b if your certificate comes up with a particular validity if your form b comes up with a particular validity and uh, now it is just nearing it is just nearing the expiry then in that case you can get it renewed just 3 months 3 months before the expiry you have to make sure that you have got it renewed again for renewal again for renewal you will have to go and make an application in the initial form that is form a but here the fees will be 200 rupees for the first time application for the first time application the fees was how much it was 500 rupees and now the fees is 200 rupees this is for the renewal i hope everyone is clear till here now going on to the next rule going on to the next rule the next rule um, is a lengthy rule which talks about the qualification right rule number 8 is the rule which talks about the qualification for the members of the stock exchange in this the most important rules are rule 81 and 82 basically sub rule 1 and sub rule 2 is specifically very very important sub rule 1 sub rule 1 talks about the basic qualification basic qualification which is to be fulfilled or which has to be uh, you know yes fulfilled by all the categories of the members that person the person who is going to be appointed as a member of the recognized stock exchange that person has to 
uh, be uh, if that person is of less than 21 years of age then he is disqualified if that person is not a citizen of india then he is disqualified but however in this case of citizenship in this case of citizenship relaxation may be provided by the recognized stock exchange relaxation may be provided that okay seeing to some integrity knowledge uh, his position etc even though he is not a citizen of india we can grant him the permission if any person has been adjudged uh, by the court as an insolvent or bankrupt if any person has compounded with his creditors if any person is convicted of any offense uh any particular offense if that particular person is engaged in some other kind of business if that person is engaged in some other kind of business which is not at all relating to the securities market etc then boss he cannot become a member of the recognized stock exchange but suppose if he was acting as an agent or broker in the securities market only so now he can become a member but provided he severs off severs off his connection with the existing business because now he can solely be a broker of the recognized or member of a recognized stock exchange and the last one is last one is if any particular person had earlier applied for this recognition for this um, application for becoming a member of the recognized stock exchange and if if his application was rejected if his application was rejected then in that case then in that case we have to wait for a period of at least 1 year after waiting for a period of 1 year then only that person can again apply for becoming a member of the recognized stock exchange okay so th these were uh, the basic points which have to be fulfilled basically if any one of the disqualification also gets attracted if any one disqualification also gets attracted then in that case then in that case uh, that person is not eligible to become a member of the recognized stock exchange coming on to some additional rules coming on to some additional rules rule 82 which is there in this we have to make sure that after we have fulfilled the provisions of rule 81 after that we have to make sure this point rule 82 is basically talking about the experience the person who has fulfilled 81 even though if he wants to become a member either he should have a prior experience either he should have a prior experience of at least 2 years in this particular field either he has acted as an assistant or apprentice etc or he has partnered with any other member of the recognized stock exchange basically he should be having 2 years of experience second point was he is not having the experience but after becoming the member after becoming the member he says that okay for the next 2 years i will gain the experience but i will not undertake any contracts in my name because till now he is just a trainee even though he is a member of the recognized stock exchange but then too he will be in the form of trainee only so this is just like after becoming a member he is taking the experience and the third one third one was totally different where he was succeeding to the business uh, to the business of retired or deceased a person that is his father brother uncle uh, or any close relative if he succeeding to that particular business but definitely he should be having knowledge he should be having knowledge and experience in this particular field of securities market and if suppose they feel that in case of any particular person that person is already having good experience etc that person is already at a good position he is having good knowledge then in that case we can waive off some conditions in that case we can waive off certain conditions so 81 was talking about the basic qualifications 82 uh, or we can say qualifications or disqualification and 82 was specifically talking about the experience mainly it was talking about the experience now 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 comes your rule number 83 83 says that 83 says that if there is any particular person who has been admitted as a member okay if there is any particular person who has been admitted as a member after he becomes a member if he attracts any disqualification okay i am not reading those points if he attracts any disqualification then in that case later on see first we checked at the time of becoming the member at that time if no disqualification cool no problem but later on after he became a member if he has attracted any disqualification then in that case then in that case then in that case that person will have to discontinue that person won't be eligible to become a member of the recognized stock exchange then after that rule 84 and 84a rule 84 and rule 84a talks about company becoming a member of the recognized stock exchange company becoming a member of the recognized stock exchange uh in case of rule 84 a specific company which was formed under section 322 of the company is that 1956 which was such a company where the liability the company was a limited company but with unlimited liability of its directors majority of the directors majority of directors have to be the shareholders and they have to be the authorized representatives in the recognized stock exchange basically they have to be the members of that recognized stock exchange and here these people are going to have the unlimited liability suppose if they commit any particular a uh, default then in that case these directors these directors are going to have their unlimited liability so such a company can also become 
such a company can also become a member of the recognized stock exchange apart from that a normal company apart from that a normal company be it a limited company be it an unlimited company be it a guarantee company if these companies fulfill a normal company if these companies fulfill the requirements of the sebi if they comply with the norms of the sebi then in that case even they can become a member of the recognized stock exchange but in that case we have to make sure that directors are not disqualified directors of that particular company are not disqualified ma'am not disqualified means means they have to make sure that at least rule a to 1 at least rule a to 1 is getting fulfilled and uh, in terms of experience at least two directors at least two directors must have two years of experience of dealing in the security so that it becomes a proper entity it becomes a proper entity to become a member of the recognized stock exchange coming to uh, next uh, points that is your partnership firm and the llp even partnership firm and llp can become the member of the recognized stock exchange in case of partnership again the partners partners are going to have the unlimited liability just like we studied for that particular company the partners are going to have an unlimited liability the partners should be qualified they should not be disqualified basically and at least two of the partners must have the experience of at least two years coming on to llp coming on to llp again a llp can become a member of the recognized stock exchange provided that llp complies with all the norms as given by the sebi again the designated partners of the llp you must have heard the term designated partners in case of llp all the designated partners must be properly uh, qualified that is they should not attract the disqualification and at least two such partners at least two such partners should have at least two years of experience okay these were the most important points which i have just revised in the rule number 8 and then we have certain entities as you can see here we have certain entities which are government backed entities or which have government holding or which are controlled by the government we have certain uh, name of the entities given up here these entities can become these entities can also become the member of the recognized stock exchange even without complying even without complying the provisions of rule 8 3 and 8 4 even without complying with the provisions of rule 8 3 and 8 4 ma'am what was rule 8 3 8 was the point where the disqualifications get retracted after we become a member so in in if these cases in these cases if the disqualification gets attracted but if sebi says no problem if sebi makes a recommendation that no problem uh, you can continue to be a member then these people can continue to become a member uh, to uh, stay as a member and 8 4 8 was talking about that unlimited liability thing in case of companies and unlimited liability so in these cases the directors etc do not even if they do not have an unlimited liability that's absolutely all right okay so this these were the main points these were the main points in your rule number 8 uh, now going back coming back to the important provisions coming back to the important provisions of secra now here we are studying about section number 5 here we are studying about section number 5 section number 3 we saw about the application for recognition section number 4 we studied about granting of recognition and section number 5 we are studying about the withdrawal of recognition withdrawal of recognition so say for example now if we have been granted the recognition if we have been granted the recognition by the cg or the sebi as the case may be but now they are of the opinion they are of the opinion that the recognition must be withdrawn in the interest of public it must be withdrawn in the interest of trade etc uh, and if it is not uh, uh, favorable to continue the recognition of a particular stock exchange then in that case then in that case it can withdraw it can withdraw the recognition by first serving a notice by, by first serving a notice on that particular stock exchange on that particular recognized stock exchange in form c okay that withdrawal notice withdrawal notice here it's written already in rule number 13 it's written that it will be the uh, withdrawal notice will be in form c okay we have to give them the reasons also basically we have to give them a reasonable opportunity of being heard before we withdraw their recognition we can just reverse we can just reverse the provisions of section number 4 and we can just write here if the rules and bylaws are not in conformity now if they are not willing to comply with any conditions or if the re recognition is not in the interest of trade or public then in that case the withdraw the recognition can be withdrawn okay but if suppose if the recognition is withdrawn suppose if the recognition is withdrawn then in that case whatever contracts were entered before whatever contracts were entered before by the stock exchange with the investors etc those won't get affected because we are not going to hamper the interest of the we are not going to affect the interest of the investors there one more important reason one more important reason for withdrawal of recognition is say for example when the scheme for corporatization and demutualization had come at that time it was mandatory for the stock exchanges to get themselves corporatized 
so if we did not get ourselves corporatized or demutualized corporatized means we did not convert ourselves into company and demutualized means we did not segregate the ownership and the management suppose if we did not do that or we submitted a scheme for doing this we submitted the scheme for doing the corporatization and demutualization but but the scheme was rejected by the sebi then in that case boss now there is nothing called as only stock exchange because now there is a concept of corporatized recognized stock exchange only so corporatization is mandatory so in that case if you have not got yourself corporatized or de and demutualized then in that case then in that case your recognition can be withdrawn and once the recognition is withdrawn this will be published this will be published in the gazette again the gazette of india as well as the official gazette of the state now going to the next part going to the next part this till here we just spoke about making an application granting of the recognition and withdrawing of the recognition till here uh, till this, this point we have basically studied now now here they are talking about some basic administrative provisions that is about maintaining of books of accounts getting their audit etc now here comes first of all we have already done uh, rule number 13 which talks about the form c that uh, withdrawal notice withdrawal notice was given in form number c now listen now every stock exchange every stock exchange can i say it is regulated by the sebi every stock exchange is regulated by the sebi right so sebi can tell sebi can tell any particular sebi can tell any particular stock exchange to maintain a specific set of books of accounts as we had studied this uh, in the future conditions this we had studied in uh, section number 4 if you remember what can be the future conditions uh, which can be imposed by the cg or the sebi which the se has to comply with the stock exchange has to comply so here the sebi can tell the stock exchange to maintain a particular category of books of accounts and uh, whenever whenever it is told by the sebi we also have to get those books of accounts audited right whenever they tell us we have to get the books of accounts audited then the stock exchange has to maintain stock exchange has to preserve and maintain the books of accounts for a period of for a period of 5 years normally your cash book pass book minutes book the transaction book uh, members broker book etc all these things have to be maintained by the stock exchange for a period of for a period of 5 years similarly when it comes to the members when it comes to the members that is the members of the recognized stock exchange brokers of the recognized stock exchange there are two categories mainly they also have to maintain the books of accounts for a period of they also have to maintain their books of accounts for a period of 5 years but there are certain certain voluminous books there are certain voluminous books voluminous files etc which have to be maintained only for a period of 2 years as you can see here the year it's written year it's written about 5 years and year it's written about 2 years okay so they have categorized here basically for the recognized stock exchange for the stock exchange they have to maintain it for a period of 5 years when it comes to the members there are two categories for a maximum thing they have to maintain it for a period of 5 years and rest of the thing have to be maintained for a period of 2 years going on to the next section going on to the next section section number 6 which is an important section section number 6 which is an important section 3 4 5 okay section number 3 4 5 was equally important section number 6 is also important okay i have already star marked here when i was teaching in the regular batch section number 6 powers of the central government or the sebi powers of the central government or sebi to call for information now since we are the recognized stock exchange we are the recognized stock exchange cg or the sebi has the power on us they have the regulation on us so they have the power to call for the information now here here mainly we are going to have five points okay everyone here along with me we are going to have five points here first point is every recognized stock exchange has to furnish periodical returns okay it has to furnish periodical returns after every particular periodicity they have to submit the periodical returns to the sebi which contain some a specific information which is given in the rules okay which contains some specific information which is given in the rules and we have got a rule number 17a okay we have got a rule number 17a in which the content of the periodical return is given that what all information are we supposed to submit okay so recognized stock exchange is going to submit this recognized stock exchange is going to submit this to the cg or the sebi practically it is submitted to the sebi another thing is another thing is <clears throat> whatever were the books of accounts which is maintained by the recognized stock exchange those can be inspected by the sebi remember it had told us to maintain the books of accounts rsc had maintained the books of accounts for a period of 5 years plus it can call those books of accounts for inspection okay first one was a general point first one was talking about the periodical returns which has to be submitted every time no problem in that second thing is whatever books of accounts were maintained by the recognized stock exchange all those can be inspected by the sebi whenever it has any doubts etc 
third thing is it can it can call for any specific information it can do the enquiries it can question any particular person in the recognized stock exchange it can appoint one or more persons for doing this particular enquiry okay so i am repeating again because it's important that's why i am repeating first point was periodical returns second point was sebi can do the inspection of the books of accounts then the third point was it can do the enquiries and for doing this enquiries it can appoint one or more enquiry officers then the fourth point fourth point was whenever they come okay whenever they come for enquiries inspection etc then it is our duty it is the duty of the recognized stock exchange it is the duty of every member of the recognized stock exchange it is the duty of the office bearers it is the duty of the governing body of the recognized stock exchange that we have to provide them all the necessary information okay this is a very simple point we have to provide them all the necessary information and uh, we have to cooperate with them okay this is very very important we have to provide them the necessary information and we have to cooperate with them and the last point last point is whenever whenever they are done with this inquiry inspection etc after that after that if if circumstances uh, warrant or if circumstances uh, are there then in that case the sebi can carry out the special investigation also that is it can get into detail of a particular matter if it thinks so if it thinks so then after your inspection and inquiry it can get into the special investigation okay so these are the powers this is a very crucial answer these are the powers of the cg or the sebi in respect of the recognized stock exchange okay then you have this rule number 17a rule number 17a is nothing but rule number 17a is nothing but your some pointers about the periodical returns that what all information are submitted in the periodical returns the content of that is written this is just a one time read this is just a one time read you can just read it once basically your how much uh, how much transactions were done through the clearing house how how many securities were listed how many securities were delisted how many were brought or taken removed from the forward list then uh, what about the making up prices what are the official rates of the securities listed these are certain general information which is to be submitted by the recognized stock exchange to the cg or the sebi in form of the periodical return which we just studied in section number 6 point number 1 okay now so that was your periodical return after every particular periodicity you have to submit that you have to submit that then along with that comes a point called as annual report annual report means you can understand the period annual report means it is a period of one year it is a report of one year that is a report of full one calendar year full one calendar year about the activities of the recognized stock exchange okay here also they have given you the pointers what all things are we supposed to mention in that particular annual report all those things are given in that particular uh, all those things have to be returned in that annual report and we are going to go and submit it we are going to go and submit it to the sebi now i told you this is for a calendar year okay so say for example if it is for the year 2020 if it is for the year 2020 then the due date will be next year 31st of jan okay next year 31st of jan will be the due date when we are supposed to submit it to the sebi and this is called as annual report again again year in rule number 17 again here in rule number 17 they have given you the contents that what all things what all things will be will be forming part of the annual report okay again not to be by hearted you can just read it once a few points are similar a few points are similar to the periodical returns but don't get confused between the two that was about the periodical returns maybe it can go quarterly in a year and this is for the entire year okay this annual report is for the entire year right next next important section coming up there next important section coming up there is section number 7a 7a talks about the restricting voting rights restricting voting rights and very very important answer very very important answer now whenever 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 the recognized stock exchange wants to restrict the voting rights of its members okay whenever it wants to restrict the voting rights of its members then obviously it will have to first amend its rules okay it has to first take the approval of the central government it has to take the approval of the central government and then only it can amend its rules for what all purposes ma'am can it amend its rules there are three things there are three things first of all first of all if it wants to if it wants to restrict the voting rights only to a particular category of members only to a particular class of members say for example it wants to restrict the voting rights only to the brokers then in that case it will have to first amend the rules okay otherwise otherwise generally what is the rule voting rights is with all the shareholders but if it wants to restrict it to a particular class to a particular category then that can be done second one second one is if it wants to make a rule if it wants to make a rule that one person one member is going to carry only one vote irrespective of the number of shares held then in that case first amend the rules and the third one if it wants to put a restriction if it wants to put a restriction on appointment of proxy 
on amendment of proxy then again it will have to first amend the rule right and for amending the rules what are we supposed to do for amending the rules we'll have to take the prior approval of the central government right we have to take the prior approval of the central government and here in the last point i have written i have written the general pointers here which is actually happening now in the recognized stock exchanges that first of all only a member only a member can be appointed as a proxy and as of now one person carries one vote okay irrespective of whatever shares i am holding in the stock exchange irrespective of that one person will be treated one person's one person will be counted as one vote this is the practical thing which is happening okay don't write it in the main answer if you want you can write it in the note but don't write it in the main answer okay in the main answer if we want to uh, change any of those things then we'll have to first amend the rules and for amending the rules we'll have to take the prior approval of the central government next comes next comes is your section number 8 okay next one is your section number 8 section number 8 talks about section number 8 talks about a forceful section section number 8 is a forceful section zabardasti section power of power of central government or the sebi to make rules okay say for example if the central government or the sebi consults the recognized stock exchange the governing body of the recognized stock exchange to make some rules to make some new rules or to amend some rules uh, then in that case then in that case the cg or the sebi will uh, we can say in one in one manner we can say that it um, imposes it imposes a power on the recognized stock exchange to make new rules or to amend those rules and this is to be done by the recognized stock exchange within a period of 2 months okay the day when the order is passed by the cg or sebi from that day it has to do within a period of 2 months if it does not do if the stock exchange of the or the recognized stock exchange if it fails to do then in that case the new rules will be made or the rules will be amended by the cg or the sebi itself okay they will forcefully make the new rules they will amend these rules and it will be deemed it will be deemed as if the new rules or uh, new rules have been made by the stock exchange itself or it will be deemed as if the amendment which have been done in the rules etc these have been done by the stock exchange itself so basically here the cg or sebi wants the stock exchange to do it if stock exchange does not do it then it will be compulsorily done by the cg or sebi but the name will come on the stock exchange itself okay and once the rules are made or once the rules are amended it, it will be published in the gazette okay it will be published in the gazette next one next one is a very simple answer which talks about the clearing corporation initially initially we had something called as clearing house okay initially we had something called as clearing house then it got converted into a company just like a corporatization it got converted into a company called as clearing corporation the main work the main work of this clearing corporation is to do the settlements is to do the settlement of all the transactions to do the delivery of the securities from one account to another for excuse me sorry to do the delivery of securities from one account to another for effecting the payment uh, for the transactions etc this is the work this is basically the back end work which happens in the uh, stock exchange so now when this clearing house got converted into this clearing corporation when this clearing house got converted into this clearing corporation all the rights all the rights duties powers of the clearing house also came to the clearing corporation right and whenever the clearing corporation wants to make any bylaws or when it wants to amend its bylaws it has to get the approval from the sebi okay it has to get the approval from the sebi and sebi will approve it sebi will approve it if it is in the interest of trade and public okay clearing corporation was a one time read answer you just have to know that initially it was called as a clearing house now it is called as a clearing corporation going on to the next one section number 9 section number 9 was talking about section number 9 was talking about the bylaws okay section number 9 was talking about making of bylaws section number 8 was talking about making or amending the rules section number 9 talks about making of the bylaws okay so first of all the bylaws are made by the stock exchange itself okay bylaws are made by the stock exchange itself anything relating to the securities those bylaws can be made by the recognized stock exchange itself but whenever it makes any bylaws it has to get the approval okay it has to get the approval from the cg or the sebi but practically it is taken from the sebi only and it should be written in the bylaws also okay it should be written in the bylaws also that if any uh, bylaws have been contravened if any bylaws have been contravened then the entire contract which was entered which was entered by the recognized stock exchange that will be totally treated as void because you cannot violate your own made bylaws right you cannot violate them and uh, once once the bylaws are made and once they are approved by the sebi after that after that it is published again it is published in those two gazettes okay so this was bylaws was very very simple the bylaws will be made by the stock exchange it will be approved by the sebi and then it will be published in the 
guess it now section number 9 was talking about making the bylaws section number 10 is talking about amending the bylaws it is talking about amending the bylaws bylaws can be amended either it can be amended so motto by the sebi sebi if it thinks that it should be amended then it can amend it or we can go and make an application okay any person can go and make an application to the sebi that sir we should amend the bylaws of the recognized stock exchange in good interest okay in good interest then after that after that sebi will consult sebi will consult the management it will consult the governing body of the recognized stock exchange and then it can amend it okay it will decide whether it is whether it is actually necessary whether it is actually required to amend or not and after that it can amend okay after amending after amending if the stock exchange thinks that no this uh, change was not good then it can apply to the sebi for revision okay within 2 months it can apply to the sebi for revision and now everything is in the hands of the sebi whether it wants to do this revision or not next next two important sections coming up here next two important sections coming up here is section number 11 and section number 12 section number 11 and section number 12 section number 11 talks about superseding of the stock exchange superseding superseding means to overtake or override okay now cg central government has the power central government has the power to supersede the board of the recognized stock exchange that is the governing body of the stock exchange can be overtaken by the central government if it thinks that if it thinks that the governing body of the recognized stock exchange is not working properly if it's not operating properly then the central government can come into picture it will remove the existing people sitting in the management and it will appoint its own persons who are going to conduct who are going to continue the business of the recognized stock exchange okay and then the next one next one is a very simple one power to suspend the business of the recognized stock exchange if there is any such emergency arisen okay if there is any particular emergency which has arisen then in that case then in that case central government can suspend central government can suspend the business of the recognized stock exchange for that it will have to pass a notification for that it will have to pass a notification and in that suspension can happen one time one time if you are you know if first time if you are coming up with this or uh, notification for suspension then in that particular notification that cannot exceed a period of 7 days okay later on if you want to extend it can be done but uh, uh, at the beginning itself you cannot write okay that it is suspended for a period of 20 days no that can happen for a period of 7 days maximum later if you want to extend then that can be extended but that is only in case of emergency when the central government is of the opinion that it is necessary to put this uh, suspension another section section number 12a as you can see on the board i have already marked it as very very important section number 12a is such a section which is again going to be repeated in the sebi chapter section 12a is important power of the sebi powers of the sebi to issue directions sebi has the power to issue directions to each and every person who is associated with the stock exchange which is associated with the securities market we can say that is it can issue directions to the recognized stock exchange it can issue directions to the members of the stock exchange it can issue directions to the underwriters portfolio uh, managers uh, investment advisors underwriters merchant bankers uh, listed company or proposed to be listed company any person who is associated with the securities market we can issue directions to them okay directions can be issued in three cases if it is if it is in the interest of the investors if it is to prevent the detrimental affairs which are being carried on which are being conducted in the recognized stock exchange or or to secure proper management just just that is to make sure that everything is being managed in a proper manner or not for any of these three reasons for any of these three reasons directions can be issued directions can be issued by the sebi by the sebi to any person who is associated with the securities market okay it can be stock exchange it can be like i told you it can be underwriters it can be clearing corporation it can be members of the stock exchange it can be already listed company it can be a proposed listed company it can be issued to any particular person okay and this direction this direction includes this direction includes by default this is this note is very very important this power this power always include the power to discharge to dis, uh, discharge that is to seize that is to seize the amount of profit made or the amount of loss averted by contravention of the provisions of the secra okay that is if we have contravened the provisions of secra and if we have earned any wrongful profit or if we have avoided any particular loss then that much amount can be recovered on from us okay for that the penalties etc would be applicable that's a different that uh, that's a different thing apart from that the wrong profits etc that we have made even that can be recovered from us okay section number 13 section number 13 is a one time read section but it's a very simple section they are just trying to say that if there is any particular place that is state 
city, area, etc., which has been notified by the central government or the SEBI, which has been notified by the central government or the SEBI, that in this particular area, if in this particular area you cannot enter, you cannot enter into any particular contract, okay, you cannot enter into any particular contract. Uh, without the broker okay without the broker without the member of the recognized stock exchange and then too if you have entered into that particular contract then that contract will be totally illegal okay means 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 if you want to enter into a contract in those particular areas it can be done it can be done only through the recognized stock exchange okay it can be done only through the recognized stock exchange then a similar connecting section is section number 14 okay after section number 13 you can do section number 14 if you have entered into such contracts which were just prohibited in section number 13 if you have entered into such contracts then in that case that will be that will be totally null and void that will be illegal means it will be void ab initio it will be void ab initio means it will uh, it will be assumed as if such transaction has never happened before okay zero that uh, value of the transaction will be totally zero now then going on to the above section that was your section number four, uh, 13a section number 13a was talking about additional trading floor which is nothing but which is nothing but a facility which is offered by the recognized stock exchange itself where the members of the stock exchange members of the stock exchange can sit and they can do the trading on behalf of the recognized stock exchange uh, they can do the trading and, uh, on behalf of the recognized stock exchange and they come under the purview okay they they come under the purview of the recognized stock exchange itself Right. So whenever, so whenever we want to establish any additional trading floor, that particular recognized stock exchange will have to take the prior approval from the SEBI that we are starting an additional place. We are starting an additional trading floor from where we are going to do the trading. Next section, section number 15, which is very, very important. Section number 15 is very, very important. Section 15 talks about members not to act as principals. Okay. Whenever the, we talk about the brokers of the stock exchange, whenever we talk, we talk about the brokers of the stock exchange, then they always act as an agent okay they always act as an agent for us that is they undertake the transactions on our behalf okay they undertake the transactions on our behalf for which they charge their brokerage and commission so for there there will be total three points in this particular section first point is first point is by default by default if there is any particular transaction between the members and the investors then that is always on the principal agent relationship okay there is always a principal agent relationship which exists okay this is the by default transaction second one however a member of a stock exchange can enter into a transaction with another member of a stock exchange the transaction can be done between two members on their own account okay for their own account they can also do this particular transaction there is no restriction if the transaction is between two members and that becomes on a principal principal basis because now no one is the agent now they are principal principal right then the third one then the third one is uh, even a member even a member can enter into a transaction with a non member with a non member means a person can enter into a, a broker can enter into a transaction with an investor and that can even be on principal principal basis that can be on principal principal basis but there is a particular formality which has to be complied with first of all we have to take the return consent from that non member Okay, if he has not given the return consent, then no problem. First, enter into the transaction, but you have to make sure that within a period of three days, within a period of three days, we have taken a return consent from that particular member. And in the contract note, in the contract note, it should be specified there that member, the broker is not acting as a broker, but he is acting as a principal. Okay, these three formalities, these three pointers are compulsorily supposed to be returned for the purpose of section number 50. Okay. Then after that, after that section number 16, 17, etc. These are one time read section 16, 17, 17a. Eh? We'll just go through them for a part. Section number 16, section number 16 is power to prohibit contracts in certain cases. They are telling that if in any particular securities we see an undesirable speculation which is happening, then in that case we can put a restriction. We can put a restriction on those particular securities. We are not suspending the trading in the stock exchange. We are not suspending uh, the business of the stock exchange, no, but we are stopping the trading of those particular securities in which we see that uh, there is an undesirable speculation in that particular area. And if, and if, um, you know, if you still do trading in those particular securities, if you still do trading in those particular securities, then that will be totally illegal. That will be totally void ab initio. 
then section number 17 says that section number 17 says that brokers brokers have to be compulsorily licensed okay non licensed brokers are totally not allowed this is the only conclusion of section number 17 if you have to become a broker if you have to become a member of the stock exchange then you have to get the approval from the sebi okay the license will be provided to you by the sebi and only then you can act as a member of the recognized stock exchange then in case of section number 17a in case of section number 17a suppose if there is any particular spv which has which has applied to the stock exchange for permission for uh, trading in the security receipts etc or for issue of security receipts or for listing of security receipts spv you can link it with the arc that we had studied in the surprise chapter and suppose now it has already started raising the money it has already started raising the money from the qibs or from the investors but later on it is denied the permission from the uh, uh, rac or from the sebi then in that case whatever money it has collected whatever money it has collected from the investors that has to be returned back to them within a period of 8 days from the rejection and if not returned within a period of 8 days then after that the interest meter would start interest meter would start uh, at the rate at the rate of 15% right interest would be applicable at the rate of 15% means we'll have to return the money the basic money along with interest at the rate of 15% Another section, section number 18, which is very, very simple. They are telling that to spot delivery contracts, spot delivery contracts or those contracts in which actual delivery of trans, actual delivery of securities happen either on the same day of the contract or on the next day, the actual delivery of uh, securities happen to them, to them, section number 13, 14, 15 and 17 is not applicable. 13 and 14 was talking about that illegal transactions, those illegal transactions in a particular area, etc. They are telling it is not applicable. Then section number 15, what was section number 15 talking about? Section number 15 was talking about that members not to act as principal. And section number 17 uh, is the unlicensed dealer answer that we had done. So now these are those transactions, uh, spot delivery contracts are generally those transactions which are not done between the brokers or which are not done through the brokers. These are the normal direct investments. These are the direct investments which is done by between the investor and the promoter of a particular company so that's why the broker nowhere comes into the picture the members of the stock exchange nowhere comes into the picture so as of now as of now these transactions are not at all regulated these transactions are not at all regulated by the brokers that's why they are not regulated by the stock exchanges and that's why that's why as of now cg does not have any control on those transactions but if in future if it requires if it thinks that the control should be exercised then cg can uh, exercise control on those particular uh, transactions next one section number 18 is very very simple which talks about the contracts and derivatives they say that contracts and derivatives or transaction derivatives is totally allowed that is totally legal that can be traded but provided that provided that these transactions are done in the recognized stock exchange these are settled on the clearing corporation compulsorily we can say clearing house or clearing corporation as the case may be and and they have complied with all the norms as specified by the central government so in if these conditions are fulfilled if these conditions are fulfilled then no problem then the transactions in derivatives as we must have studied in our sfm also derivatives are totally legal but as per law these three pointers are mandatory then going to the next one section number 19 is very very simple stock exchange other than recognized stock exchange stock exchange other than recognized stock exchange is totally prohibited this we have already discussed there has to be a recognized stock exchange only <coughs> there cannot be any stock exchange there cannot be any stock exchange apart from rsc so now if you want to have a stock exchange it has to be mandatorily a recognized stock exchange only otherwise otherwise go and meet the central government and the central government will tell you to get the recognition right then then coming on to the next part of the chapter coming on to the next part of the chapter where we are going to talk about the listing and the delisting things <coughs> we, we are going to talk about the listing and the delisting thing first of all whenever we want to get our securities listed okay whenever we want to get our securities listed then in that case then in that case we have to make sure that we comply that we comply with all the terms and conditions of the listing agreement okay listing agreement we have to go and submit it to the rsc so we have to make sure that all those conditions have been complied with okay all those conditions have been complied with the listing agreement etc has to be executed on a non-judicial stamp paper we'll have to go and submit it to the rsc etc and if it is satisfied if it is satisfied then it will allow us to uh, what list our securities on the recognized stock exchange okay if all the conditions are fulfilled then the securities get listed on the recognized stock exchange now either at the time of giving okay when we are making this application for listing 
either it can say no okay it can refuse it can refuse to list that is non listing it will not allow us to list the securities or or in that or it will say okay fine no problem everything is perfect your securities get listed okay now say for example if your securities have got listed if your securities have got listed then in that case later now listing etc is happening trading etc is happening no problem is there but later on if any conditions are violated okay if any conditions of the rules are violated then in that case after giving you a reasonable opportunity of being heard and after recording the reasons your securities can be delisted okay recognized stock exchange may deal is the uh, securities of your particular company if you have violated okay if you have violated the provisions if you have violated the provisions of rule number 21 okay if any of the provisions are attracted then in that case it will lead to delisting of the security now if delisting happens first of all first of all either the company the listed company will be aggrieved or its investors would be aggrieved so if they are aggrieved because of this delisting then they can go and file an appeal to the sat okay they can go and file an appeal to the sat within a period of 15 days from the rsc's order okay within 15 days of rsc's order it can go and file an appeal to the sat within a period of 15 days and if and if say for example if we require any condonation if we require any condonation then in that case this delay may be condoned this delay may be condoned beyond a period of this delay may be condoned beyond a period of 15 days for a period of maximum 1 month means we get an extension of 1 month in case of any sufficient reasons okay in case of sufficient reasons we get an ex we get an extension of 1 month right and now the matter will be decided by whom now the matter will be decided by the sat so 15 days plus 1 month is the time within which we can go and file an appeal before the sat okay now ma'am on which grounds on which grounds can the securities be delisted suppose if if you have uh, if you have been incurring continuous losses for the last 3 years and which has resulted into a negative net worth then in that case your securities can be delisted if the trading in your securities has been suspended for more than 6, 6 months for more than 6 months if your securities have been infrequently traded infrequently traded in the last 3 years then your securities can be delisted if if say for example the company its promoters its directors etc if they have been if they have been uh, what you say convicted convicted of any particular offense under the secra sebi depositories act or any other act and if they have been granted a particular punishment say for example uh, your penalty of at least rupees 1 crore or imprisonment of at least 3 years then in that case the shares of that particular company can be delisted if we have provided false addresses of our company of our uh, directors etc or their address is totally unknown or if we have changed the address by contravening the provisions of the law then in that case our securities can be delisted or if say for example the share holding of the company has fallen be below a particular level ma'am which level the level which we had committed in the listing agreement if the level has fallen before below that below that and we have not increased it then in that case our securities can be delisted these are some pointers these are some pointers which can lead to delisting and after giving a reasonable opportunity of being heard to the company after that if the uh, rsc still does not get a proper you know reply from the company after that its securities can get delisted then after that now we just spoke about delisting going back going back to the basics where we applied where we applied for listing of securities but they said no okay they refused they refused for listing of the securities then in that case first of all if they are refusing us uh, if they are refusing us then they have to first provide us the reasons okay they have to give us the reasons that why are they not allowing us to list our securities and once we get the reasons okay suppose if we get the reasons suppose if we get the reasons then within 15 days then within 15 days we can go and file if we are still not satisfied with those reasons then within 15 days from the receipt of the reasons the day when we receive the reasons from that day within a period of 15 days we can go and file an appeal to the sat okay if no reasons are received by us or if the rsc does not respond to our listing application etc then whatever is the deadline okay whatever is the deadline for the rsc from that deadline from that deadline within a period of 15 days within a period of 15 days we can go and file a file an appeal before the sat and if suppose the second case that is where we did not get the reasons for refusal in that case we can get a condonation also we can get a condonation also of a period of one month okay suppose if we have got the reasons then there is no condonation then that's 15 days in the other case it was 15 days plus one month right 
we can go and file an appeal before the sat sat has to try to dispose of sat has to try to dispose of this appeal within a period of 6 months it has to try to dispose it of as soon as possible and that is to try within a period of 6 months sat can sat can do what sat can pass which kind of orders sat can confirm modify set aside it can grant us the permission for listing it can refuse the permission for listing etc okay we had made this um, i have made this uh, chart here for refusal for listing okay then then next one next one is very very simple now the miscellaneous provisions are going to start from your the miscellaneous provisions are going to start from your section number 22b is same as what we have been doing in the past chapters that is the sat has got all the powers of civil court okay it is not bound by it because it has its extra powers also it can make its own procedures also it is not bound by it but at least uh, the minimum thing that it has got is the civil court powers civil court powers the same thing that we have been studying in pmla chapter i am not going to repeat it here and here the sat is going to be bounded sat will be bounded by the principles of natural justice that is whenever it takes any particular decision it has to make sure it has to make sure that it gives a reasonable opportunity of being heard to the parties then right to the legal representation means whenever we go and represent any particular case before the sat whenever we go and represent any case before the sat if i don't know how to represent i can appoint a representative i can send send anyone from my office i can appoint a ca cs a legal practitioner cost accountant etc to represent the case before the sat then wherever wherever there is no time limits given okay wherever there is no time limits given then the time limits from the limitation act shall apply and civil court not to have jurisdiction again a common provision that is whenever we are aggrieved like this appeal etc we have to go to the sat only or we have to go to the prescribed authority whose name is given in this particular chapter that is we cannot go to the civil court voluntarily we cannot go to the civil court plus the civil court cannot also interfere in this particular matter okay that's what they are trying to tell us here that is civil court not to have any jurisdiction next one was appeal to the supreme court suppose if in any case okay wherever the case is pending before the sat if we are not happy with the decision any person any person who is not happy with the decision of the sat that particular person can go and file an appeal before the supreme court on any question of law on any question of law that person can go and file an appeal before the sat within a period within a period of 60 days 60 days and the 60 days period can be further condoned this can be further condoned by another 60 days if there is any sufficient cause okay in uh, pmla chapter it was to the high court and that was on the question of law or question of fact but here it is to the supreme court only on question of law again 60 plus 60 days is common and we cannot tell the supreme court to dispose of the case as soon as possible okay we are no one to tell the supreme court that another thing another thing which is coming up here is the penalties okay another thing which is coming up here is the penalties and i had told you here it is actually not the penalties but it is the cognizable offenses right it is a cognizable offenses cognizable term you understand that is where arrest can happen without an arrest warrant and the offenses here it is the offenses means these will be applicable or the punishment will be applicable only after conviction by the court means after the court has convicted you only after that only after that this fine or the imprisonment will be applicable on you so here they have listed a few sections as you can see here uh, i have written also section 6 4 section 13 16 17 17 18 a 19 18 a etc then below we have section number 15 so and so sections you don't have to by heart it these are some sections which have been listed here and they are telling that if if say for example there is any violation of these sections if there is any violation of this section then that will lead then that will lead to an offense the matter goes to the court the matter goes to the court because it is an offense and then the matter will be decided up there right apart from this offense apart from this offense penalty can also be applicable monetary penalty by the adjudicating officer or monetary penalty by the secra can also be applicable okay so it can be treated as an offense also and it can be treated as a normal violation also now coming on to the penalties here coming on to the penalties here these are the penalties which are not imposed by the court but which are imposed by the adjudicating authority only or the adjudicating officer only means it is imposed by the law means it is imposed by the securities law itself for this we do not go to the court okay these are the penalties for the previous one for section number 23 you can call them as offenses okay but 23a to 23h talks about the penalties only i am just going to take up a few important ones here section 23a is specifically important 23a both part a and part b both are specifically important where any first of all first of all the first point is about 
furnishing, furnishing of any wrong information to the RAC or the SEBI or furnishing any incorrect information, furnishing any incomplete information or non-furnishing of any information, books, returns, reports, etc. to the RAC or SEBI, then this is the penalty which is applicable there. And the B point, B point is about maintaining, okay, it is about maintaining the books of accounts, maintaining the records as per the agreement. So one is about non-furnishing and the other one is about non-maintaining it properly. The penalty amount remains the same. It's minimum 1 lakh rupees and maximum it can go up to 1 lakh per day which can go up to maximum rupees 1 crore for each default. Right? That was the penalty. This is, this is such a penalty which is to be remembered. 23 capital A is that penalty which is to be remembered mandatorily. Then after that going on to the next important one. Going on to the next important one. Uh, one thing that you can recollect, uh, re remember here is section 23G. 23G is where we do not furnish, where the REC does not furnish the periodical returns, uh, which we had studied in section number 6. If it does not furnish the periodical return or if it submits incomplete or if it submits incorrect etc. Then this is the penalty which is applicable that that is ranging between 5 lakh rupees to 25 crore rupees. And there are some more penalties which are given up here. There are some more penalties. But if anything which is not given from section 23A to section number 23GA. Okay, till here. If nothing is given in 23A to 23GA, then 23H. This is a residual penalty which is applicable. 23H will become applicable there. Okay, then that is ranging between rupees 1 lakh to 1 crore. So at least these three sections, 23A, 23G and 23H. These are the minimum three sections which you have to compulsorily remember okay these are the three penalties which you have to compulsorily remember that just just try to identify the difference 23 okay 23 was talking about the offenses mainly and 23a to 23h talks about the penalties okay P offenses are levied by the court okay your conviction happens by the court and this penalty this penalty is by the authorities themselves by the adjudicating officer themselves and it happens under the sekra law itself then now, just like I told you from section 23A to 23H, whatever are the penalties that we studied, these, these will be adjudicated. These will be adjudicated by the adjudicating officer. Okay, he is such a person who is appointed. Everyone here, okay, I am just taking the conclusion that we are doing a revision. These will be adjudicated by the adjudicating officer and this adjudicating officer is a person who is appointed by the SEBI. So, SEBI appoints an officer who is going to do the adjudication of all these penalties. For doing this adjudication, AO will give us a reasonable opportunity of being heard. It can conduct some inquiries before it imposes the penalty on us. Right? It can call for some uh, information. It can call for some books of accounts before it imposes the penalty on us. Also, also SEBI can monitor this process. Also, SEBI can monitor this process. SEBI can also call for the information. If it thinks that AO is not working properly, then SEBI can also interfere in between. Then, if SEBI thinks that AO has imposed lesser penalty, it has imposed erroneous penalty, it has imposed lesser penalty, then SEBI can enhance it within a particular specified time limit. It can enhance it. Okay, But if more penalty is levied by the AO, then that cannot be reduced by the SEBI. If less has been imposed, then SEBI can enhance it, but SEBI does not have the power here to reduce it. Okay, now while determining how much penalty should be levied, that is, should it be levied on the lower side, should it be levied on the higher side, what should be done? For that, for that, adjudicating officer will take into account some important factors. Okay, it will consider some important factors before it imposes the penalty on us. It will check how much wrong profit or loss. Uh, how much wrong profit we have done or how much uh, loss we have tried to avert there. Then we will check how much loss has been caused to the public interest. What is the repetitive nature of default? Means uh, is it the first time or it has been done tenth time etc. That thing we will check and after that we are going to decide. After that we are going to decide uh, how much penalty should be levied there. Okay, How much penalty should be levied there. Then. Now there will be two terms coming up here. One is about settlement, settlement of penalties and the other one will be compounding of offenses. Okay, settlement of penalties means I am talking from section 23A to 23H. Okay, 23A to 23H I am talking about that. Those penalties can be settled. Settled means the existing penalty will be cancelled and a new lesser figure will be given to you. Okay, that can be done. For that we will have to make an application. Okay, we will have to make a return application to the SEBI and if SEBI thinks fit then it can do the settlement no problem in that and against the settlement we cannot go and file an appeal okay it has already reduced for us then we cannot go and file an appeal for that
so one was is about the settle uh, settlement and once the settlement is done okay whatever amount the sebi takes from us okay say for example the original penalty was of 2 lakh rupees now it has settled at 1 lakh rupee so 1 lakh rupee will be credited to the consolidated fund of india it will be credited to an account called as consolidated fund of india again here itself i can take one more point that is talking about the compounding of offences okay which talks about compounding of offences compounding of offences means it was such a case it was such a case of section number 23 okay it was such a case of section number 23 that uh, whenever whenever uh, there is any particular offence which is a compoundable offence that is where imprisonment is not mandatory those offences can be compounded by the sat those offences can be compounded by the sat or those can be compounded by the court okay it can be done so moto also but uh, we have to we have to make sure that we at least go and make an application uh, to the authority for doing the compounding of those offences okay just remember where imprisonment is mandatory their compounding cannot happen just remember that particular point okay then next one next one is your recovery of the amounts whatever is the amount of penalty that has been levied on us we have to pay it okay we have to pay it suppose if we do not pay it voluntarily then then a person called as then a person called as recovery officer then a person called as recovery officer is appointed who shall issue who shall issue a recovery certificate okay who shall issue a recovery certificate uh, and in that it will be written how much amount how much amount has to be recovered how much amount has to be recovered and that can be recovered by that can be recovered by some ways that is by selling the movable property immovable property attaching the bank account arresting that particular person uh, and keeping him in the prison or uh, by appointing a receiver appointing a receiver to manage the properties right by any of these ways the money can be recovered the penalty amount can be recovered for this for this we can even take for this we can even take the help of the local district administration as we had studied it before also cmm or dm chief metropolitan magistrate or district magistrate we can take their help also right now suppose if any particular person if any particular person on whom all these uh, penalties etc or any proceeding was going on if that person has passed away and if penalty was already imposed if the penalty was already imposed when he was alive then the legal hire legal hire or the legal representative will be responsible to pay that amount of penalty that person will be liable to pay that amount of penalty but only to the extent of the estate which has been taken from the deceased person okay all the other penalties also okay all the other penalties also all the other penalties will also get credited to the consolidated fund of india one more thing that we had seen just now was even the settled amount okay even the settled amount even the settled amount will go to the consolidated fund of india and even the other penalties will go to consolidated fund of india don't forget that next section section number 23 l section number 23 l is specifically important section 23 l talks about other appeals okay before this we before this we have spoken about the delisting appeal before this we have spoken about not allowing us to list the securities that appeal we have seen if we are aggrieved by any other order okay if you are aggrieved by any other order of rsc if the rsc is aggrieved by any other order of sebi if we are aggrieved by the penalty order passed by the adjudicating officer uh, which he had just adjudicated then in that case also we can go and file an appeal we can go and file an appeal to the sat within a period of 45 days within a period of 45 days we can go and file an appeal before the sat this 45 days period can be condoned if there is any sufficient cause condonation period is not given not specified there okay and when the matter goes to the sat when the matter goes to the sat sat has to make sure that it disposes of the it has to try it has to try to dispose of the matter within a period of 6 months first of all it has to try to dispose it of as soon as possible it has to try to dispose it of as soon as possible if not then it uh, and uh, they have just given a recommendatory period there that it has to try within a period of 6 months okay and now we have the residual offense also coming up here just like for residual penalty we had section number 23h for residual offense we have section number 23 m here if there is any offense which is not specified in that section then in that case that can be covered in section number 23 m here okay then after that after that we uh, we can just discuss about the immunity here we spoke about settlement we spoke about compounding okay we spoke about settlement we spoke about compounding the third thing which is applicable here is the immunity that if if central first of all central government has the power to grant the immunity okay central government has the power to grant the immunity but for that we'll have to go and make an application to the sebi <clears throat> 
for that we'll have to go and make an application to the sebi that sir we have i am ready to disclose all my facts etc i am ready to disclose everything please provide me some immunity please provide me some immunity please waive off my monetary penalties etc please reduce my imprisonment etc if sebi is satisfied if sebi is satisfied then it can make a further recommendation to the central government and then central government will can pass an order it can pass an order for granting you the immunity but if later on if you violate any conditions if later on it comes to know that you know we did not disclose any true facts etc then in that case then in that case your immunity will be again reversed back okay your immunity will be again reversed back next section next section is your section number 24 which talks about contravention by the companies we are not going to do contravention by companies here because we have already done this in the pmla chapter if the company is liable then what will be the repercussion the implication there would be the person in charge of the company would be liable but he won't be liable if he says that this offense was done without his knowledge or he had exercised due diligence to prevent such kind of offenses okay we have still revised it then the next one is all the offenses okay all the offenses which were given in section number 23 all those offenses will be cognizable that i had told you there itself that is arrest can be done without an arrest warrant and cognizance has to be given okay cognizance has to be given cognizance of offense has to be given to the court then only the court will start the proceedings in our case the cognizance can be given by any person under this particular authority or in this particular hierarchy it can be by the rsc it can be by the sebi it can be by the central government it can be by the state government or it can be by any other authorized person if that person goes to the court and gives the note of the offense then the court will proceed and take up our case okay now in case of offenses the matter goes to the special court now we have certain pointers we have certain pointers relating to special courts only again repetition of again repetition of pmla okay session courts session courts are designated as special courts central government appoints a single judge after consulting the chief justice of the high court then the case goes the case goes to the jurisdictional the case goes to the jurisdictional special court but if in a particular jurisdiction if we have more than one special court if you have more than one special court then the case goes to that particular court which the high court says okay the case goes to that particular court which the high court says then after that after that just like just like high court just like high court used to regulate the session court similarly high court is now going to regulate the special courts because special courts uh, session courts session courts have been designated as the special courts right now the person who conducts the prosecution the person who conducts the prosecution before the special court that person will be deemed to be the public prosecutor public prosecutor is nothing but a practicing advocate having a knowledge or experience of at least 7 years and till the time till the time any special courts are designated till that time the case will go to the session courts these were the pointers same to same pointers we have studied in pmla also same pointers are coming up here also then going on to the next section that is section number 27 which is a very very important section which talks about the title of dividend which talks about the title of dividend which says that which says that whenever there is any transfer of securities whenever there is any transfer of securities and in between the process the dividend is declared by the company then who will be eligible who will be eligible for those dividend okay so they say that if the transferee if the transferee lodges the transfer deed with the company within a period of 15 days from the date when the dividend becomes due then the dividend can go then the dividend can go to the transferee also there is no problem in that uh, this 15 days okay uh, the transfer deed has to be lodged within a period of 15 days from the date when the dividend becomes due this 15 days can be extended we can get a condonation in these 15 days in three cases first one first one if there is a death of the transferee itself then if there was a loss of the transfer deed the transfer deed has been lost due to some reasons which is beyond our control or the transfer deed um, there, uh, there was a delay in uh, transfer deed reaching that particular company maybe because of the postal issues etc then in such cases we can be granted a reasonable extension of time okay otherwise otherwise it has to reach the company the transfer deed has to reach the company within a period of 15 days and if it has reached the company within a 50 within a period of 15 days and the transaction was done for a good consideration then in that case the dividend can be paid to the transferee there is no problem in that but say for example if later on the transfer deed is treated as invalid or it is the transfer is rejected etc then the entire transaction becomes reverse and the transaction becomes null and void and say for example if the transferer has given the shares to the transferee it will come back it will come back to the transferer and whatever consideration was received by the transferer that also has to be paid back to the 
transferee any dividend which was paid to the transferee even that will come back to the transfer okay so basically the entire transaction the entire transaction gets reversed this we had studied in case of shares okay this we had studied in case of a company which issues shares on which it pays a dividend same is applicable in case of collective investment scheme and same is applicable same is applicable in case of mutual fund also same is applicable in case of mutual fund also now the last part a few miscellaneous provisions coming up here protection of action taken in good faith okay mistake done in good faith uh say for example if any authority if any authority says that some mistake has happened from its end okay if we identify that they have done some mistake then maximum monetary penalty can be applicable on them maximum monetary penalty can be applicable but we cannot proceed against them in any legal suit we cannot file any legal case against them if they prove that if they prove that that this particular mistake was done in good faith okay then similarly the entire law over the entire law over the entire law the powers is with the central government okay so central government has the powers with itself the central government has the powers with itself it can delegate it can delegate the powers it can delegate the powers to any other person in the law that is it can delegate it to the sebi or it can delegate it to the rbi also they have just mentioned an authority to whom the powers can be delegated okay cg can delegate the powers to them except one power except one power that is to make the rules making the rules this power is there only with the central government because if it has to make the rules it has to get the approval from both the houses of parliament and then it will be published in the uh, uh, in the official gazette by way of a notification so making the rules that power is there only with the central government then once coming uh, next coming on to the regulations okay regulations sebi has the power sebi has the power to make the regulations but it should not override it should not override the ones which are made by the central government or it should not override the uh, what the provisions of the act it should not override the provisions of the rules where which was made by the central government so regulations can be made by the sebi also but again the same process has to be followed approval from both the houses of parliament should be taken and then it will be published in the official gazette by way of a notification then a specific point was there there applicable specific point was made applicable there that is about the commodity derivatives if there is any such delivery contract if there is any such delivery contract which is a non transferable non transferable delivery contract non transferable delivery contract means the documents of title we had taken the example of railway receipt or the lorry receipt if it gets if it is not transferable to any third person then in that case they say that this is a pure sale transaction this is a pure sale transaction so in that case secra provisions of secra is not applicable because we have other sufficient laws to cover up this type of transaction so non uh, uh, non transferable specific delivery contracts are such contracts to whom secra is not at all applicable right so this acha now the section number 4a and 4b this is applicable only for the old codes you guys can just read it once the important point here was corporatization and demutualization is mandatory which is to be done by the recognized stock, which is to be done by the stock exchanges that is they had to get themselves converted into companies and they had to segregate they had to segregate their ownership and management they had to segregate their ownership and management that was your demutualization and after doing this after doing this you had to make sure that in the recognized stock exchange maximum maximum 49% of the share holding should be held by the brokers and 51% of the share holding should be held by persons who are not having the trading rights that is the non brokers this was the important point which i had told you which you have to compulsorily remember that and with this with this we complete the revision of the entire secra as well as the scrr i hope you were able to recollect the provisions along with me let's start with the revision of the sebi act unit 1 sebi act revision first of all first of all uh what were the main objectives of the act the main objectives of the act the main objectives of the sebi act the main objectives of the sebi act were three three most important objectives 
that is to protect the interest of the investors to promote the development of the securities market and to regulate to regulate the securities market these were the most three important these were the most three important objects or objective of the sebi act and apart from this we have some more objects like to prohibit insider trading to promote good good and fair dealings in the securities market to monitor the activities of all the people connected with the securities market like the stock exchange mutual funds collective investment scheme merchant bankers etc right so the main three objectives of the act was to protect the interest of the investors to promote the development of the securities market and to regulate the securities market next thing next now we are going to study about the establishment and the incorporation of the sebi we are going to study about their structure about the members about their age about their removal about their resignation all these things that now we are going to study here in case of establishment and incorporation of sebi first of all sebi is established sebi is established as a everyone try to recollect along with me sebi is established as a body corporate and therefore it has a perpetual succession and a common seal it can own property it can hold property in its own name it can purchase sell the property in its own name it can sue any other person or it can be sued by any other person this is the main feature this is the main characteristic of your sebi now in case of sebi in the composition of the sebi in the top management of sebi we have four categories of persons the way in which we had remembered this was 1215 Right, one, two, one, five was the way in which we had remembered. First one stands for a chairperson who is going to be appointed by the central government. Two members, two members from the officials of the central government who will be nominated by the central government. Then one RBI official, one member from the RBI official who is nominated by the RBI. And then we are going to have five other members. We are going to have five other members out of whom, out of whom three of them should be full time members. Right, this was the composition. This was the most important composition of your. uh sebi board now in that in that the next thing that we have is the tenure okay the chairperson and the whole time members chairperson and the whatever number of whole time members we have there chairperson and the whole time members will be holding their office for a period of 5 years will hold the office for a term of 5 years but maximum up to 65 years of age and once their 5 year term get over after that they can be reappointed again there is no restricted there is no restriction in that similarly similarly for the same person similarly for the same person they should be such people they should be such people who do not have any interest who do not have any financial interest who do not have any other type of interest which can affect their independence right they should not have any such interest in the sebi then all the people who are sitting in the management all the people who are sitting in the management of the sebi they should be a person of ability integrity standing knowledge and having experience in the field of e lafa e lafa law accounts finance administration economics etc right these were the pointers that we had studied there then after that we studied two things one was about the resignation other thing was about the removal okay cg central government uh, had appointed all these people so now central government has the right central government has the right to terminate the services it has the right to terminate the services of the chairperson and those five members the last five members before expiry of the tenure means they can be removed either immediately by paying 3 month salary and allowances or they can be removed after a period of 3 months by giving the notice today itself this was talking about the removal okay and the other members any other person if they want they can resign they can relinquish their office by giving a notice to the central government of 3 months in right right now the reasons for removal what were the uh, most common four reasons for removal the central government can remove any particular person if that person is adjudged as an insolvent if that person is declared to be of unsound mind if that person has been convicted of any offence involving moral turpitude or if that particular person has make made wrong use of his position or we can say is abused his position uh, uh, which is causing in harm to the public interest as per the central government then in that case the people these, these people of the sebi can be removed but obviously only after giving a reasonable opportunity of being heard right the next thing next pointers next section was the one time read section meetings of the board that sebi whenever it wants to you know discuss anything with its members sebi whenever wants to conduct any particular meeting it can call for the meetings there is no problem but however we do not have those uh, provisions because uh, the meetings will be conducted as per those rules as per those regulations which is specified in the regulation separately but the important thing here was sebi can also call for a meeting right 
acha another thing after that after that if suppose there is any particular person okay if there is any particular person who is who is an interested director okay any person who is a member of a particular company and who is also going to attend the meeting of the sebi who is also going to attend the meeting of the sebi if that particular person has an interest in the matter which is going to be discussed in the meeting if he is interested in the matter which is going to be discussed in the meeting then he will have to disclose this particular fact and he shall not take part in that meeting right he shall not take part in that particular meeting for that matter in that particular matter he should not have any involvement otherwise again it is going to affect it is going to affect the decision which is taken in the sebi meeting then similarly similarly next section section number 8 which says that say for example if there is any defect if there is any vacancy if there is any defect in the members of the sebi if some person's place is vacant or if there if some person is not appointed properly or if some person is not having the requisite qualification then they say that no problem the rest of the decision the rest of the members the rest of the members can take the decision and that decision will be valid okay that decision will be valid it is not going to invalidate any proceeding it is not going to invalidate any decisions which have been taken by the board right now after that after that the next answer which is coming up here is section number 11 uh important answer section number 11 few points were important as there were, as there were some amendments here section number 11 talks about the powers and functions of the sebi in this totally totally we had five points totally we had five points first point was very very simple first point was talking about the duty of the board in which we had to write the three main objects of the act that is protecting the interest of the investors i'm just repeating so that it gets fit in your mind okay first one was to protect the interest of the investors then to promote the development of the securities market and then to regulate the securities market right this was the first point second point second point was some specific powers of the sebi like to regulate the business of the stock exchange to regulate the business of the other intermediaries like merchant bankers collective investment schemes etc to prohibit insider trading to protect uh, to prohibit the fraudulent and unfair trade practices which are happening to promote investors education to call for information from any particular person etc these were some specific powers these were some specific powers of the sebi third point was crucial third point was crucial which say, which said that sebi also has the power sebi also has the power to get the inspection done it can carry out the inspection of any books accounts documents papers etc but but it can do the inspection it can do the inspection in case of a listed company i know proposed to be listed company only in that case when it is of the opinion when it is of the opinion that the company is involved in insider trading or fraudulent and unfair trade practices right in case of all other companies it can do the in case of all the other entities it can do the inspection it can do the inspection of the rsc it can do the inspection of the merchant bankers of the brokers etc everything is allowed but in case of a listed company or proposed to be listed company it can be done only if it is a serious thing that is if the company is involved in insider trading or uh, fraudulent and unfair trade practices the fourth point fourth point is a repetitive point that sebi has all the powers sebi has all those powers which is vested in a civil code right sebi has all those powers which is vested in a civil code all those things which we have been studying right from our pmla all those things are there another thing next point next point was a important point because we had certain amendments here now here basically sebi sebi can exercise certain powers during investigation we are going to study investigation in section number 11c but during investigation if sebi thinks that something is not good something is not proper then it can take certain steps or even after the investigation is done after that also the sebi can take certain steps either it can suspend the trading in the recognized stock exchange it can uh, stop some people from accessing the securities market it can suspend any office bearers of the stock market it can discharge any uh, proceeds or the securities means it can seize anything it can attach it can attach the bank accounts it can attach the property which is involved which is involved with this particular violation which associates with the securities market the important point and the amended point here was this can be done for a maximum by default it can be done for a maximum period of 90 days but after attachment we have to go and intimate about this fact to the special court and if special court gives us a confirmation then the attachment can continue till the end of the proceeding still the proceedings yet completed till that time the attachment is going to continue and if later on if later on if we are finally held guilty then the recovery proceedings is going to start against us okay recovery provisions also we are going to study here means by 
selling of our movable property immovable property attaching the bank account detaining any person in prison and appointing any person as receiver to manage the properties okay this again we are going to study in a particular section and we can receive sebi sebi can basically give directions to for any person that you cannot sell off okay if there is any particular asset which is a part of investigation then in that case we uh, sebi can give a order that you cannot sell off you cannot sell off that particular asset till the investigation is complete right and whatever amount is discharged here okay whatever amount is uh, discharged discharged means whatever amount is seized whatever wrongful profits etc we had made if that is seized then that gets transferred that gets transferred where that gets transferred to the iepf this was the same thing that we had seen in secra right this was the same thing that we had seen in secra penalties go to the consolidated fund of india but the discharged discharged amount or the seized amount that goes to the iepf right okay chalo now so this was all about this was all about your powers and functions of the sebi i'm just quickly very quickly i'm revising again those five points first point was talking about the duty of the board duty of the board second point was talking about some specific powers of the sebi third point was talking about the inspection fourth point fourth point was talking about the civil court powers and the fifth point was talking about the actions which can be taken by the sebi either during investigation or after the investigation has got over okay i hope with this you will be very much uh, comfortable with summarizing the entire provision now going to the next section section number 11a section number 11a specifically talks about the prospector they say that whenever whenever any particular company comes up with an issue issuing the prospectus or issuing or coming up with the prospectus is mandatory because that is the offer document right that is the offer document that you give to the invest or to that you give to the public so now in that case for for uh because because you want because sebi wants because sebi wants that the prospectus must be crystal clear because the prospectus must have all the necessary information for the protection of the investors so it can it will specify the content okay it will specify the content what all things should come in the prospectus one first thing first thing is either it can specify by way of regulations okay it will write in the regulations what all things are to be mandatorily given in prospectus by each and every company each and every company has to give so x y z things in its prospectus mandatorily okay and now another thing is another thing is if sebi wants if sebi wants that a particular company or a particular class of companies should disclose some more information it should disclose some more information over and above the above one then in that case it can pass a general or a special order on that particular company and it can tell that particular company it can tell that particular company to disclose those extra things okay so by default the rule which is applicable for everyone which will 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 be given in the regulations and if there is anything which is applicable to a specific company that will be passed by way of general or a special order right then after that after that going to the next one next one is section number 11a which talks about your collective investment scheme collective investment scheme was such a thing where some investors come together some investors come together they pool the money they invest this money and then they share the returns right they share the returns now in this case in case of collective investment scheme if you want to call yourself as a collective investment scheme then either you have to fulfill all the conditions of subsection 2 or you have to fulfill the conditions of subsection 2a and you should not fall and you should not fall in the exceptions you should not fall in the exceptions which are given in subsection 3 okay if you are not falling in 2 if you are not falling in 2a if you are not falling in 3 then in that case if you have a corpus if you have a corpus of more than or equal to 100 crore then you will be deemed then you will be deemed to be a collective investment scheme and you will be by default regulated by the sebi okay earlier some years back some years back collective investment scheme was not regulated by the sebi but now the collective investment scheme is regulated by the sebi okay now first of all if you want to call yourself as a collective investment scheme by default you have to fulfill the conditions given in subsection 2 Ma'am, which conditions are we supposed to fulfill as per subsection two? First of all, first of all, all of y'all will come together. All of us will come together, and we, we will contribute money. We will pool the money. Okay. Then second point is whatever money we have invested. Okay, whatever money we have invested from that, whatever returns we get, these returns will be shared by everyone. These returns, these income will be shared by everyone. Okay. Third point. Third point. Everything. The entire fund is going to be managed on behalf of the investors. for the benefit of investors it will be managed and the investors cannot interfere in the day to day working because the day to day activities will be managed by the management 
if all these conditions if all these four conditions are fulfilled then in that case we can call ourselves as a collective investment scheme and we will be regulated we will be regulated by the seb okay if those conditions are not fulfilled but if you fulfill the conditions which are given in the regulation see i have circled here if you have fulfilled all the i have marked they are not circled uh, if you have fulfilled all the conditions if you have fulfilled all the conditions as given in the regulations then also you will be treated as a collective investment scheme okay but now but now if there is a cooperative society which comes up with a scheme same scheme that you contribute the money and we will share the returns with you if there is a cooperative society if there is a mutual fund company if there is a chit fund company if there is a nidhi company if there is a deposit taking nbfc if there is an insurance company if there is a pension scheme if there is a provident fund scheme if there is a public deposit scheme offered by the companies act in all these cases even though the concept remains the same even though the concept remains the same that is they pool the money and share the returns with them then too they will not be treated as a collective investment scheme because they are being regulated by their different different law right so this was this was all about your collective this was all about your collective investment scheme you can just read it once that would be sufficient okay coming to the next one everyone coming to the next one power of sebi to issue direction same answer as we had done in sekra sebi has got the powers to issue direction to all the persons to all the persons who are there under section 12 of the sebi act under section 12 of the sebi act means all those who had obtained the registration from the sebi it can give directions to the listed company or propose to the listed company it can give directions to the rsc brokers etc in which three cases can it issue directions in which three cases can it issue directions first one is if it is in the interest of the investors if it is to prevent the detrimental affairs which is carried on by any of these people or to secure proper management okay i'm repeating this answer was there in your sekra also this is there in sebi also to protect the interest of the investors to secure proper management and to prevent any affairs which are been carried on in a detrimental manner If in any of these cases sebi has the power to issue directions okay sebi can issue directions and those directions will be obviously binding on those all particular persons and these powers okay just try to recollect the note which we had done these powers will also include one more power that is if we have contravened any law and if we have earned any wrongful profit or if we have averted any losses then even that can be ceased okay even that can be seized and after seizing where does it go after seizing it goes to the investor education and protection fund right next one next one next one next one is section number 11c as i had mentioned earlier 11c is talking about the investigation okay now suppose if sebi has the reasons to believe okay if sebi thinks that anything any activity is not being done in a is not being done in a proper manner that is it is being done in a detrimental manner or if we have contravened any provisions of the law then sebi can order investigation in our regards okay it can do investigation of any particular person who is related to the securities market it can be the company it can be the brokers it can be the stock exchange merchant any any particular person who is related to the stock broker sebi can order for investigation okay for this purpose for this purpose sebi is going to appoint sebi is going to appoint a person called as investigating authority who is going to come and who is going to do the investigation and now when they come for investigation what is our responsibility our responsibility is to cooperate with them our responsibility is to cooperate with them and to provide them with the necessary information right whatever they are asking we have to provide them whatever they are uh, you know demanding from us we have to give them whatever uh, uh, things they have uh, you know asked or uh, to produce that we have to produce etc we have to cooperate with them and we have to provide them with the necessary information they can even take our books of accounts they can even take our books of accounts for the purpose for the purpose of investigation and they can keep it with them for a period of maximum 6 months okay then the investigation uh, investigating authority can also examine us on oath right it can tell us to swear and then it can even examine us on oath if we do not cooperate with them if we do not provide them the necessary information if they had told us to sign anything we did not do it then in all those cases in all those cases a penalty a punishment will be applicable on us not to be by hearted just to be remembered that if we do not comply with them then in that case the punishment will be applicable on them then whenever they do any kind of examination okay whenever they do any kind of investigation in our company then 
वॉट एवर क्वेश्चनिंग दे हैव डन ऑल दो थिंग्स विल बी रिटर्न इन अ पर्टिक्युलर पेपर ऑल दो थिंग्स विल बी नोटेड डाउन वी हैव टू साइन इट ओके द पर्सन हु वॉज क्वेश्चन वी हैव टू साइन इट आफ्टर साइनिंग इट the investigating authority will read out to us we that person is going to read out to us and then this can be used as an evidence right this can be used as an evidence anywhere anywhere later on in the court of law or later on in any particular proceedings it can be used right another thing another thing is suppose suppose during the time of investigation if the investigating authority this was a separate point okay during the time of investigation if the investigating authority is of the opinion is of the opinion that we might alter the books of accounts we may falsify the books of accounts we may tamper the books of accounts we may destroy the books of accounts then in that case so as to prevent it from this you know uh, what you say manipulation etc they can they can seize our books of accounts they can seize our books of accounts but first they'll have to make an application first the investigating authority can, will have to make an application to the court or to the judge that is to the magistrate or the judge of the designated court they will have to go and make an application and if the judge is satisfied if the court is satisfied then it will allow us it will allow the investigating authority to do this seizure and in that case in that case if it is seized if it is seized then it can be kept with the investigating authority till the end of the conclusion of the investigation proceedings means till the investigation proceedings get over till that time it can be kept with the investigating authority and for doing the seizure okay for doing the seizure we can take the help of that local police or local district administration we can take help of them right another thing is one important thing is the seizure of books of accounts of listed company and proposed to be listed company is not allowed investigation a uh, seizure of books of accounts investigation is allowed but seizure of books of accounts of listed company and proposed to be listed company is not allowed until unless you are of the belief that that company is involved in insider trading or market manipulation or that uh, fraudulent or unfair trade practice another thing coming up here is very very simple that is seize and desist order okay seize and desist order means uh, sebi can pass a seize or desist order on any particular person who comes under the purview of sebi seize means please stop doing the violation that you are doing now and this is this desist means not to do that particular mistake again right sebi can pass this order on any particular person but when sebi passes an order on listed company or proposed to be listed company it can be passed only if it is of the opinion only if it is of the opinion that that particular company is involved in uh insider trading or market manipulation or we can say insider trading or fraudulent and unfair trade practice another thing coming up here is section number 12 which is very very simple section number 12 says section number 12 says that they have listed a few persons they have listed a few persons and they have told that if these people want to do the dealing in securities if these people want to do the trading in securities then in that case it can be done it can be done only only if they have obtained a registration certificate from the sebi okay the list is really very very long it can be the stock brokers it can be the stock exchange it can be the merchant bankers it can be the collective investment scheme it can be the mutual fund it can be the venture capital fund it can be the credit rating agencies it can be the portfolio managers it can be the investment advisors it can be the underwriters it can be the uh, trust deed trustee of the trust deed that is the debenture trustees etc it can be the depositories it can be the foreign institutional investors it can be the clearing house there are so many people we have listed around 14 of them okay these are all these people are related to whom all these people are related to the securities market and if they want to do the trading if they want to do the trading in the securities market then in that case then in that case they have to make sure that they have obtained a registration certificate from the sebi right another section section number 12a not very important not very important but we can just take out a conclusion out of that section number 12a says that they have listed a few things and they have told that these things whatever they have listed here all these things are prohibited all these things are prohibited example example if you are acquiring the control in any particular company uh, in a contravening manner if you are indulged in insider trading that is not allowed if you are indulged in that hacking etc that is not allowed if you are trying to defraud any particular person that is not allowed if you are making any non public information as public that is not allowed if you are forcing any any other person to you know trade in the shares of a particular company that is not allowed so all the wrong things basically all the wrong things all the wrong things are totally not allowed that is totally prohibited as per section number 12a that was the only thing that we had studied then 
going to the next one going to the next one uh, finance accounts and audit it is very very simple it is very very simple what are they trying to tell us here is sebi sebi has a fund okay now see i'm just summarizing all these provisions sebi has a fund called as sebi general fund okay sebi has a fund called as sebi general fund which is established by the cg which is established by the cg the money comes from where the money comes from the central government in form of grants the money can come in form of fees charges etc which is levied by the cg okay i did not mention penalties penalties go to the consolidated fund of india so we are talking about the fees charges etc which is levied by the sebi so from these sources we get the inflow from these sources we get the inflow and then and then uh, these money can be used for what these money can be used for meeting any admin expenses this can be used for you know meeting any investigation expenses inspection expenses this can be used for meeting any uh, capital expenditure also as per the capital expenditure plan this can be used for meeting the objectives of the act so for all these purpose the money will be used from the sebi general fund only okay then then they say that after meeting all these expenses whatever is the surplus left okay whatever is the surplus left that surplus into 25% that that surplus into 25% should be transferred to a separate fund should be transferred to a separate fund called as reserve fund okay that uh, money should be 25% should be transferred to a separate fund called as reserve fund however however the amount in the reserve fund the amount in the reserve fund should should not exceed the total expenditure of the last two years means the maximum amount to be maintained in the reserve fund is the amount of the uh, amount of expenditure of the last two years okay if you have if you already have that much amount in your reserve fund then no need to transfer anything from the sebi general fund in the current year then whatever is the surplus left whatever is the surplus left in the sebi general fund whatever is the surplus left in the sebi general fund that will be directly transferred to the consolidated fund of india and the balance of the sebi general fund at the end would be zero right now the uh, sebi sebi has to also maintain its accounts sebi has to prepare its accounts as per the format as prescribed by the central government after consulting the cag right the, it will be prescribed in what format are we supposed to maintain it that will be prescribed by the central government its audit its audit will be done by the cag and the cag is going to have the same powers functions privileges etc which it had while doing the audit of the government companies right then the cag will prepare the cag will prepare the audit report it will submit this particular audit report to the uh, your um, cag will prepare cag will prepare it will do the audit it will prepare the uh, annual report uh, the audit report it will go to the sebi sebi is going to furnish it to the cg cg is going to lay it down cg is going to lay it down before both the houses of parliament just like it happens in case of your government company right after that after that we have certain penalties coming up we are going to revise the important penalties we are going to revise all the important penalties okay first of all section number 15 a section number 15 a was a similar section which we had studied in secra that if we fail to furnish any information returns documents books papers etc to the sebi if sebi had called and we have failed to submit it then in that case penalty will be applicable minimum rupees 1 lakh maximum it can go up to 1 lakh per day but not exceeding rupees 1 crore okay this was one of the important penalty that we had studied there another important very very important penalty here was section number 15f 15f was talking about penalty in case of stock brokers penalty in case of stock brokers three penalties only to be written first one if the stock broker if the stock broker has failed to issue the contract note in the specified form then 1 lakh to 1 crore 1 lakh to 1 crore is the penalty which will be applicable second one if the stock broker fails to deliver us the security or fails to pay us the money when it has sold our securities then the normal penalty would be applicable normal means the earlier one 1 lakh 1 lakh per day maximum up to rupees 1 crore and the last one if the stock broker has charged brokerage in excess in excess of the limits in excess of the specified brokerage then minimum rupees 1 lakh and it can go up to five times the excessive brokerage charge and out of these two out of these two we have to take whichever is higher okay on the section number 15f you can expect a direct question okay direct question state the penalties which will be applicable in case of a stock broker another thing another thing is the penalty in case of penalty for insider trading penalty for insider trading that is given in section number 15g if any particular person is involved in this insider trading if any particular person has any price sensitive information and if he deals on the basis of that price sensitive information if he communicates this information to someone else if he forces any other person to 
you know deal in this insider uh, uh, trade in the securities on the basis of this insider information then that particular person would be liable the minimum the penalty applicable there is minimum rupees 10 lakh minimum rupees 10 lakh which can go up to 25 crore rupees which can go up to 25 crore or three times the profit made out of this insider trading whichever is higher so minimum is 10 lakh that is different in maximum we have two figures 25 crore or three times the profit made out of these two will take whichever is high right so this was another important penalty 15 a we did 15 f we did 15 h or 15 g we did 15 a was non furnishing the information to the sebi 15 f was in case of stock brokers 15G, 15G is for the insider trading, right? And the next one, the next amended one, the next amended one here is 15HAA. 15HAA, 15HAA says that if, if any particular person is trying to gain wrongful access to the SEBI database, if it's, if it's trying to hack the SEBI's database, if it's trying to hack SEBI's website, if it is trying to send a computer virus, or initiate a computer virus etc where you are trying to you know destroy the SEBI's data alter SEBI's data get try to get wrongful access to SEBI's data then in that case 15 H AA is going to get applicable where the minimum penalty minimum penalty will be of rupees 1 lakh maximum it can go 10 lakhs or three times the profit made out of this whichever is higher right but anyway 15 H AA will be applicable only if it is notified by the ICAI right and then we have the residual penalty. We have the residual penalty if there is any such mistake done by us for which no separate penalty is provided, then the residual penalty will be ranging between rupees 1 lakh to rupees 1 crore. Right? So this was, see I have written here also the most important penalties 15A, 15F, 15G and 15HAA. HAA we have simply written because that was a new section which was inserted. Right. Now after that, after that going to the next provision, after that going to the next provision, the next provision talks about the power of adjudication. That is this particular penalty. This particular penalty will be determined by whom or this will be levied by whom. This will be levied, this will be adjudicated by the adjudicating officer who is appointed by the SEBI only. SEBI appoints a person called as adjudicating officer who is going to consider, who is going to do the inquiry, who is going to consider the facts, who is going to give the ROBS and after that, that particular person is going to adjudicate that how much penalty can be levied. Okay, if AO, if adjudicating officer levies a penalty which is less, which is less, then in that case, SEBI can increase that penalty. SEBI does not have the power to reduce the penalty, but SEBI can increase the penalty within a period of three months. Okay, then, then a few points which the AO will consider, a few points which the AO will consider at the time of levying the penalty. That is, whenever we have got a range, say for example, 1 lakh to 1 crore, then how much to be levied? That depends on certain factors. Okay, that depends on certain factors. Ma'am, which factors? It depends on the repetitive nature of default. It depends on how much loss has been caused to the investors and it depends on how much gain have we made by doing this wrongful thing. Okay, if we have gained very less and there is hardly any loss caused to the investors, then the AO can decide on a lesser penalty. Right, so three factors should be considered. First one, how much loss has been caused to the investors? Uh, what is the repetitive nature of default and how much unfair profits have we derived out of this particular contravention by consider by considering these factors by considering these factors we are going to determine how much penalty should be levied AO is going to determine how much penalty is going to be levied okay and whatever penalty is levied whatever penalty is levied all those penalties will be collected and that is credited to the consolidated fund of India that is credited to the consolidated fund of India and next thing that we have coming up here is a settlement in case of settlement, in case of settlement, we had studied same concept applicable as that of SECRA. In case of settlement, settlement of penalty. Settlement happens in case of penalties, that is the penalties can be reduced. In certain cases, the penalties can be reduced. Uh, we should not call it as exactly reducing it, but the original penalty is cancelled and a new lesser figure of penalty is imposed. Right, then next, then next, going on to the, moving on to the appeal provisions, moving on to the appeal provisions. For appeal, as we had seen in SECRA also, as we had seen in SECRA also, we have got SAT. We have got an authority called as SAT. SAT is established by whom? SAT is established by the central government. SAT consists of a presiding officer. We had studied this. SAT consists of a presiding officer. It has certain numbers of judicial members. It has certain number of technical members. SAT functions in form of benches, SAT functions in form of benches, that is in form of groups 
and that particular bench is going to have one judicial member and one technical member generally but in some cases we can have even more than this also now going on to their qualification presiding officer is such a person who should either be a judge of supreme court or who should be a chief justice of high court or who should be a judge of high court for a period of at least 7 years if any one of the qualification is fulfilled then that particular person will can be appointed as a presiding officer then going on to the judicial member going on to the judicial member that person should be a judge of high court for a period of at least 5 years and that particular person is eligible to be appointed as a judicial member and for a technical member for a technical member that person should be a secretary or additional secretary to the government of india to the ministry of central government or holding a similar post in cg or the sg or that particular person should be a person of proven ability integrity knowledge standing and having experience in the fields of financial sector for at least a period of 15 years okay if any one of the two conditions are fulfilled then that particular person is eligible to be appointed as a technical member right now presiding officer presiding officer and judicial member presiding officer and judicial member are the members who are appointed by the central government after consultation with the chief justice of india after consulting the chief justice of india and the technical member technical member is also appointed by the central government after taking the recommendation from the search come selection committee okay the composition of search come selection committee is not that important you can simply ignore that but main thing that you have to remember there is the technical member is appointed by the central government after consulting the or after taking the recommendation from the search come selection committee okay if there is any problem if there is any internal problem in the search come selection committee then they say that no problem the central government wholly and solely has the power to appoint the presiding officer the judicial member and the technical member we are not concerned by the internal problems associated in the selection committee and any particular person who was already a member in sebi okay if there is any particular person who was already a member in the sebi cannot become a part of sat okay because otherwise the decisions will be affected totally it will it will be prejudicial so in that case suppose if you are a member of sebi and now you have left your office in sebi after that also you have to wait for a period of 2 years then only you can come and sit in the sat now okay so basically there is a cooling period of 2 years then any particular person any particular person who is there in the sat any particular person who is there in the sat who is appointed in the sat he is going to have a tenure he is going to have a tenure of 5 years and he can uh, he can be reappointed for one more term of 5 years but maximum up to 70 years of age they will be eligible for obviously they will be eligible for salary allowances benefits etc so that they have not specifically given here but they are telling that their salary allowances etc will be as may be prescribed it will be as may be prescribed but it should not be varied to their disadvantage it should not be reduced unnecessarily right now suppose if there is any particular permanent absence if there is any particular permanent absence in the place of in the place of presiding officer judicial member technical member then then in that case that vacancy will be filled that vacancy will be filled by the central government there is no problem in that but if there is you know if there is any gap in filling that particular vacancy in the place of presiding officer in the place of presiding officer then in for the meanwhile for the meanwhile till the new person comes in the office then in that case the senior most judicial member is going to act as the presiding officer of the sat okay senior most judicial member is going to act in the office of the presiding officer now coming on to the two points coming on to the two points which talks about your resignation and removal these people these people presiding officer or judicial technical member even they can resign their office and whenever they resign they have to hold their office till a particular period okay they have to still hold their office till a particular period three periods whichever is earlier okay three months notice has to be given three months notice has to be given by them then till their successor enters upon their office or till their term gets over out of these three dates whichever is earlier till this particular date they have to hold they have to uh, still be there in their office before this they cannot vacate their office and then in case of removal then in case of removal these people can also be removed by the central government but only after an inquiry has been conducted by the supreme court and the reasons for removal remain the same adjourned as an insolvent unsound mind financially interested convicted of any offense involving moral turpitude abused his position which is not good for the public etc so in these cases the removal can happen only after giving a reasonable opportunity of being heard 
okay if there are any more changes to be done in this removal resignation qualification etc then those pointers those pointers will be as specified those pointers will be specified in the budget that comes in the budget those amendments can come by way of budget okay now there is if there is any internal problem if there is any particular internal problem if there is any vacancy in the sat that is in the presiding officer judicial member if there is any defect in appointment in the members of the sat then no problem the decision can be taken by rest of them there is no issues in that just like we had studied for sebi same is applicable for sat also in sebi also if any particular person's appointment is not proper etc then in that case then in that case the other other people can take the decision similarly in case of sat also if any particular judicial any particular technical member any particular presiding officer is not appointed properly then in that case the decision can be taken by rest of them okay apart from apart from uh, the members apart from the presiding officers apart from the judicial members apart from the technical members we can also have some staff we can also have some employees we can also have some employees who will be uh, you know discharging the functions who will be discharging the functions so the central government central government can appoint those employees central government can appoint some officers who will discharge their functions and these people will come under the superintendence under the control of the presiding officer their salary and allowances will be as may be prescribed okay their salary and allowances will be as may be prescribed now coming to the main purpose of the sat coming to the main purpose of the sat if we are aggrieved by any order passed by sebi or if we are aggrieved by any order passed by the adjudicating authority in respects of penalty then in that case we can go and file an appeal before the sat within a period of 45 days from the date of order and this 45 days period can be condoned this uh, if there is any delay beyond 45 days then that can be condoned if there is any sufficient cause and sat will sat in that case it will take the decision it can either confirm modify or set aside its own order and sat has to try to dispose of this appeal as soon as possible as soon as possible within a period of 6 months and then once the decision of sat is final after that the uh, what do you say the order the copy of the order will be sent to each and every person right then sat has sat has all the power sat has all the powers as vested in a civil court it is regulated by its own procedure it can make its own rules it can make its own regulation it is not just bound by the civil court's power and whenever whenever say for example there is any dispute in the sat itself if the judicial member technical members if there is any dispute there itself then they will refer this matter to the presiding officer then the presiding officer himself will get involved or a new person will get new member will get involved and then we are going to take a revised majority right this is what we had studied in pmla also now suppose if we do not know how do we represent before the sat suppose if we do not know how do we represent before the sat either you can go if you knew and if you do not know then you can send your officers you can send ca you can appoint a ca cs cost accountant you can appoint a lawyer etc who can represent your case before the sat if there is any particular matter if there is any particular matter where there is no time limit given if there is any particular matter where there is no time limit given then in that case the time limit the uh, time limit given in the limitation act would apply okay all these people the presiding officers members of the sat etc all these are deemed as public servant all these are deemed as public servant as per the indian penal code right these all are deemed as a uh, public servant as per the indian penal code and whenever whenever sat passes any particular order and if it involves any question of law whenever sat passes any particular order and if it involves a question of law then we have to go and file an appeal to the supreme court say meaning that meaning that civil court cannot interfere in between we cannot go to the civil court also and the civil court cannot also interfere in between okay and if it involves a question of law then you can simply go and file an appeal before the supreme court within a period of 60 days within a period of 60 days this delay can be condoned by maximum another period of 60 days if there is any sufficient cause and we are no one we are no one to tell to the supreme court that sir please dispose of the matter within so and so time that is, there is no time limit specified for the uh, supreme court right now central government central government now again coming back to the cg and the sebi part central government has the power central government has the power to give directions to the sebi right it has a power just like sebi was giving directions to the rsc similarly cg has the power to give directions to the sebi and it will be binding on the sebi if sebi does not comply with those directions then sebi uh, invites legal uh, you know uh, what do you say Le legal uh, implications against itself uh, after giving a reason after getting a reasonable opportunity of 
being hurt. So basically, SEBI has to comply with SEBI has to comply with all the uh, directions which have been imposed by the central government. If not, if not, then the CG will totally supersede. CG will supersede. It will supersede the management of the SEBI. Means the existing management will have to vacate their offices. Existing people will leave the office. All the properties of the SEBI now comes to the central government. Central government will manage. Central government will manage the affairs of the SEBI for a maximum period. This superseding can be done for a maximum period of six months. And after a period of six months, the CG is going to uh, what do you say? Restore the management. It will appoint new people to manage this particular SEBI. Right? Then after that, after that, just like RSC, just like stock exchange used to submit periodical returns and annual reports to the SEBI, now SEBI will have to submit the periodical returns to the CG. Similarly, SEBI also has to furnish an annual report, annual report for the financial year. There it was the calendar year, here it is the financial year. Within 90 days from the year end, it has to submit to the central government uh, an annual report. And once it goes to the central government, central government will lay it where? Central government will lay it before both the houses of parliament. Right. Now, similarly, similarly, whenever, whenever, uh, in all these cases, whenever uh, any particular order is passed by the SEBI, generally, whenever any order was passed by the SEBI or by the AO, uh, if we were aggrieved, then we were going to the SAT. If we were aggrieved by the order of SEBI, we were going to the SAT. Can we go to the civil court? Answer is no, we cannot go to the civil court. Can civil court interfere in between? Answer is no, the civil court cannot also interfere in between. And even all the members of the SEBI, all the officers of the SEBI, all the employees of the SEBI, even they will be deemed to be the public servant as per, as per the Indian Penal Code. Okay, then protection of action taken in good faith was very, very simple. If there is any particular mistake, if there is any particular mistake which is done by the authorities and if they claim that this mistake was done in good faith, then uh, if they prove this, then in that case, no legal proceedings can be initiated against them right if there is any particular case next next point if there is any particular case where if there is any particular case where we have contravened the provisions of the act then in that case apart from the penalty even offenses can be uh, made applicable on us even punishments can be made applicable means the uh, the wrongful act that we have done that can be treated as an offense right that can be treated as an offense and the punishment can be levied the punishment can be levied by the Court, imprisonment or fine or both same figures as we had studied that in uh, there in Sekra. okay offense can be made applicable and that offense can even be compounded okay that offense can be even compounded just to recollect one more thing which offenses cannot be compounded the offenses the offenses which contains mandatory imprisonment the offenses which contain mandatory imprisonment those cannot be compounded then coming on to the next one that is immunity same thing that we had done in Sekra. immunity can be granted immunity ca can be granted by the central government on recommendation from the SEBI immunity can be granted from both it can be granted from the uh, penalties also it can be granted from the offenses also but whenever the matter goes to the court the court will take up our case only if someone has gone and submitted a complaint someone has gone and uh, you know given the note of that particular offense that someone can be central government, it can be state government, it can be the stock exchange, it can be any particular person associated with these particular authorities. They have to go and give the cognizance of the offense, then only the court will interfere, then, then only it will consider our offenses, right? Now here, now here, the court which is going to consider all these things is the special court. So just like we did in Sekara, just like we did in PMLA, Special court is nothing but the court of session, right? The session courts are designated as a special court. It can designate as many number of uh, special court as it wants for a particular area. If in a particular area we have more than one special court, then to which special court the case will go? That will be decided by the high court. Any proceeding which is going on before the special court that will be deemed to be a, a, a what do you say, judicial proceeding and the code of criminal procedure is going to apply to such proceedings right just like just like initially high court used to regulate the session court similarly high court is now going to regulate the special court also right and the any person any person who conducts any person who conducts the proceedings before the special court that person is treated as a public prosecutor that person is deemed to be a public prosecutor having how many years knowledge having seven years knowledge in the field of law until the time till the time the special courts Till the time the special courts are appointed, the case will be handled by the session court. And if there is no session court, then it will be handled by the magistrate. 
right next one next one if there is any offenses done by the company then the person in charge would be liable but uh, in two cases he won't be liable where he proves that this offense was done without his knowledge or he had exercised or he had expressed due diligence to prevent such kind of offense right next one next one is recovery of amount whenever any penalty etc is levied on us and if we are not paying it if we are not paying it on our own then in that case then in that case uh, there will be a person called as recovery officer who will be appointed who will recover the penalties from us from five, by five ways okay it can attach our bank accounts it can attach and sell off our movable property immovable property then after that uh, uh, it can uh, arrest us it can put us in the prison it can detain us and the last one last one is it can appoint any particular person as receiver to manage the properties these are the ways which we had studied in your uh, secra chapter also next one is the central government central government has the powers to make the rules as we have studied again i am repeating same thing the same thing that we had studied in secra your cg has the power to make the rules and once it makes the rules it has to make sure that it is uh, uh, what do you say laid down before both the houses of parliament for uh 30 days period right similarly power to make regulations sebi has got the power to make the regulations but it should not be against it should not be against the cg's order it should not be against the cg's order and later on even this will be laid before both the houses of parliament for a period of 30 days and along with sebi along with sebi along with sebi other laws other laws can also be clubbed there is no such restriction that along with sebi no other section no other law can be made applicable so sebi sebi can individually be also be applied and sebi can applied in conjunction with any other law also and section number 34 i had told you as of now this is not at all relevant because the time period has totally gone and these are the appeal time periods which we have already revised so this was this was all about this was all about our sebi act revision i hope you all have recollected the provisions you all are uh, you know comfortable with the revisions do let me know okay so let's start with the revision of the sebi lodr regulations 2015 as amended by the regulations amendment regulations 2018 let's start with them first of all the full form of lodr the full form of lodr is listing obligations and disclosure requirement listing obligations and disclosure requirement there were two main objectives there were two main objectives of the lodr there were two main objectives of the lodr regulations first one is to align first one is to align the clauses of listing agreement that is specifically clause number 49 of the listing agreement with the companies act that was the first objective right that was the first objective of the Uh, LODR regulations and the second one is uh, we had different different listing agreement conditions for different different securities we had different different conditions for different different types of securities so now we are going to consolidate all of them into a single uh, regulation that was another objective of your LODR LODR is applicable LODR is applicable to each and every listed entity it is applicable to each and every listed entity whenever they are issuing any such securities which are going to be listed on the recognized stock exchange right it is applicable to equity shares it is ap applicable to preference shares it is applicable to any other debt securities it is applicable to mutual funds any such securities which are going to be listed on the recognized stock exchange right now apart from that now going on to the main regulations first one is regulation number 6 regulation number 6 talks about the compliance officer regular regulation number 6 talks about the compliance officer and they say that every listed entity should have at least one compliance officer who should be a qualified cs who should be a qualified cs and he has four obligations he will be responsible for four things okay what are the four things for which he is responsible first of all he has to make sure that all the compliances have been followed that is regular compliance meeting all the regular compliance is the uh, what obligation of the compliance officer second one second one is coordination and reporting to the board coordination and reporting to the board third point third point ensure that correct procedures have been followed so that whatever information we are submitting the, to the authorities that information is correct and that is as per the regulations and the last one fourth point is to monitor the email address monitor the email address of the grievance redressal division right these were the four obligations these were the four obligations of the um, compliance officer 
Okay, after that we have regulation number 7. Regulation number 7 talks about, regulation number 7 talks about the share transfer agent. Every company should have a facility, every company should have a facility for share transfer, right? For doing the share transfer thing, it should have this facility. That can be either in-house or that can be outsourced to any other person. <clears throat> we had taken the, in regular lectures, we had taken the example of Carvey Computerized Services thing. Another one coming up here is regulation number 24. Regulation number 24 talks about the corporate governance in respect of unlisted material subsidiary. Right? It talks about the corporate governance in respect of unlisted material subsidiary. Why are we not talking about the listed ones? Because anyway to the listed subsidiary, to the listed holding company etc. The LODR would be applicable. So now here they are telling about three points. Okay, here they are telling about the three points. First one is any person who is an independent director, any person, okay, three points, everyone just try to recollect. The first point was any person who is an independent director on the board, independent director on the board of the main company, that is a listed holding company, should also be a director on the board. That one person, same common person, should also be a director on the board of this unlisted material subsidiary. Okay, and this unlisted material subsidiary can be a foreign company, it can be an Indian company and it is such a company which contributes 20 more than 20% of the uh, total income, consolidated income or 20% more than 20% of the net worth. Means it is having, it is having its income is more than 20% of the consolidated income of the entire group or its net worth is more than 20% of the consolidated net worth of the group. So first point was talking about having a common director. Second point which is coming up there is, second and third points were similar. Second point was, if a listed company wants to dispose of the shares in the unlisted material subsidiary and because of this disposal, the shareholding is going to fall below 50%, then they are telling that if you want to do this, you can do this only after passing a special resolution. Right? You have to pass a special resolution in the general meeting, then only you can dispose of the shares which can go below 50%. And uh, in other cases, suppose if you don't want to, uh, this, uh, there are two such cases where uh, SR, passing of SR is not mandatory. First one, first point was whenever we have received any particular order, whenever we have received any particular order from any court or tribunal or whenever it was approved as per the IBC resolution plan and intimated to the RSC within a period of one day. In these two cases, you are not required to pass any SR because these orders, because these orders override the special resolution and the third one was if any unlisted material subsidiary wants to sell off if it is selling off disposing of leasing off its asset of more than 20 percent right more than 20 percent of the assets of the unlisted material subsidiary is getting sold off is getting disposed of is getting leased etc then in that case again you have to pass a special resolution the listed holding company will have to pass a special resolution in the general meeting but SR in general meeting is not required again in those two cases first one is if the court or tribunal has passed any order or if it was approved because of the resolution plan under IBC and in such case it was uh, intimated to the recognized stock exchange within a period of one day right this is what we had studied in regulation number 24. Then after that going to the next one, we had studied some points about the quarterly compliances. We had studied five points about the quarterly compliances. In that the first one, first one is the grievance redressal mechanism. That is uh, for every quarter, how many complaints did we have at the opening? How many new complaints were received? How many were uh, solved? How many were finally left? <coughs> this reporting we are supposed to do to the recognized stock exchange within 21 days from the end of the quarter. Right. Second one is other corporate governance requirements. If RSE says that you have to do some other reporting also, then we'll have to do that other reporting to the recognized stock exchange within 15 days, within 15 days from the end of the quarter. Third thing was we had to uh, submit the report about the shareholding pattern three times. Three times we had to submit the data about the shareholding pattern. First one is one day prior to listing. Okay, one day prior to listing. Uh, this can be a proposed to be listed company also only this point only for this point it can be a proposed to be listed company also that one day prior to the listing it has to submit to the recognized stock exchange its shareholding pattern then on a regular basis it has to do on quarterly basis within a period of 21 days from the quarter end and then whenever there is a capital restructuring happening in the company and whenever there is a change of more than 2% in the paid up share capital then we have to report it within a period of 10 days. We have to uh, give the details about the shareholding pattern within a period of 10 days. 
Next thing was about the financial results. Financial results, we had combined this point with some other point also. In case of financial results, for the first three quarters, for the first three quarters, we are going to submit it within 45 days from the quarter end. And for the last quarter, we are going to give it along with the yearly results that is within 60 days from the year end. And the last one, last one was about the statement of deviation or variation. Statement of deviation or variation. Deviation means whenever there was a change in the main objective, right? The main objective of our company for which we had, you know, uh, taken the public's money. If that has changed altogether, then you have to report it to the recognized stock exchange on quarterly basis. And whenever there is an internal bifurcation change, the main objective, the main business hasn't changed, but the internal bifurcation that the, you know, allocation between the capital expenditure, allocation between the uh, revenue expenditure, etc. If that has changed, then in that case also we are supposed to report this to the recognized stock exchange on quarterly basis. Right. Then after that, the next point which was coming is talking about the prior intimation that whenever we are holding, whenever we are holding any board meeting for some important matters, whenever we are holding any board meeting for some important matters, at that time we have to report it to the recognized stock exchange. Total, we are going to study six points here. Total, we are going to study six points. Out of that, four points are those points where we have to intimate it to the recognized stock exchange and two points, two points are talking about the compliance. Okay, now in that first one, in that four points, the first one, first one is whenever we are going to conduct a board meeting for adopting the financial results, then in that case, we have to intimate, you know, before the meeting, we have to intimate at least five days in advance. We have to intimate at least five days in advance to the recognized stock exchange that we are going to conduct a particular board meeting for that. Second one, second one was when we are conducting any board meeting for some other matters like it can be buyback, it can be delisting, etc. Then in that case, we have to intimate at least two days before that particular board meeting. Okay, then 11 days, so long days, 11 days came into picture whenever there was any change in the interest dates or whenever there was change in the rights and privileges of the security holders. Then in that case, we have to intimate to them at least 11 days before this particular meeting. And uh, another thing, another thing was whenever we are going to, whichever date, whichever date we are going to set as the record date, that is a book entry date, whichever date we are going to set as the record date, at least seven days before, at least seven days before, we have to intimate to the RAC that sir, so and so date we are going to fix as the record date. So these four points were such things where we had to intimate about the days. These four were such things where we had to intimate about such days to the, uh, to whom? We had to intimate it to the recognized stock exchange and then the two points, more two points coming up there. That is first one, there should be a gap. There should be a gap of at least five days between the actual date of declaration and between the record date, right? There should be a gap of at least five days there. And then whenever there is any change in the content, whenever there is any change, then in that case, that change must be updated on the company's website also within a period of two days. Right. So the last two points that we studied that there should be a gap of five days between the date of declaration and record date. And secondly, secondly, uh, the changes on the website should be reflected within a period of two days. These two points were talking about the compliances and the earlier four points were talking about the intimation, the intimation that we had to do to the recognized stock. Another thing. Another thing coming up here is the, just uh, this two to three points coming up in the annual and the yearly compliances. They are telling that in annual or yearly compliances, we are supposed to submit the annual accounts or the annual uh, statements or the annual financial statements to the recognized stock exchange within a period of 60 days from the year end as we just discussed. It will be along with the audit report which can be either in form A or it can be in form B depending upon the type of opinion. Then they are telling that annual report copy, the booklet copy which we had discussed the entire booklet which contains the annual report of the company that should be that even that should be sent to the recognized stock exchange see that is sent to the shareholders also at least 21 clear days before the general meeting so they are telling that as soon as you start dispatching as soon as you start dispatching to the shareholders immediately you have to start dispatching to the recognize you have to dispatch it to the recognized stock exchange also and if at all in the in annual general meeting, if there is any changes in this particular annual report, then within 48 hours from the AGM, within 48 hours of the AGM, you have to again submit the revised copy. You have to again submit the re revised copy to the recognized stock exchange. Right? So that was all about your annual compliances. That's it.
right and after that after that we spoke after that we spoke something about the corporate governance in corporate governance what are what were they telling that uh, specifically for related party transactions earlier earlier the resolution required was special resolution but now everything is at par and now ordinary resolution is only required for approving the related party transactions so now basically section number 188 of the companies act is at par with the LODR regulations or we can say it is at par with the clause 49 it is at par with the clause 49 of the listing agreement now in that in that they are telling that suppose if there was any such related party transaction which was approved earlier which was approved earlier before this particular amendment so just for ratifying it just for ratifying it please place it before the general meeting so that the shareholders can pass an ordinary resolution and they can ratify it so basically they are making sure that we have complied with all the new provision after that we had studied after that we had studied four committees after that we had studied four committees in this in that in that the first committee is the important committee that is the audit committee first of all they are telling that every listed company every listed company must have an audit committee for sure and every audit committee must have at least three members means three directors it should have at least three directors in that and out of that at least two third of the directors at least two third of the directors must be independent directors right all the members of the audit committee all the members of the audit committee they should be financially literate right all of them should be financially literate and at least one of them at least one of them should have proper expertise at least one of them should have proper expertise in that and the person the person uh the chairperson the chairperson of this particular audit committee that person has to be an independent director because we have to exercise high level of independence in this particular audit committee and he will be present before the agm he will be present before the agm to answer all the queries which are raised by the shareholder the company secretary will be acting as a secretary of this audit committee also that is calling for the meetings you know issuing the notices etc that will be the work of that particular uh, secretary then when we talk about the meeting okay when we talk about the meeting then in that case audit committee is going to have should hold at least four meetings in a year right? okay it, this is just like your board meeting so audit committee also should conduct at least four meetings in a year and uh, the gap between two meetings should not be more than 120 days right now coming on to the quorum what should be the quorum so in quorum there should be at least there should be at least two members there should be at least two members or one third of the total members of the audit committee whichever is higher okay so two members or one third of the members whichever is higher but with at least two independent directors present there okay with at least two independent directors present there this is what we had studied for the audit committee powers of the audit committee we are going to take it from section number 177 and that's why i have ignored your another thing was another committee that you have to set up is the nomination and the remuneration committee this committee was formed this committee was formed mainly for nominating the directors for recommending the directors for deciding upon their remuneration to see their uh, status or to see their performance etc this committee was basically set up the main purpose the main purpose of the nrc this is what we have discussed now going on to the composition in this also in this nrc also it should have at least three directors it should have at least three directors but one thing is very very important here whoever is present here in the nrc all of them all of them should be the non executive directors and in that at least half of them just like we studied for the earlier at least two thirds should be independent here at least half of them should be independent directors even the chairperson would be an independent director it should it should it should make sure it should make sure that it has met at least once in a year okay the frequency of the meeting year is at least one meeting in a year and talking about the quorum it is almost same as that of your audit committee so two directors or one third of the total members of the members or directors whatever you want to call two members or one third of the members of the committee whichever is higher but with at least one independent director present there there it was two independent directors present here it is one independent director present and one important thing here is the person who is the chairperson of the company the person who is the chairperson of the company cannot be a chairperson here however he can be a member of this uh, nomination and remuneration going on to the next one that is the stakeholders relationship committee going on to the next one stakeholders relationship committee this is such a committee which has been set up to address to address various aspects of the security holders that is your equity shareholders preference shareholders debenture holders or any other security holders or the grievances all the questions which are raised by the security holders will be answered or with, with, uh, that has to be handled basically by this stakeholders relationship committee 
now uh, here they are telling that how many members should be there first of all three members at least three members should be there in this particular committee with at least with at least one independent director present in that particular committee then after that this committee also has to meet at least once a year here the quorum here the quorum has not been specified here the quorum has not been specified and the most important thing here is again the chairperson of this particular committee the chairperson of this particular committee even that person has to be a non executive director and he will be present before the agm just like your audit committee even this particular chairperson will be present before the uh, annual general meeting so as to answer the so as to answer the queries of the shareholders another committee another important committee which is coming up here is your risk management committee top 500 listed entities top 500 listed entities as per the last year's market capitalization is compulsorily required to establish this committee called as risk management committee till now whichever committees we were seeing till now whichever committees we were seeing those committees those committees were to be established by every listed entity this is such a committee which has to be established by the top 500 listed entities as per the last year's market capitalization we have to establish they have to establish this risk management committee the main purpose the main the main purpose of this particular committee is to monitor the risk to review the risk to make uh, to make sure that we prepare a risk plan including including a plan which talks about the cyber security right then after that in this risk management committee in this risk management committee they haven't specified how many members should be there but they have told but they have told that senior executive senior executive of the board would be the members in this particular committee depending upon the knowledge and the experience and the frequency of meeting frequency of meeting is at least one meeting in a year again here the quorum has not been specified right the important pointers from all these committees i have written already i have written in the summary chart so you can refer it from there then after that uh, your icci has put up some key features of the uh, lodr regulations in that specifically point number 1 and point number 3 is specifically important in that point number 1 point number 1 first of all it talks about the composition of the executive directors and composition of the non executive directors in that in that first of all the most important thing to be fulfilled there is the composition of the non executive directors in the company in the company there should be more than or equal to 50% more than or equal to 50% of the directors should be non executive directors okay there should be non executive directors more than half of them more than or equal to half half or more than half should be non executive directors now in that also in that also there should be a particular proportion of independent directors okay now if the chairperson if the chairperson of the company is a non executive director and he is unrelated he is totally unrelated to uh, the other members to the affairs of the company etc then in that case then in that case if the total board if the to in the total board even if one third of the independent direct one third of the total board is independent director then that is allowed no problem in that if we have a non executive chairperson but he is related if we have a non executive chairperson but he is related then in that case at least half of the board at least half of the board should be independent director so as to just ensure integrity and independence and suppose if you do not have any non executive chairperson means the chairperson is an executive person then in that case again half of the board again half of the board should be an independent director then they were talking about the board meeting just like your audit committee frequency the board should meet at least four times in a year and the gap between two meetings should not be more than 120 days then they were talking about the restriction that a particular person can be a, a committee member in how many committees he can be a chairperson of how many committees first of all when we talk about the membership okay if i arpita is a member of uh committees arpita is a member of committees then arpita can be a member of maximum 10 committees okay arpita can be a member arpita can be a member of maximum 10 committees and in this committees we are just going to take two committees one is audit committee and the src that is stakeholders relationship committee okay now ma'am what about the other committee so if arpita is a member of any other committee then that won't be considered in this particular ceiling meaning that meaning that there is no limit on the membership in other committees right and then if arpita wants to become a chairperson if arpita wants to become a chairperson in any particular committee okay if arpita wants to become a chairperson in any particular committee then in that case i can be a chairperson in maximum five committees in whatever companies i am involved totally totally in all the companies maximum five committees i can be a chairperson 
ओके योर वाइल कैलकुलेटिंग द कंपनीज ओके योर वाइल कैलकुलेटिंग द टोटल कंपनीज वी हैव टू टेक ऑल द टाइप्स ऑफ कंपनी एक्सेप्ट फॉर थ्री कंपनीज वन इज प्राइवेट कंपनीज टू बी एक्सक्लूडेड फॉरेन कंपनीज टू बी एक्सक्लूडेड एंड सेक्शन एट कंपनी ओके दैट एक्सक्लूजन इज एप्लीकेबल फॉर बोथ ऑफ दीज फॉर बोथ ऑफ दिस बेसिकली इट इज एप्लीकेबल फॉर द एंटायर पॉइंट सो सपोज नाउ इफ आई एम अ चेयर पर्सन आई एम अ मेंबर ऑफ एनी पर्टिकुलर कमिटी इन प्राइवेट कंपनी इन फॉरन कंपनी इन सेक्शन एट कंपनी देन दैट इज नॉट टू बी काउंटेड एट ऑल मीन्स दैर इज नो रेस्ट्रिक्शन ऑन दैट पर्टिकुलर नंबर then after that then after that fourth and fifth point we have already studied before audit committee and the corporate governance part then sixth point says that sixth point says that uh, the company is required to make the company is required to make certain disclosures the company is required to make certain disclosures as given as given in regulation number 30 which talks about some related party transactions which talks about ipo which talks about uh, your um, risk management which which talks about the accounting treatment etc some required matters which are already stated in regulation number 30 you have to give the proper disclosures of that then the ceo lodr says that ceo and cfo of the company should mandatorily certify and review the financial statements and the cash flow financial statements and the cash flow of the company that is mandatory this is what they are trying to say and the last thing the last thing which is coming up here is uh, lodr also requires that certain reporting see now till now maximum things that we were studying was whatever things we had studied all those things had to be reported to the recognized stock exchange all those things had to be recognized all those things had to be reported to the recognized stock exchange now they are telling that there are certain more things which are to be reported to the members of the company and we report it we report it to the members of the company by way of annual reporting the annual report that we submit to the members it contains all these information right and this is this is nothing but this is nothing but your summary this is nothing but your summary of different types of committees from which we had i had told you that you can just revise it from Right, so only this much, only this much, this much was your L O D R. I hope you are clear with this. Okay, so let's start. Let's start with the I B C revision. Let's start with the super quick revision of Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code 2016. First of all, the code was evolved. The code was evolved somewhere in the year 2015. The idea was evolved in the year uh, 2015, where it was introduced in the Lok Sabha. introduced in the lok sabha on 21st of december 2015 later on it got approved in the rajya sabha and subsequently it got the president's assent president's assent was finally taken on or was finally received on 28th of may 28th of may 2016 was the date when the president's assent was received and the law came into force right now there are now there are uh, three terms here there are three terms here first term is insolvency second term is bankruptcy and the third term is liquidation so your insol what is the difference between all the three terms first of all insolvency insolvency is such a state okay insolvency is such a state where the person is not able to pay off his debts insolvency is such a state where the person is not able to pay off his debt basically his debts are more than his assets right the debts are more than his assets so we can say that this particular person is treated as an insolvent or this particular person can apply can apply to be treated as an insolvent right now the next stage next stage is where the authority where the uh, authority declares us where the authority declares us or when we go and make an application to the authority that please adjudge me as an insolvent okay please declare me as an insolvent that is the state that is the state of bankruptcy so insolvency is just that we know we know that we do not have any money left with us now or we have insufficient funds with us and bankruptcy is the stage bankruptcy is the stage where we go and make a declaration or we go and make a request to the authority to declare us as insolvent or to declare us as bankrupt that is called as your bankruptcy and the last one last one is your liquidation liquidation you already know liquidation happens in case of a company it is nothing but liquidation is nothing but the winding up liquidation is nothing but the winding up of the company Right like for individuals etc. We call it as bankruptcy. For corporates and other organizations etc. We call it as a corporate insolvency. Now before 2016, before 28th May 2016, that is before this code came into picture. Before that also, uh, you know people used to become insolvent before that also. But but the problem was the problem was before that. we had we had varied laws we had varied laws for insolvency the provisions for insolvency the concepts of insolvency were covered in different different laws right which used to create a chaos which used to create a confusion that whenever a person is treated as an insolvent where are we supposed to go 
right where are we supposed to go that used to create a problem so now what happened was after 28th may 2016 whenever any particular person becomes insolvent okay whenever any particular person becomes insolvent we know that we can go for this particular ibc we can go for this insolvency and bankruptcy code which has got two ways okay which has got two ways if any person goes under ibc if any person goes for insolvency now there, there are two ways available first one is first one is uh, resolution resolution that is we will try to resolve we will try to resolve that particular person we will try to revive that particular entity and the other thing available with us if revival or resolution is not possible then in that case it will lead to uh, liquidation okay then in that case it will lead to liquidation now what was the main purpose of forming this particular code the main purpose of forming this particular code was uh, first of all there, since there were so many laws since there were so many laws which were talking different different things in different different ways about insolvency so they wanted to consolidate okay they wanted to consolidate all the laws after consolidating all the different different laws now they have amended and a new code has come into picture okay the best and the most important benefit of this particular code is it is a time bound code that is in a particular time frame in a particular time frame the case should get over right and because of this you know the interest of the employees workmen are protected because they are paid in priority interest of the shareholders are also uh, protected because because ultimately ultimately the persons who suffer the losses are the are the shareholders for doing all these things they have established a co uh, board for doing all these things they have established a board called as insolvency and bankruptcy board of india insolvency ibbi insolvency and bankruptcy board of india because of this code because of this code you know npas have reduced npas have reduced ease of doing business has comparatively it has improved if uh, you know npas have reduced then more funds are available in the market and more funds will be available to the other people in the market uh, the bank rates bank interest rate won't be you know uh, extortionate rate it won't go very much up so everything will be under control if, the, if people make use of this particular code properly now if we compare this particular code with the previous laws which were available then there were some important points of uh, you know distinguished there first of all here we have got one authority okay if suppose if any person wants to go and make an application there is one particular authority that is the adjudicating authority to whom we are supposed to go and make an application and suppose if you know if we go and make an application to the aa and after that if you want to go for an appeal there is a particular chain of authority there is a particular defined authority to whom you are supposed to go and make an application okay then altogether a new board has come into picture that is your ibbi insolvency and bankruptcy board of india altogether a new board has come into picture then similarly for maintaining a database for maintaining a database we have prepared something called as information utility where the database of all the defaulters would be maintained so that if any person wants to you know lend money to these defaulters they can first check their info in the information utility and then only they will proceed with that right and now now what they have done is uh, uh, all the other laws okay all the uh, prevailing laws which were there which were talking about the insolvency all those laws all those provisions have been cut from the different different laws and all the provisions have been put at one single place only so that because of that it becomes very very simple to understand the law to implement the law etc then we are going to protect because of this particular code the interest of the employees and workmen are protected because we are going to study later on in section number 53 when we do this liquidation thing that whenever it comes to the priority even before government taxes etc the first payment is made to the workmen then subsequently we pay to the employees etc government taxes uh, uh, or the dues to the government etc have a place very late okay very uh, far away in the sequence they have a place right and now there is a better clarity here there is a better clarity who, to whom are we supposed to go and make an application when are we supposed to go and make an application everything is very very clear in this particular new law okay going on to the structure going on to the structure of the code Achha, and one more distinguishing factor one more very important distinguishing factor was the time bound thing that is there is a particular time frame there is a particular time frame within which we have to complete the insolvency and bankruptcy proceedings if not completed within that much time then it leads to liquidation it is so strict that it leads to liquidation right going on to the next one going on to the next one that is structure of the code structure of the code is obviously not to be by hearted for our ca finals but here they have just divided the entire law 
okay they have just divided the entire law into five parts where they say where they say that okay okay first part is going to talk about the basics definition preliminary things etc second part is the most important thing for us because second part is going to talk about the corporate insolvency okay it is going to talk about the corporates which we have in our syllabus okay third part talks about the individuals which we do not have in our syllabus fourth part talks about some miscellaneous things which we do not have in our syllabus and the fifth part talks about the miscellaneous provisions again which we do not have in our syllabus because in our syllabus in our syllabus we just have it till section number 59 so it somewhere comes in between section uh, in in between somewhere in part 2 right so basically that was the structure of the code obviously not to be by heart eh? now now next comes is the regulatory mechanism which is important okay regulatory mechanism is important what is this regulatory mechanism regulatory mechanism is they have just given the authorities in the law just try to imagine here the most important authority here is the ibbi okay the most important authority here is the ibbi that is the insolvency and bankruptcy board of india within insolvency and bankruptcy board of india we have three authorities first one is the insolvency professional agency okay insolvency professional agency is what insolvency professional agency is just like the institute okay it is just like our ici it is just like the institute which is going to regulate its members okay which is going to regulate its members means which is going to regulate the insolvency professionals which is the next thing that we are going to study there so the next person who is going to come up there is the insolvency professional he is the most important person in the entire law because he is the person who is going to do all the groundwork okay he is the person who is going to do all the groundwork he is going to act as a irp he is going to act as a rp he is going to act as a liquidator sometimes sometimes he might even act as an authorized representative we will study that case but sometimes he might also act as an authorized representative right so basically insolvency professional is there insolvency professional is there insolvency professional is a degree okay that is a degree in that that particular person can act as an insolvency professional uh, or the insolvency professional can act as interim resolution professional he can act as a resolution professional he can act as a liquidator and he can even act as an authorized representative in certain cases and the last one and the last one is your information utility okay last one is your information utility which we just discussed information utility is nothing but the data bank right information utility is nothing but the data bank which contains all the data about the defaulter all the data about the defaulter so that whenever in future any person wants to do any transaction with such defaulter person that can be easily done okay uh, first we can check it in the information utility and then the transaction can be done okay one more important authority here one more important authority who comes under the ibbi only we can say like that uh even adjudicating authority comes under the ibbi only now adjudicating authority is the authority who is doing the work under this ibc okay now in adjudicating authority we are going to divide it into two parts okay first part first part is for the corporates okay first part is about the corporates and second part is for other than corporates corporate means we are talking about the company and llp okay corporate means we are talking about the company and llp if there is any such case which relates to company or which relates to llp then we are supposed to approach then we are supposed to approach the nclt okay we can either say a a uh, adjudicating authority but to be very specific who is the adjudicating authority so in case of company or in case of corporates or in case of llp we can say the uh, adjudicating authority is the nclt if we want to go and file an appeal against the nclt then we can go and file an appeal to the nclat and this further appeal can be filed before the supreme court right when we go to the other categories okay when we go to the other category say for example individual firms etc then in that case the adjudicating authority is the drt debt recovery tribunal appeal can be filed before the debt recovery appellate tribunal and the further appeal can be filed before the supreme court okay but anyway this part this others part this is an extra part which i have put anyway we do not have the uh, corporate insol or we do not have the insolvency relating to individual firms etc all we have is about the corporates only okay so nclt nclat and your supreme court this is utmost important for you and in this also we are majorly going to see the role of the nclt right going on to the next one going on to the next one where we are going to talk about the ibbi okay where we are going to talk about each and every person basically now ibbi ipa ips etc right just try to understand 
okay just let's let's start with let's start with uh, ibbi ibbi as we had already seen ibbi was nothing but a board right ibbi was nothing but an insolvency and bankruptcy board it was it was established in october 2016 and it was established at new delhi again now just try to recollect the logic remains the same as that of your sebi sekra only okay for insolvency and bankruptcy board of india for uh, ibbi basically it is also in form of a body corporate only okay if it is in form of a body corporate if it is in form of a body corporate then it is going to have a perpetual succession it is going to have a common seal it can sue any other person it can be uh, sued by any other person etc and now ibbi mainly regulates okay ibbi mainly regulates three persons mainly regulates three persons first one first one is ipa as we had already seen second one is your ip and the third one is your information utility right these are the three these are the three persons these are the three persons basically who are specifically you know regulated who are regulated by the ibbi okay hierarchy wise hierarchy wise even aa comes under ibbi but aa is self regulated okay aa is your nclt so it is self regulated it is not regulated by the ibbi okay now listen now listen the composition of the board this is important composition of the board that is composition of the ibbi that is 1315 in ib in uh, i think sebi chapter we had seen as 1215 in uh, ibbi we have it as 1315 okay we have it as 1315 so one stands for one chairperson three stands for three members from three different different ministries or three different different office that is ministry of law ministry of finance and ministry of corporate affairs from these three secret uh, ministries they are going to take one one members then one person nominated by the rbi and five other members five other members out of which at least three should be whole time members at least these many at least these many should sit at least these many should sit in your should sit in the composition of the ibbi okay now the first person who comes under the purview of ibbi is the ipa what did i tell you about the ipa ipa is nothing but ipa is nothing but ipa is nothing but your uh, agency we can say or we can say it is an institute which regulates okay which enrolls the ips and it regulates them okay just like our icai regulates ca chartered accountants it enrolls uh, the ca finalists or the people who have already cleared ca finals it enrolls them as the members etc it regulates them similarly your ipas ipas are going to enroll and ipas are going to regulate the insolvency professionals right now it is going to tell about the ethics for them it is going to define the roles and responsibilities of them it is going to promote the members it is going to promote their services it is going to promote its own institute it is going to prepare the bylaws okay it is going to prepare the bylaws for the insolvency professional just like i told you it is going to uh, prepare the ethics which has to be just like we have our code of ethics similarly it is also going to draft a code of ethics for its own members then it is going to also keep an eye on the insolvency professional it is going to monitor them it is going to gather information it is going to hear the complaints also against the insolvency professionals okay if the insolvency professionals do not work properly then the complaint will be heard by the insolvency professional agencies etc now what is the main work of the insolvency professional coming on to the next topic that is insolvency professional okay insolvency professional is such a person he is the main person who is going to do the ground work right he is the main person who is going to do the ground work right so basically just like i mentioned some time back he is going to act as the interim resolution professional he is the person who is going to be there in the beginning of the process in the beginning of the insolvency process he is going to handle everything later on he will change his role to the resolution professional where he is going to see how the process is to be done can resolution be done or not is liquidation to be done etc you know uh, the coordination between the company and the authorities all those things will be done by this particular insolvency professional suppose if it leads to liquidation suppose if it leads to liquidation then in that case this person will even act as a liquidator this person can even act as a liquidator okay he is going to sell off the assets pay off the liabilities etc even that is the work of this insolvency professional and in some cases we will see and in some cases we will see this insolvency professional can even act as an authorized representative in certain cases he can act as an authorized representative also we will see that don't worry okay going on to the next one going on to the next one next one is talking about the information utility about which we have already discussed information utility is nothing but the database about all the defaulters 
right it is nothing but the uh, database about all the defaulters so if any one person wants to do the uh, transaction with such defaulter person it can first go and check the information utility and then the transaction can be done then next thing next thing comes up here is the adjudicating authority as you can see on the board adjudicating authority adjudicating authority is what adjudicating authority just like we have already seen adjudicating authority for corporates right adjudicating authority for corporates is nothing but what adjudicating authority for corporates is nothing but that nclt nclat and the supreme court and for others it is going to be the drt drat and the supreme court right so that was very very simple there chalo going on to the next one going on to the next one going on to the main provisions now they are talking about the extent and commencement of the code okay extent and commencement of the code now here they are trying to say now here they are trying to say that ibc ibc is going to be applicable this entire code is going to be applicable to whole of india this amendment happened okay initially before this before this we had certain uh, ifs and buts there but now it's that that the uh, uh, ibc is applicable to whole of india including the state of jammu and kashmir okay uh, now this happened from 18th march 2020 this happened from 18th march 2020 Uh, and now, as per the ICAI's notification on fifteenth of July, as per the ICAI's notification on fifteenth of July, they have told that all the amendments for the November exams, all the amendments till thirty April twenty twenty would be applicable. So, uh, considering that this amendment will would also be applicable, so we will say that the entire code, the entire code will be applicable to whole of India. Right now, now who uh, the uh, the code is applicable to which all persons? As of now, we have seen geographically that the code is applicable to whole of India. Now let's see person wise that the code is applicable to who all? Basically, who all can initiate IBC? Right, who all can initiate IBC? So basically, a company can initiate any company, be it a company formed under the new 2013 Act or under the 1956 Act or any specific association formed under the Special Act. any individuals any huf any llp any personal guarantors any partnership firm any other entities right any person can initiate any particular person can initiate cirp right any particular person can initiate cirp uh, and we can even initiate crp against those persons okay we can initiate crp against a company against llp against individual etc we can initiate insolvency resolution process against them right but but there are there are certain persons there are certain persons against whom against whom cirp cannot be initiated okay that is that is nothing but you can say there are some regulated service providers okay there are some regulated service providers example banks are there example insurance companies are there example mutual fund companies are there example amcs asset management companies which manage the funds of the mutual fund company these all are uh, service providers and these are specifically regulated right so in that case in these cases uh, ibc is not applicable ibc is not applicable means what ibc is not applicable means we cannot initiate crp against them right we cannot initiate crp against them right so, say for example if i want to go against a bank no i cannot similarly one important pointer here is ma'am what about the nbfcs then okay so now they there was a case law for this jinda saxena uh, financial services there was a case law for this that if it is such a nbfc okay if it is such a nbfc which has got rbi certificate okay or which has obtained the certificate from the rbi then they say that it comes at par with the bank okay if it comes at par with the bank then in that case then in that case then in that case ibc will not be applicable to it because it has come at par with the bank so if there is any other nbfc so it stays in the form of a corporate so in that case the ibc would be applicable right now going on to the next further provisions of the law now your from your basically your important provisions start now they are going to talk about the procedure okay now they are going to talk about the procedure now what, are, what we are going to study mainly the part 2 if you remember that structure of the code in that we are going to study the part 2 so we are studying about the corporate persons okay we are studying about the corporate persons now <clears throat> if we want to initiate okay if suppose any particular person has done a default if any particular person has done a default and i want to proceed under the ibc then in that case i will check that what is the amount of default if the amount of default if the amount of default is at least rupees 1 lakh 
okay if the amount of default is at least rupees 1 lakh yes yes if the amount of default is at least rupees 1 lakh then in that case we can initiate CIRP against a particular person okay but but now what happened was what happened was here there was a power given in the law there was a power given in the law that whenever the central government wants okay whenever the central government wants it can increase it can increase the limit to any amount up to rupees 1 crore okay initially the limit was 1 lakh CG had got the power that it can increase the limit to any amount up to rupees 1 crore okay so now what happened during this particular covid on 24th march 2020 there came a notification that there came a notification that if the minimum amount of default is rupees 1 crore then and then only the uh, CIRP that is the corporate insolvency resolution process can be initiated or the we can say IBC provisions can be initiated because the economy has been hit because people have been hit because uh, people have suffered losses because NPAs would be there etc. So that's why they have just increased the amount of the default and it has been set to 1 crore rupees. Okay, we do not know that as of now whether this is a temporary amendment, this is a permanent amendment. So, this we can say that this is a COVID related amendment. So, as of now, ICI hasn't specified anything in law for the COVID related amendment. So, in that case, we will add, we can we can just remember both. We can just remember 1 lakh also and we can just remember 1 crore also. Rest things we can get cleared when the RTP is released. Right? Now, First of all, there should be a default. There should be a default of either 1 lakh or 1 crore as the case may be. Ma'am, what do you mean by the term default? Ma'am, what do you mean by the term default? Default is where some amount is outstanding. Some amount has become due and yet not paid. Okay, the amount has become due but yet not paid. And uh, in that case, it is treated as a default. Okay, now, suppose if there is a default of 1 lakh or 1 crore as the case may be, then we can initiate CIRP. Okay, who can initiate CRP ma'am? What is the CRP that you are telling again and again? CIRP stands for Corporate Insolvency Resolution Process. Okay, Corporate Insolvency Resolution Process, it is nothing but the process of insolvency. Okay, so now who can initiate CRP? There are three persons. Okay, there are three persons who can initiate CRP. First one. First one is something called as financial creditor. Second one is something called as operational creditor. And the third one is something called as a corporate debtor himself. Corporate debtor is who? When corporate debtor is a defaulter himself. Okay, corporate debtor is who? Corporate debtor is a defaulter himself. Even he can initiate insolvency against himself saying that no, I cannot work now, I do not have money. Or alternatively, the creditors can proceed against us. Okay, ma'am, which creditors? Either the financial creditors or the operational creditors. Okay, either the financial creditors or the operational creditors, they can proceed against us. What do you mean by the term financial creditors? Any creditors who have advanced us or who has given us a financial debt or who has financed us. Example, it can be the banks, it can be the debenture holders, etc. Right, and operational creditors are the regular day-to-day -day activities creditors. Just like your employees, just like your workmen, just like government taxes, just like sundry creditors, etc. They come under the term called as operational creditor. So, financial creditor, if his money is due, operational creditor, if his money is due, or the corporate debtor himself, they can proceed, they can initiate, they can initiate to start this, uh, they can proceed to initiate this particular CIRP, that is Corporate Insolvency Resolution Process. Okay, now listen, now listen, after that, after that, we have got a certain process. Okay, these th uh, four sections are going to be very, very important. Section number 7, 8, 9 and 10. Okay, section number 7, 8, 9 and 10. These sections are really very, very important. Where we are going to talk about each step. Okay, where we are going to talk about each step. Section number 7. Section number 7 talks about CIRP by the financial creditor. Let's suppose if a financial creditor wants to proceed against Arpita. Okay, as a company, obviously if Arpita is a company or if Arpita is a LLP, we are talking about the corporate persons only. If any particular financial creditor wants to proceed, then in that case, the financial creditor can either press, proceed individually or jointly with any other, jointly with any other financial creditor and it can go and make an application. Okay, and it can go and make an application to the adjudicating authority. Okay, it can go and make an application to the adjudicating authority. We are going to study some more things about this joint application, etc. Later on, after the, after section number 21, we are going to study that. Okay, so now uh, either I can as a financial creditor or I jointly with some other person, I can go and make an application to the adjudicating authority or any person on behalf of this financial creditor can also go and file an application to the adjudicating authority. Okay, it will take certain things along with itself. It will take the proof of default. It will take the name of the 
uh, insolvency professional it will suggest the name of the insolvency professional who is later on going to continue our case ahead and it is going to take such other information as is required by the ibbi okay all these things the proof of the de default then the name suggesting the name of the uh, insolvency professional or suggesting the name of the resolution professional who is going to further continue our case ahead we are going to suggest all these things and we are going to take all the documents relating to this to the adjudicating authority adjudicating authority adjudicating authority will take a time period of 14 days and within a time period of 14 days okay within a time period of 14 days it is going to determine whether there is a default or not it will check whether any disciplinary proceedings is pending against the insolvency professional or not okay if it thinks that everything is proper okay if it thinks that both the things are proper then in that case the adjudicating authority will accept adjudicating authority will accept our application and it will inform both the parties it will inform both the parties means one it will inform to the applicant that is to the financial creditor and another one it is going to intimate to the corporate debtor that is to the defaulter that someone has filed an application against you and i have admitted it this is what the aa is going to intimate next if the aa thinks that no something is not proper if the application form is incomplete etc then it will give us the opportunity to rectify the default within a period of 7 days if we have done it then in that case and if later on if the adjudicating authority thinks that the rectification is absolutely correct then it will accept again after acceptance it is going to intimate to both the parties okay suppose if it gets rejected now then in that case it will intimate only to the financial creditor okay then means it is going to intimate only to the applicant not to any other person but if it gets admitted then it has to be intimated to the corporate debtor also okay now listen just try to understand this 14 days period this 14 days period here even though the word used here is shall but we will see in one of the case laws in later on in the last part of the chapter this shall has to be read as may and this shall is not mandatory okay means aa is having this 14 days time period is still dis dis uh, discretionary is still discretionary so in that case if the adjudicating authority takes even more than that for some sufficient cause then that is absolutely okay right then after that whenever the aa goes and intimates that the application has been accepted etc then in that case aa intimates to everyone within a period of 7 days okay whenever the process starts from that day within a period of 7 days aa intimates it to everyone now the day on which the application is admitted okay the day on which the aa says yes your application has been admitted that is the date called as insolvency commencement date okay that date is called as what that date is called as the insolvency commencement date this we are going to use many times in the chapter and that's why i'm making it very very clear here itself that 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 your uh, in uh, the uh, your um, insolvency commencement date is equal to the date on which the application is admitted by the adjudicating authority right okay so now the next thing the next thing is your see see i have written your the uh, documents in a summary chart i have written it Uh, we are going to take the application form we are going to take the fees we are going to take the proof of default and we are going to suggest the name of the insolvency professional all these things all these things we were taking to whom all these things we were taking to the adjudicating authority right now similarly we are going to study it for the operational creditors also in operational creditors there are going to be two section section number 8 and section number 9 section number 8 section number 8 talks about the operational creditor and extra step coming in between here now whenever any default has been done with the operational creditors okay whenever any default has been done with the operational creditors suppose if we as a company or we as a llp etc if we have not paid any amount to our employees workmen etc then i'm just giving an example okay example of the operational creditor then in that case the operational creditor will first give us the demand notice okay it will first issue a demand notice to the corporate debtor whenever i say corporate debtor corporate debtor is nothing but a defaulter so operation creditor will send a demand notice to the corporate debtor saying that your so and so amount of money is due please make sure that you pay it within a period of 10 days okay so we are going to give a demand notice to the corporate debtor to make the payment within a period of 10 days if the corporate debtor says that no no this amount is not due he says that no there is a dispute regarding the amount there is a dispute regarding the quality of goods provided by you quality of services provided by you or our case is already going on in the court or our case is already going on in the arbitration etc then in that case ibc cannot be initiated 
okay first you solve your dispute either you close your court case either you close your arbitration proceedings then only we are going to take you under ib and suppose if suppose if uh, the corporate debtor is very good person and he pay, makes the payment within a period of 10 days if he makes the payment within a period of 10 days then the case automatically get closed there is no problem in that right but now listen everyone just try to understand here what if the operation what if the corporate debtor does not revert back within a period of 10 days means there is no dispute also and he does not make the payment etc also if it does not revert back within a period of 10 days then in that case we can initiate insolvency proceedings against that particular corporate debtor okay once once we decide that this 10 days has been over and there is no dispute there is no court case going on there is no arbitration proceedings etc going on then in that case now we will go again the same process again the same process as given in the fc would be applicable that is we can go and file an application we can go and file an application to the uh, adjudicating authority with uh, the form fees proof of the default demand notice that we had submitted in the above section we might suggest the name of the insolvency professional you are suggesting the name of the insolvency professional is not mandatory we might submit the name of the insolvency professional then in the, uh, we'll also submit some evidences if available with the banks that we haven't received any payment from the corporate debtor we can even take that some proof etc from the information utility we will go and submit this to the uh, uh, adjudicating authority etc the most important point here is the most important point here is it is not mandatory for us it is not mandatory for us to suggest the name it is not mandatory for us to suggest the name of the insolvency professional right see these are the documents these are the documents where is it written yes see here it is written we will take a bank certificate if possible we will uh, take the data from the ius information utility record we will take the copy of the invoice again obviously the proof of the default then we will take the demand notice that we had issued to that particular corporate debtor and and yes this one last important document here is the affidavit okay affidavit that we are self signing it that there is no dispute that there is no dispute pending with the corporate debtor okay once this application once this application goes to the adjudicating authority again the adjudicating authority is going to take a time period of 14 days it should try to you know do everything within a period of 14 days as per that particular case law and if aa thinks that yes everything is proper then aa will admit the application the day it admits the application the day it admits the application insolvency commencement process uh, or insolvency process starts immediately on that date itself and suppose if suppose if suppose if aa accepts it then within a period of 7 days it will intimate to the oc also it will intimate to the corporate debtor also within a period of 7 days. if a, uh, if the adjudicating authority thinks that no no application is not proper then it will uh, give one time opportunity of a period of 7 days to us to rectify the application if we rectify within a period of 7 days no problem everything is good and if it thinks that everything is proper then it will admit the application uh, and again intimate within a period of 7 days if it thinks that no still the application is not proper then it is going to reject it and it will just inform to the operational creditor about the same the last point which is coming up here is about the corporate insolvency corporate insolvency when the application is made by the when the application is made by the corporate debtor himself okay when that same person makes an application if the same person is making an application he will take his financials he will take his audited books of accounts he will take some required documents he will propose the name of the insolvency professional okay so in the first one financial creditor and in the corporate debtor it is mandatory to suggest the name of the insolvency professional but in case of operational creditor it was not mandatory okay we may suggest the name of the insolvency professional so here we are going to uh, submit our books of accounts we are going to submit the financial statements we are going to suggest the name of the insolvency professional etc we are going to submit the approval of the shareholders okay that they are ready to go for this particular insolvency pro uh, proceeding that is that is it is we are going to submit we are going to submit either the special resolution okay uh, the, the if it is a company the shareholders have to pass a special resolution if it is a llp then three fourth of the partners okay that three fourth of the partners will have to approve that yes they are okay with going for this particular insolvency proceeding okay then again all these things all these things we are going to submit to whom all these things we are going to submit to the adjudicating authority and again the same process is going to follow that is that 14 days time period etc that process is going to follow just like the previous one all those process is going to
right now this was a summary chart which i had prepared in the regular lecture uh, about the documents that we have to submit okay about the documents that we have to submit fc will submit what all things oc will submit what all things and cd is going to submit what all things now once this is done once this is done can i say can i say well, if once this is done then in that case then in that case at least your application has reached to the uh, adjudicating authority and now some time some uh, in the coming sections we are going to start with the process okay in the coming sections we are going to start with the process before that before that we have section number 11 coming up here section number 11 says that some people some people are not allowed okay some people are not allowed to make an application some people are not allowed to initiate the CIRP just now we saw that FC can make an application OC can make an application CD himself can make an application but here they are telling that there are some persons who cannot make an application okay who are those people who cannot make an application if there is any particular corporate debtor listen uh, listen if there is a particular corporate debtor uh, who is already undergoing a CRP, then I cannot go and initiate CRP against some other person. This is what they are telling. But when we go and study the amendment on the next page, the entire meaning is going to change. So basically, first let's study the main provision. Yeah, the CD who is undergoing a CRP, that person cannot initiate. Boss, you yourself are a defaulter. What will you do by initiate CRP against some other person? Another thing is, another thing is, if I have completed my CRP in the last 12 months, Okay, before making any application for CIRP, if in the last 12 months I have completed my own CIRP or my own CIRP has been completed, then boss, you are just trying to, uh, you know, resolve yourself, then please do not initiate CIRP against some other person. Third one, if I or the financial creditor, if the corporate debtor or the financial creditor, if they have violated any terms and conditions, okay, if they have violated any terms and conditions of the resolution plan which was made during the last 12 months, then in that case, you are a defaulter you cannot initiate CRP against any other person or if you are such a corporate debtor against whom already a liquidation proceeding against whom already a liquidation proceeding has been initiated then in that case then in that case you cannot initiate CRP against some other person this is what they are trying to tell this is what restriction see basically they are telling either if you are a defaulter or if you yourself are undergoing CRP or if you have just completed your CRP or liquidation etc then boss you please keep quiet please do not initiate crp against some other person okay but now they are telling that suppose if this particular person wants to initiate crp because his own funds are stuck with some other person okay i am a corporator i am a defaulter okay no problem but can i say even i would be having my own debtors from whom i have to take the money so now if they are telling if i want to recover my money then i can initiate C i can initiate crp i can initiate crp against some other corporate debtor Again, some other corporate debtor, uh, even though, even though I fall under these four points, okay, even though I fall under these four points, I can still initiate CIRP, I can still initiate CIRP if at all I want to recover my own money, right? So, the conclusion is the corporate debtor who is undergoing CRP, the corporate debtor who has just completed his CRP, the corporate debtor whose liquidation order has been passed, etc., even he can initiate CRP against some other person. Okay, now the next section, next section is very, 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 very important. Section number 12. Section number 12 says, section number 12 says that if, uh, since we had studied this in the features, etc. Insolvency process, okay, insolvency process is a time bound process. So, if there is any particular insolvency proceedings which have started, okay, if any insolvency proceedings have started, then those have to be completed, understand this fact, those have to be completed within a period of 180 days. Okay, from the date of admission of application means the date when the process had initiated from that day it has to be completed within a period of 180 days. In some cases if the creditors later on there is going to be a committee called as committee of creditors which will be formed. If that committee of creditors approves that no the process cannot get over within a period of 180 days we require some more time then in that case uh, you know the resolution professional is going to come in the picture the insolvency professional is going to come into the picture it can go and make an application to the adjudicating authority that sir in our company in our particular corporate debtor the case cannot get over within a period of 180 days so so please grant us the extension one time extension is allowed maximum up to a period of 90 days okay so if first of all the coc will approve it 
by a voting of 66%. Okay, COC is nothing but what? COC is nothing but the committee of creditors. Committee of creditors is going to approve it by a voting of at least 66%. If COC approves, then the insolvency professional will go and make an application to the adjudicating authority. And if the adjudicating authority is satisfied, then in that case, we will, we, we will be granted an extension of maximum period of 90 days. Okay, so basically somehow 180 plus 90 days total within a period of 270 days the case must be solved. If the case is not solved within a period of 270 days, if the case is not solved within a period of 270 days, then in that case, then in that case, it is going to lead to liquidation as we had discussed earlier. Right, another thing, another thing is a new provision which was inserted here some time back in the last attempt basically it was inserted. That is, if any litigation proceedings are going on or if any legal proceedings are going on against the corporate debtor, then in that case, it might take some time. It might take some extra time in the process. So, they are telling that forget this period. Forget this period of 180 days plus 90 days, etc. You are going to get a total period. Okay, including this extension, etc. You are going to get a total period of 330 days. Okay, you are going to get a total period of 330 days to complete the entire process okay to complete the entire process you are going to get a period of 330 days if there is some legal proceedings if there is some litigation going on which is going to be a time consuming during the process also so there you are going to get a time period of 330 days okay so this was all about the time period here going on to the next one going on to the next one that wherever well, suppose if any particular application has been made by the fc under section 7 or if any application has been made by the OC under section 9 or whenever the application has been made by the corporate debtor under section 10. Okay, if they wish to withdraw the application, okay, if they wish to withdraw the application, it can be withdrawn but at a very later stage, at a very later stage when the COC is formed, okay, we are yet to form the COC. When the COC is formed and when the COC approves, when the COC approves by voting of 90%, Okay, when the COC approves it by voting of 90%, only then, only then the application can be withdrawn. Otherwise, the application cannot be withdrawn. Alright. Now, once the process starts, okay, the process starts on which day? The process starts on the day when the application is admitted. Okay, after that, three events are going to happen once the process is started. What three events are going to happen? First of all, the uh, IRP will be appointed. Okay, first of all, the IRP will be appointed. <coughs> Ma'am, what do you mean by IRP? IRP is nothing but the interim resolution professional. Okay, IRP is nothing but the interim resolution professional who is a temporary person who is going to be appointed. Then after that, moratorium will be declared. There is a term called as moratorium. Moratorium will be declared and after that, there is going to be something called as public announcement. Okay, all these things will be, uh, uh, AA will make sure that all these things are done. Okay, AE will make sure that all these things are done. Just like I told you, first of all, first of all, we are going to appoint. First of all, we are going to appoint the IRP. Okay, first of all, we are going to appoint the IRP. Now look here, how do we appoint the IRP? Like who will be the IRP, etc. Remember in case of FC and CD, we had suggested the name of the insolvency professional. And in case of OC, it was not mandatory for us to, uh, to uh, suggest the name of the insolvency profession. So first, first, let's take the case of the financial creditor and the corporate debtor where they would have suggested, suggested the name of the insolvency professional. We will appoint that particular person as the IRP if no disciplinary proceedings are going against him. Right? So that particular person will be appointed as the IRP and this appointment will be done on the same day. Means the day on which the process starts. Okay, the day on which the process starts, that is the date on which this process, this uh, IRP is going to be appointed. Okay, if OC has uh, suggested a name, then again we are going to use the same process that we will check whether any disciplinary proceedings are pending or not. If pending, then we will uh, cancel this suggestion. If not pending, that, that, then that particular person will be appointed as the IR. Okay, but if no name was suggested by the operational creditor, then in that case, AA will take a name reference. Okay, or AA will take a name recommendation from the IBBI. IBBI has to provide a name recommendation within a period of 10 days and such a person's name will be provided against whom no disciplinary proceedings are pending. And in this way basically, and in this way basically, the insolvency profession, insolvency resi interim resolution profession, IRP is appointed to do certain work, to do certain work in this particular process. 
right so now the irp is appointed okay this even this was an amendment irp is appointed on the same day okay irp is appointed on the same day that is on the day when the application has been admitted then after that after that next thing that happens here is the moratorium okay next thing that happens here is the moratorium and what do you mean by moratorium moratorium is nothing but a calm period okay c a l m moratorium is nothing but a calm period that is a, a you know it is just like just like a pause which happens in the life a pause which happens in the life of the corporate debtor or in the uh, obviously in the business of the corporate debtor that some activities some activities will be totally prohibited okay some activities will be totally prohibited during this particular moratorium period that is now the no assets can be sold okay you cannot sell the corporate debtor cannot sell off any assets during this particular moratorium period okay no legal suits can be instituted against this person we cannot also go and file a case against some other person okay but the supply of goods and services will be going on okay my normal business activities won't be affected that would be going on as it is okay and suppose if i have occupied if the corporate debtor has occupied any rented premises if the corporate debtor has occupied any rented premises then my owner okay my lesser cannot tell me to vacate this premise okay so this this and one more thing one more thing if i have given any particular asset as security against any loan then no enforcement can happen okay then in that case no enforcement can happen just like we had studied in surfisy no enforcement of security interest can happen right okay so basically these were the restrictions these were the restrictions which happened during your moratorium period okay moratorium period is basically moratorium period is basically such a period where we get relief where we get time to resolve ourselves and that's why no cases etc can initiate can be started against us during that particular period okay the licenses etc that we are having okay the licenses etc that we are having during this period example uh, if suppose say for example if you are engaged into food business etc then you should get that fssai license etc okay if there is any particular license that you are having if there is any particular license that you are having even that license won't get cancelled until unless you haven't paid for the license fee for that that is a different thing but otherwise during moratorium no other license etc is going to be cancelled okay now similarly just like i told you supply of goods and services supply of goods and services will it be terminated or will it be continued it will be continued it won't be affected at all okay now can we be allowed to continue our business yes our business can continue even during our moratorium our business will be continued as a going concern you can still purchase the goods from the creditors you can still pay to them etc if you have money obviously that can be done okay but if central government okay if central government tells that okay moratorium not applicable to so and so transaction then moratorium is not at all applicable okay if cg provides you an exemption or if cg passes an order on you that so and so transaction can still be done during moratorium even though it was earlier prohibited then in that case it will be allowed okay now listen moratorium will be there till when for this calm period they say first they say that moratorium is applicable for a period of 180 days okay this is what is the statement that they use but practically practically moratorium is going to be there till the time till the time your cirp is going on right it can be 180 days also it can be something more than 180 days also it can be 330 days also so till that time basically your moratorium is going to go on okay then the next thing is see now till now the irp is appointed moratorium is declared now the most important thing which the adjudicating uh, which the irp has to do okay the most important thing that the irp has to do is irp has to give a public announcement okay irp has to do a public announcement irp has to do a public announcement basically it is going to disseminate the information it is going to give the information to the general public that so and so person so and so persons insolvency is going to be started now so and so persons insolvency is going to be started now he will state the name and address of the corporate debtor he will state the name his own details okay the irp is going to state his own details he will say that whosoever money is pending please come and ask that money from me okay he is going to invite the claims from the from all the creditors he will also say that he will also say that if anyone gives any false claims then that person will be liable for penalty right then after that it will give the last date that by so and so date you have to come and give the claims etc right all these things will be written in that public announcement and public announcements cost public announcements cost yes this will be borne this will be borne by the applicant later on it will be reimbursed by the coc okay later on it will be reimbursed by the coc to the extent they feel it correct 
but initially it has to be borne by the applicant as a process cost then uh, now one, once uh, this IRP is appointed okay once the IRP is appointed once the IRP is appointed just like we had suggested the name or we'll take a new name recommendation from the IBBI etc this IRP is going to continue as IRP till the RP is appointed okay till the RP RP means the resolution professional till the RP is appointed till that particular point of time IRP is going to continue so there is no fixed time period as 15 days 30 days 45 days etc no basically the IRP is going to continue till the RP is appointed okay now there are a few theory answers now there are a few theory answers which you can manage on your own also now here they are talking about the powers of the IRP okay powers of the IRP now see the IRP comes into picture it takes the control in its own hand now it is going to manage the business of the corporate debtor it is going to gather information from the financial institutions it is it is going to start gathering the information from the employees etc it will now exercise the powers of the ex management hey, can I say now since moratorium has started and now since the insolvency has started the existing management's power will be suspended Right, so now all the powers will be exercised by whom? All the powers will now be exercised by the IRP. Right, all the powers will be exercised by the IRP. Now the IRP has got the powers that it can collect the data from the bank. It can take the data from the information utility. It can take the help of the statutory auditors. It can take the help of the chartered accountants. It can take the help of the lawyers, etc. It will for it will do everything as told by the adjudicating authority. It will do everything as told by the IBB, etc. And now basically it is going to start managing okay it will start managing the business of the uh, of the corporate data right now it will start collecting the information like I told you then you remember we had called for the claims by way of public announcement whosoever money is spending please submit the claims so now it will start collecting the claims then it will collate the claims collate the claims mean, means it will now check the claims it will now check the claims that uh, you know uh, as per our books whose money was due and who has come and submitted their claims etc we will check that and the most important thing that we are going to do here okay the most important thing that we are going to do here is IRP is going to constitute or IRP is going to form a committee called as committee of creditors okay it is going to form a committee called as committee of creditors just like uh, at so many places we had this committee coming up into picture so now it is going to form a committee called as committee of creditors and it is going to do all other things which was actually supposed to be done okay it is going to do all such things which was supposed to be done by the corporate debtor right it will take its asset into into its custody it will take the books of accounts into its custody whatever was whatever powers were there with the corporate debtor all those things will be exercised by the irp now okay and whenever the irp is doing so much of effort it is taking so much of efforts it is doing so much of mehnat so in that case the employees of the corporate debtor the people who are sitting in the corporate data their responsibility is there to provide all the necessary cooperation okay to provide all the necessary assistance to cooperate with the uh, insolvent uh, interim resolution professional right now as we discussed already as we have already discussed irp is going to manage the business if irp requires any funds if irp requires any funds then irp can raise those funds also irp can give instructions to the banks IRP can give instructions to the employees. IRP can give instructions to any office bearer in the company because now everything has come into his whose control. Everything has come under the control of the IRP, right? Everything has come under the control of the IRP. Now, just like I told you, one of the most important thing or one of the most important work of the IRP is to constitute the COC. Okay, one of the most important work of the IRP is to constitute the COC because now because now they are going to tell they are going to say that they are going to say that okay COC is the person COC is the person who is going to take majority of the decisions okay COC is the person who is going to take majority of the decisions so ma'am how do we form this COC okay COC stands for the full form stands for committee of creditors okay full form of COC is committee of creditors this will be formed this will be formed by whom this will be formed by the insolvency resolution professional basically this will be formed by the uh, sorry interim resolution professional irp now who all are going to sit as the name suggests as the name suggests who all are going to sit in this particular coc so just try to understand just try to understand all the financial creditors okay all the financial creditors all the financial creditors are going to sit in this particular coc does not mean that ocs are not going to get their money no but coc is going to comprise of all the financial creditors except 
except for those financial creditors who are the related parties okay who are the related party of the corporate debtor those those people those people cannot sit in the coc but apart from that all the financial creditors are going to sit in the coc okay because they say because they say here i just try to understand because they say here that financial creditors value involved is high and the number of financial creditors is comparatively lower so the decision making would be appropriate so they say that all the financial creditors except for the related parties would come and sit would come and sit in this particular committee of creditors okay if there is no financial creditor in the company or if all the financial creditors in the company are related parties okay suppose if there is no financial creditor or if all the financial creditors are related parties then in that case then and only then then and only then the operational creditors are going to come in the picture okay then and only then operational creditors will form part of the coc ma'am how many of them will come in that case so 18 largest okay 18 largest operational creditors 18 largest operational creditors plus one person representing the workmen and one person representing the employees like way maximum 20 of them okay likewise maximum 20 of them of the ocs of the ocs would come and sit in the coc okay i hope you are very very clear with this okay suppose if fcs are there then fcs if fcs are not there or if all the fcs are related parties then these maximum 20 is 20 ocs are going to come and sit in the picture okay now suppose see just try to understand we i just told you that if any particular financial creditor is a related party then he will not form part of the coc okay related party definition is a very big definition which is already given in your volume 1 okay in the company law i have made a definition section there the definition of related party has been given but if suppose there is any particular related person just because of ownership of shares okay example example as we had studied in surfaisi chapter that the debt can be converted into equity right the debt can be converted into equity so if there is any particular bank etc any financial creditor whose debt was converted into equity and because of that because of that that particular bank is interested or that particular financial creditor is a related party so they are telling that if uh, this if this was a case with a financial sector regulator means with the banks etc then in that case they can still form part they can still form part of the coc because why did they became related why did they become or how did they became related they became related because of conversion of their debt into shares and which happened as per the law itself so they cannot be called as a related person right okay now listen some important pointers here some important pointers here just try to understand some important pointers here now there is something called as now there is this was all about your constitution of the coc okay this was all about your constitution of the coc now just try to understand i'm just telling you some important pointers here i am going to tell you some important pointers about the coc and the authorized representative okay see whenever we are sitting okay whenever we are sitting whenever we are sitting in the coc either we can sit ourselves well that, uh, that is uh, we ourselves can come and uh, sit in the coc or we can appoint or we can appoint an authorized representative okay or we can appoint an authorized representative who can come and sit on our behalf right now listen just try to understand suppose in the case of consortium financing okay in the case of consortium financing consortium financing we had already discussed in surfaisi chapter or somewhere before we had discussed that where many of the banks where many of the banks come together and they fund a single person right they come and they fund a single person so now what are they trying to tell us here is uh, whenever it is a case of consortium financing okay whenever there is a case of consortium financing in that case each bank each bank can appoint its own authorized representative okay each bank can appoint its own authorized representative at their own cost at their respective cost they can appoint an authorized representative who can go and sit in the coc okay but here the cost of the authorized representative will be borne by the same person who is appointing that is it will be borne by the banks itself right then going on to the next one going on to the next one going on to the next one next one is say for example if the financial creditors are debenture holders okay if the financial creditors are debenture holders then generally generally the debenture trustee okay then generally the debenture trustee acts as an authorized representative okay then the debenture trustee acts as an authorized representative and here the cost if suppose the debenture trustee asks for any some more expenses because he is going to represent as an authorized representative here in ibc also so then the cost will be borne by the debenture holders also again 
okay just like the appointer okay the person who appoints them that person that particular person is going to that particular person is going to bear the cost of this authorized representative okay now here whenever the debenture holders go and make an application okay debenture holders are the financial creditors okay so whenever the debenture holders go and make an application so now there should be at least 100 debenture holders okay i am talking about the numbers there should be at least 100 debenture holders or 10 percent of the total debenture holders whichever is lower at least these many of them at least these many of them should be agreeable remember i told you when we were doing section number seven that there is going to be an amendment in this so at least these many of them should go and make an application okay these many of them should go and make an application this was not the case for consortium financing okay this was not the case for consortium financing consortium financing we had seen that individual persons can appoint their own authorized representative and they will represent their case in the coc or they will represent their share in the coc going on to the other creditors okay going on to the other type of creditors other type of creditors where there is a particular class of creditors or there is a particular type of creditors where we have more than 10 creditors in a particular class okay example example we are talking about the financial creditors only okay in financial creditors if we are talking about say for example other unsecured financial creditors and in a particular class if we have more than 10 okay if we have more than 10 then in that case then in that case there also they are telling that if they want to initiate cirp okay if they want to initiate cirp then then in that case at least 100 of them or 10 percent of the people in that class whichever is lower 100 number in terms of number i am telling you 100 such creditors or 10 percent of the total number of creditors in that class at least these many of them have to go and make an application to the adjudicating authority if they want to uh, initiate crp okay whenever we have this other class coming up here then their representation in coc okay their representation in coc will be by, by way of an authorized representative again an authorized representative will be appointed and that particular person is going to represent uh, the other creditors in the coc and the amount that is being payable to the authorized representative okay the amount that is being payable to the authorized representative that will be treated as a process cost okay that will be treated as an insolvency process cost that won't be borne by these particular creditors that will be treated as an insolvency process cost right and whenever these people vote okay whenever these debenture holders whenever these other creditors etc whenever they vote their vote is represented by more than 50 percent okay their vote is represented by more than 50 percent ma'am what do you mean by more than 50 percent okay say for example if we talk about the debenture holders okay now on behalf of debenture holders all the debenture trustees etc the debenture trustees are going to vote so debenture trustees if all the if in the debenture holders if more than 50 percent people say yes then even the debenture trustee will say yes means we are not going to see the individual voting of each and every debenture holder we are going to check cumulatively okay in the debenture holders if more than 50 percent people say yes then in that case it will be treated as a yes okay this is going to happen in case of debenture holders this is going to happen in case of other creditors but in case of consortium financing in case of consortium financing it will be individual okay in case of consortium financing it will be individual in case of withdrawal of application okay in case of withdrawal of application you remember where we had uh, the right to withdraw application by voting of 90 percent there also it is going to be an individual voting okay there also it is going to be an individual voting but in case of debenture holders, in case of creditors, basically where there is a group coming up, okay, there we are going to have a uh, overall voting of more than 50%, right? So this was basically, this was basically talking about, this was basically talking about the COC, this was talking about the authorized representative. Now, once all this is done, okay, now just try to understand, just try to understand, once all this is, all this is done, after that, see, we have constituted the COC, right? once the coc is constituted after that once the coc is constituted after that we are going to conduct we are going to conduct the first meeting of the coc okay once the coc is made after that we are going to conduct the first meeting of the coc here the coc here the irp is going to have a very important interest okay irp is going to have a very important interest in this particular uh, first meeting of coc because here it, it will decide the future of this particular irp if the IRP is working good and if the COC is satisfied, then in that case, this IRP will be converted into RP. 
or this IRP will be appointed as the RP. Basically, in the first meeting of COC, basically in the first meeting of COC, we appoint the RP. We appoint the resolution professional. Okay. Uh, either the same person, either the person who was acting as an IRP, either that same person can be appointed. If he gives his consent and if the COC thinks by voting of at least 66% that yes, this person was doing a good work, then in that case, that way it will be done. Or if we think that a new person should be appointed, okay, if we think that a new person should be appointed, then no problem, then no problem, the COC can decide, the COC can decide, it can go and file an application to the adjudicating authority, AA will take the recommendation from the IBBI within a period of 10 days and a new person can be appointed, no problem in that. Okay, so there are two ways basically, there are two ways basically, uh, either the same person who was acting as an IRP, either the same person who was acting as an IRP, that person, that particular person can continue as a RP if he gives his consent and plus if the COC approves or if suppose uh, the COC does not want that particular person to appoint, to get appointed as a RP, then we are going to appoint a new person. Okay, this is happening, this appointment of RP is happening under section number 22. Okay, this is the place where the tenure of the IRP gets over and the new tenure of the RP starts, right? Now, this first meeting of the COC is conducted within a period of 7 days. Okay, just try to understand here. The first meeting of the COC is conducted within 7 days from the day when you formed a COC. Okay, the, the, the day when you completed your formation of COC from that day within a period of 7 days, the first meeting of COC must be conducted. This is very, very crucial. Now, now listen, now listen, the important point coming up now is whenever, whenever the RP, now the RP has already come into picture, now the RP is going to start the CIRP, okay, the RP is going to start the CIRP, he will take the handover, he will take the handover of all the books, papers, etc. from the IRP, if at all he was a different person, okay, he is going to take all the control in his hands, he is going to take all the assets in his hands, he is going to take all the documents in his hands, etc. And now, and now he is going to continue the business. Okay, he is going to continue the business of the corporate debtor as a going concern. As a going concern, he has to continue the business of the corporate debtor. And it is a responsibility of the IRP also. Okay, it is a responsibility of the IRP also to, IRP also to provide all the necessary information to the RP. We have to provide all the necessary information to the RP. This is the most important point here. Because now see, there is a continuation. Okay, there is a chain which is happening. Initially, everything was there with the corporate debtor. Then corporate debtor was a defaulter. So, everything came in the hands of the IRP. Now, IRP has gone in from the picture. So, now everything is going to come in the hands of the resolution profession. Okay, now listen. To take varied decisions, to decide on some things, to discuss on some things, COC meetings can be called frequently. Okay, the purpose of the first meeting was basically to appoint a RP. But after that also we can conduct. Okay, after that also we can conduct the meetings of the COC. Okay, meetings of the COC can be called either physically or it can be called electronically. No problem in that. A particular prescribed quorum should be present in the COC. We are going to study in the other part of the chapter. In the COC, there should be a quorum of at least 33%. 33% of the creditors, 33% of the members of the COC must be present in this particular meeting so as to form a proper quorum. Now, the meeting. The meeting will be attended by who all? First of all, the notice will be issued. See, first of all, the notice has to be issued to all the members of the COC because they will at least come and sit in the meeting. Then it will be issued to the ex-management also, that is to the ex-board of directors, etc. also. Then after that, the notice is also supposed to be issued to the operational creditors. Okay, operational creditors whose debt is more than or equal to 10% of the total debt. Okay, whose debt is more than or equal to 10% of the total debt. So, the notice is issued to all these people. But see, the most important people who have to come and attend the meeting is the members of the COC. Rest others, that is the operational creators or uh, say for example, the ex-management etc. Even if they don't attend the meeting, that is absolutely alright. Okay, that is absolutely alright. Now, now uh, they are given your section number 25 is a one-time read. You can just read it on your own. Section number 25 basically talks about the duties of the RP. Now, what all things will be done by the RP? See, now it will first of all take all the assets in its custody. It will protect all those assets. It will preserve all those assets. Okay, it will take all the documents. It will take all the financials into its custody. If required for doing its business, it can raise interim finances. Okay, it will collect the claims. Uh, it will check the claims which was collected from the creditors. Right, it will prepare. Now listen, now listen, a few important pointers here. Okay, a few important pointers here. The insolvency professional, the uh, resolution professional, we can say, 
this person is going to prepare a document okay this person is going to prepare a document called as information memorandum okay this person is going to prepare a document called as information memorandum information memorandum is such a piece of paper which contains some relevant information about the corporate debtor by using which okay by using we are going to prepare a resolution plan okay by using uh, that particular information memorandum some person is going to prepare a resolution plan some person is going to prepare a resolution plan okay so it is basically a piece of paper which con which contains some relevant information okay which contains some relevant information so this information memorandum will be prepared by the resolution professional and now it is going to invite now it is going to invite people called as resolution applicant okay now it is going to invite certain person called as resolution applicant ma'am what do you mean by resolution applicant resolution applicant are those people who wish to prepare a resolution plan okay resolution applicant are those people who wish to prepare a resolution plan so basically see i as a rp i as a rp i have prepared a resolution uh, i have prepared an information memorandum which contains all the data about the corporate debtor now i am going to invite some people to prepare a plan see rp does not prepare the plan okay rp does not prepare the plan the plan is prepared by the resolution applicant resolution applicant will prepare the plan on the basis of the information memorandum okay the information memorandum which is given by the rp on that basis it is going to prepare the plan and after preparing the plan the plan again comes to the resolution professional three factor authentication is going to happen okay three factor authentication is going to happen that is first the plan comes to the rp then the plan go, goes to the adjudicating authority and then sorry first it comes to the rp then it goes to the coc and then it goes to the adjudicating authority okay so now the resolution applicant will come into picture he will submit the plan to the rp first right it will submit the plan to the rp first authorized representative pointers we have already done authorized representative remember that uh, more than 50% etc all those things that point has already been done here basically any particular meeting can be attended okay any particular meeting can be attended by any authorized person any meeting can be attended by any authorized person if any person has appointed any person as an authorized person right now suppose during the process if we think that no our rp is not working properly or our rp is not capable of handling this particular case then the rp can be replaced also okay then the rp can be replaced also how will the rp be replaced again again by a voting of again by a voting of how much again by a voting of at least 66% okay again by a voting of 66% the rp can be replaced a new rp can be appointed coc can submit a name recommendation to the adjudicating authority aa will get it confirmed from the ibbi and that new person that new person can be appointed as the new rp okay then again the handover thing is going to happen from the old rp to the new rp the handover thing is going to Okay, now listen. Now listen. RP has got certain powers. Okay, if required, if required, RP can appoint a valuation officer. If required, RP can take the help of professionals. Example, it can take the help of lawyers. It can take the help of chartered accountants. It can take the help of valuers, etc. Okay, then it will take the custody. Obviously, the custody of the assets are there with the RP only. Okay, it can change the MOA, AOA if required. It can change the shareholding pattern if required. means it can change the capital structure if required it can raise more funds if required it can raise more interim finances if required and so on and so forth there are some powers which are there with the resolution professional there are some powers which are there with the resolution professional which can be exercised okay these powers can be exercised by the resolution professional only after only after it has obtained only after it has obtained the approval from the coc okay coc is going to approve the approve it by a voting of at least 66% and then and then only the rp can exercise those powers okay now listen going on to the plan okay everyone now going on to the plan what are they telling for the plan see now we want the plan to be made because first of all we are going to try for resolution right first of all we are going to try for resolution and then only liquidation can happen if the plan is not successful then only the, it can lead to liquidation etc so for the plan first of all the basic document that is required is the information memorandum okay the basic document which is required is the information memorandum which contains all the data about the corporate debtor okay it contains all the data about the corporate debtor and this information memorandum will be prepared by the resolution professional rp is going to prepare the information memorandum and it is going to give it okay information memorandum will be given to whom information memorandum will be given to the 
रेजोल्यूशन एप्लीकेंट रेजोल्यूशन एप्लीकेंट वॉज होम द पर्सन हु वॉज रेडी द पर्सन वॉज रेडी टू प्रिपेयर अ प्लान राइट नाउ लिसन हु के नॉट बी अ रेजोल्यूशन एप्लीकेंट जस्ट ट्राई टू अंडरस्टैंड जस्ट ट्राई टू अंडरस्टैंड आई एम समराइजिंग दीज प्रोविजन फॉर यू हु के नॉट बी अर और हु कैन बी और हु के नॉट बी अ रेजोल्यूशन एप्लीकेंट ओके नाउ देर आर देर आर सर्टन पीपल हु देमसेल्स आर डिफॉल्टर्स ओके देर आर सर्टन पीपल हु देमसेल्स आर डिफॉल्टर्स दे के नॉट बी द रेजोल्यूशन एप्लीकेंट See, you are not able to handle yourself itself. Then how can you prepare a resolution plan for some other person? Right? Suppose if you are an insolvent person, you cannot be a resolution applicant. Okay? If you are a willful defaulter, as per RBI guidelines. Okay? If you are a willful defaulter, as per RBI guidelines, you cannot be a resolution applicant. Okay? If your own account has been classified as NPA, your own debt has been classified as NPA, or the person whom you are controlling. or the person whose accounts you are managing that person's account is classified as npa okay or you are a promoter of such a person whose accounts has been classified as npa then then in that case you cannot be you cannot act as an insol you cannot act as a resolution applicant because the accounts which you are managing those account itself are npa so how are you going to manage the cd's account how are you going to manage the cd's account right but this npa classification should be going on since the last one year means since the last one year okay since the last one year from the the date when the process had started okay the date when the process had started before that at least for the last one year the account has been classified as npa okay but in case of npa but in case of npa if the resolution applicant decides to pay the amount if he wants to clear off the dues before submitting the plan before submitting the plan if he agrees to pay off his dues etc then in that case he is no more a defaulter he can become a resolution applicant okay or then if any particular person has been arrested if any particular person has been liable for imprisonment under some specific acts then that particular person is uh, not allowed to become a or that particular person is ineligible to become a resolution applicant after he is released from the jail okay after he is released from the jail even after that there is a, a cooling period of 2 years okay a cooling period of 2 years should be served only after that he can become a resolution applicant if any other person has been uh, you know prohibited by sebi if any person has been prohibited by sebi from accessing the securities market if any person is disqualified to become a uh, if any person is disqualified to become a director in any particular corporate debtor if any particular person is a defaulting guarantor means who had given the guarantee any person had given the guarantee for this corporate debtor and he did not he did not you know what uh, Uh, exercise his guarantee, or he did not pay the money when we asked for the money. So a defaulting guarantor. These people, these people are already sit. They have already sat and they have already done the default. So they cannot become the resolution applicant. Okay, if there was any promoter, any defaulting promoter, any defaulting directors in the company, those people cannot become. Those people cannot become the resolution applicant. Or if any such pointers are attracted, if any such pointers are attracted outside India. Okay, if uh, suppose uh, the international securities market has debarred us, if any international securities market has prohibited us, then in that case, same disqualification is attracted, but as per the foreign laws. So in that case also, so in that case also, that particular person cannot act as a resolution applicant. Or if say for example, I am a eligible person. Okay, I am a eligible person, but I have a connected person. Okay, I have a related person who is disqualified. i am not disqualified but my connected person is disqualified then in that case even i will be disqualified okay if i have a connected person who is disqualified then in that case even i will be disqualified these were the important pointers these were the important pointers from section number 29 okay now listen once the plan is made okay once the plan is made once the resolution plan is made after that after that the resolution applicant okay the resolution applicant is going to submit the plan the resolution applicant is going to submit the plan to the rp right the resolution applicant is going to submit the plan to the rp rp is going to do some primary checks okay rp is going to do some primary checks ma'am what primary checks will the rp do he will check whether insolvency pro, uh, insolvency cost has been provided for payment or not means in the plan is it have they mentioned that how are they going to meet the insolvency process cost okay whether the debts of the oc has been considered or not they should not get anything less because see they had some less representation so they should not get anything less okay the dissenting financial creditors the dissenting financial creditors debts has been considered or not 
okay how is the plan going to be implemented will the plan be supervised in the future has the plan provided for that whether the plan is not uh, contravening whether the plan is not contravening any provisions of the law na whether the plan is not uh, or the plan has met all the ibbi requirements or not okay these basic things these basic things will be checked by whom these basic things will be checked by the uh, resolution professional okay this will be checked by the resolution professional now listen if the resolution professional is satisfied okay just try to understand if the resolution professional is satisfied then in that case the resolution professional is going to present the plan the resolution professional is going to present the plan before the coc remember three factor authentication first now it was approved by the rp if a what if rp does not approve it we will take another plan if we have the time left with us we will take another plan okay if the rp approves the plan then the plan goes to the coc coc if they want to approve it they will vote they will vote by a voting share of 40% uh, by a voting share of 66% by a voting share of 66% they are going to vote okay if we get a voting share of at least 66% for yes that yes we want to implement this particular plan then the plan will be implemented generally the coc also checks those basic things only which the rp had checked and after that the plan will be implemented by the coc or the plan will be approved by the coc okay now just try to understand once the coc once the coc approves the plan okay once the coc approves the plan then the rp is going to place the plan before the adjudicating authority on behalf of the coc okay rp is only going to come into picture rp is going to place the plan rp is going to place the plan before the adjudicating authority on behalf of the coc right now listen the plan can consist of anything okay the plan can consist of the plan can consist of internal reconstruction the plan can consist of external reconstruction it can be any such thing finally the plan is presented finally the plan is presented before whom finally the plan is presented before the adjudicating authority okay if the adjudicating authority says that okay the plan is perfect no problem in that see adjudicating authority will not check whether the plan is you know uh, viable or not it will not check our business thing etc but it will check the legal requirements whether all the legal requirements have been met or not whether all the ibbi requirements have been met or not whether uh, whether uh, you know uh, oc's debt has been provided or not it will check all those things if it if it is satisfied then the aa is going to approve the plan okay then in that case the aa is going to approve the plan once the aa approves the plan okay see there can be two things if it is satisfied then it will approve if it is not satisfied then it will directly reject if it is satisfied then no problem all good but if it rejects the plan okay if it rejects the plan then it will directly lead to what if aa rejects the plan then it will directly lead to liquidation okay it will directly lead to liquidation if aa approves it if aa approves it then in that case now the moratorium has come to an end finally the moratorium has come to an end finally the cirp has come to an end all the data will be submitted to the ibbi so that the ibbi can put in the information utility for future reference okay we will take the approval of all the necessary authorities okay by whom we were regulated we will take the necessary authority uh, we will take the approval of the necessary authorities within a period of 1 year okay whenever the aa approves it from that day within a period of 1 year the ra ra will take the approval ra will take the approval from all the necessary authorities example it can be roc it can be sebi etc and suppose if suppose if the plan provides for merger amalgamation okay suppose if the resolution plan provide for merger amalgamation etc where competition act also gets applicable okay you will study this in your elective subject okay where the competition act gets applicable then we have to take the approval from the competition commission of india also we have we will take the approval from the cci also okay we will take the approval from the cci also then after that after that suppose if uh, aa has accepted the plan okay suppose if aa has accepted the plan or if aa has rejected the plan if any particular order has been passed by the adjudicating authority and and suppose if suppose if we think that okay suppose if say for example aa has accepted the plan but if any particular person okay any particular person thinks that any particular person thinks that no the plan is in contravention of law no the uh, uh, you know the dues of oc was not considered no the rp did not work properly during the implementation or the requirements of ibbi was not fulfilled then to the aa has accepted the plan then in that case then in that case what is going to happen we can go and file an appeal we can go and file an appeal before whom we can go and file an appeal before the nclat against the order of the adjudicating authority 
it can be against approval also it can be against rejection also but we can go and file an appeal before the nclat okay we do not have any further procedure that within how many days etc we are supposed to file we just have the procedure last year that appeal can be filed okay that appeal can be filed just remember that much okay section number 32a i have left section number 32a i have left let's let, let's wait for the rtp to notify this particular section and then we are going to do this okay now listen suppose if the plan is rejected suppose if the plan is rejected then in that case i told you it will lead to liquidation suppose if the plan was not approved within 180 days plus 90 or that 330 days then it will lead to liquidation or if the coc has passed an order by voting of 66% that we want to liquidate then in that case it will be liquidated right okay so basically basically and last one more thing last one more thing suppose if the plan was approved okay but the uh, your corporate debtor okay but the corporate debtor violates the plan okay it violates the provisions of the plan then any other affected person okay any other affected person like ocfc they can apply for liquidation okay so these were the four cases these were the four cases which can lead to liquidation if the process could not get completed within that 180 plus 90 days or if, if the plan was rejected by the aa if the coc themselves have voted by 66% that they wish to liquidate or if the cd has contravened the provisions of the plan and later on the affected persons can go and make an application for liquidation okay then in that case then in that case it is going to lead then in that case it is going to lead for liquidation okay it is going to lead to liquidation now if it comes for liquidation if it comes for liquidation now we will require a person called as liquidator okay now we are going to require a person called as liquidator now this particular liquidator what is this liquidator going to do okay what is this liquidator going to do this first of all who will be appointed as a liquidator first of all by default that rp will be appointed as a liquidator imagine first irp to rp and now then rp to the liquidator so that same person can be appointed as a liquidator if everyone is okay with that and if the liquidator gives his consent if we want to appoint a new person or if we do not want to appoint that old liquidator then in that case again we are going to take a new name recommendation from the ibbi ibbi will give the name, name recommendation within a period of 10 days and then the new person after taking his consent that person can can be uh, can act as a liquidator okay now what will be the important works of the liquidator important work of the liquidator will be now it will start again start correcting the claims right it will start checking the claims it will start taking all the assets in its custody it will start taking the books of accounts in its custody then it will start selling of the assets first it will value the assets maybe it can get it valued from the valuer and then it will start selling of the assets it will start realizing the money it will start paying to the creditors etc but just remember one thing whenever it sells off any assets okay whenever it sells off any assets it should not sell it to a disqualified person under section 29a the person who was disqualified the person who was disqualified to act as a resolution applicant the person who was disqualified to act as a resolution applicant we cannot sell to that person because if we sell then there is a high risk that whether we will be able to recover the money from that particular person or not right so now listen everything is in whose control everything is in the control of the liquidator earlier everything was in the control of the rp before that everything was in the control of the irp right now one common point here whenever any particular creditor asks for any information from the liquidator liquidator has to make that information available within a period of 7 days okay see all the information is with whom all the information was either with the irp or with the rp or with the liquidator so if the creditor asks for any information then it is the responsibility then it is the responsibility of the liquidator to provide that information within a period of 7 days okay this is a common point for rp also this is a common po point for liquidation also now listen now listen liquidator when he start selling of the assets etc he start selling of those assets which form part of liquidation estate okay which assets form part of liquidation estate any assets over which the corporate debtor has ownership okay any asset which is owned by me that is my liquidation estate that will form part of my liquidation estate okay any of the asset over which i have ownership but which is kept with some other person the, just the ownership is with some other person owner so just the possession is with some other person ownership is still with me so it will form part of my liquidation estate okay any assets of my branch will form part of my liquidation estate but any assets of the subsidiary or associate won't form part of my liquidation estate okay any assets which are not free to sell example debenture redemption investments sinking fund investments the ownership is with me only na so now it will form part of my liquidation estate 
ओके एनी कैश बैलेंस बैंक बैलेंस एक्सेट्रा एनी मनी रियलाइज बाय सेल ऑफ स्टॉक एक्सेट्रा इवन दीज विल फॉर्म पार्ट ऑफ द लिक्विडेशन एस्टेट राइट नाउ नाउ आई टोल्ड यू एसेट्स ऑफ द सब्सिडरी एसेट्स ऑफ द एसोसिएट दीज वोन फॉर्म पार्ट ऑफ द लिक्विडेशन एस्टेट ओके एनी मनी केप्ट फॉर द प्रोविडेंट फंड एम्प्लॉय प्रोविडेंट फंड एम्प्लॉय ग्रेचुटी फंड दैट वोन फॉर्म पार्ट ऑफ द लिक्विडेशन एस्टेट ओके पर्सनल एसेट्स ऑफ द शेयर होल्डर्स पर्सनल एसेट्स ऑफ द पार्टनर्स दे वोन फॉर्म पार्ट ऑफ द लिक्विडेशन एस्टेट ओके एनी एसेट ऑफ योर केप्ट विद माय पोजेशन और केप्ट इन माय पोजेशन ओनरशिप इज विद समन अदर सम अदर पर्सन बट इट इज केप्ट इन माय पोजेशन दैट इज नॉट गोइंग टू फॉर्म पार्ट ऑफ माय लिक्विडेशन एस्टेट बिकॉज 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 द ओनरशिप इज नॉट विथ मी ओके सो बेसिकली द एसेट्स हुज ओनरशिप इज विथ मी बेसिकली द एसेट हुज ओनरशिप इज विथ मी ओनली दोज एसेट्स वुड फॉर्म पार्ट ऑफ द लिक्विडेशन एस्टेट Okay, now, now here the liquidator. Liquidator has got the powers. Okay, liquidator has got the powers to access information from any damn place. Okay, now see whenever liquidator wants to collect any proof, whenever the liquidator wants to collect any evidence, etc., it can go and access the database of the ROC also. It can go and access the database of the central government, state government, local authority, information utility, etc. It can go and access the database of any other person. okay liquidator is the last and the final person see he is going to close down the company now before doing that before doing that if he requires any information okay before doing that if he requires any information he can gather it from any other law he can gather it from any other law no separate approvals no separate agreements etc is required okay now all the data comes to whom all the data comes in the hands of the liquidator right all the data comes in the hands of the liquidator so can you answer one thing now if all the data comes in the hands of the liquidator and now if the creditor asks for any information okay now if the creditor asks for any information then the liquidator will have to provide that information within a period of 7 days okay now listen now the liquidator has gathered okay now the liquidator has gathered all the relevant data right now he will start collecting the claims from the creditors okay it will collect the claims within a period of 30 days okay the day when the liquidator was appointed from that day within a period of 30 days he will collect all the claims he will start verifying the claims if there is any particular creditor who wants to uh, alter his claim or who wants to withdraw his claim suppose he had done any wrong claim and now he wishes to withdraw it then that can be done within 14 days whenever he had submitted it from that day within a period of 14 days the creditor can alter it or the creditor can withdraw it and once all these things are done okay once all these things are done now the liquidator will finally accept the claim or it will reject the claim okay it will accept the claim or reject the claim within a period of 7 days okay once the creditors are final once the creditors have finally submitted their claims after that within a period of 7 days the liquidator will finalize that okay this is the list of creditors to whom we are supposed to pay the money okay if the creditor is agreed if the creditor is aggrieved if the creditor is aggrieved if the creditor is aggrieved that his claim is you know not proper or if the uh, if uh, less amount of claim has been accepted etc then in that case okay then in that case we can go and file an appeal to the adjudicating authority okay we can go and file an appeal to the adjudicating authority against against the uh, acceptance of claim by the liquidator suppose if suppose if the liquidator has accepted lesser amount of claim or the liquidator has rejected our claim then in that case can i say the creditor would be aggrieved so the creditor can go and file an appeal to the adjudicating authority right now now a few important sections here especially section number 52 and 53 two very very important sections whenever now see now it is final now it is final that to whom all are we supposed to go and pay the money okay to whom all are we going to go and go and pay the money Okay, now when it comes to the secured creditors, okay, when it comes to the secured creditors, then in that case, secured creditors are those creditors who are having some asset as security. So now they have two options: either they can relinquish the asset to the liquidator, okay, that is one option. They can relinquish their asset to the liquidator, or they can sell off the asset and realize the money from that particular asset. Okay, if they relinquish their security, listen, if they relinquish their security. so now the liquidator is going to pay them as per the sequence given in section number 53 okay they are going to pay him as per the sequence given in uh, given under section number 53 okay but otherwise otherwise suppose if he if the if the creditor thinks that he will himself sell the assets and he will realize the money from that then in that case then in that case there can be two possibilities either he will get a surplus from the asset or he will get a deficit 
Okay, if he gets a surplus from the asset, he has to hand over the surplus to the liquidity. He cannot eat. Okay, or if he and if he gets a deficit, then the balancing amount he can still recover it from the liquidity. So the conclusion is, secured creditor is anyhow going to get his full money. Obviously, if we have that much money in our liquidation estate, but he is going to get his full money, right? Now, now coming on to the distribution of assets, the most important section here, distribution of assets. That is, what will be the sequence of payment? Okay, what will be the sequence of payment? Now, in that, in that, there is a particular priority. There is a particular sequence of payment applicable here. First of all, first of all, the process cost will be paid. Okay, first of all, the insolvency process cost and the liquidation process cost. Any expenses incurred during the process that will be paid. Not the liquidator's remuneration. I am not talking about liquidator's remuneration. I am talking about the cost. Insolvency process cost and the liquidation process cost. First of all, that will be paid. Okay, second one. Second thing that will be paid will be two things in pari paso. Okay, two things in pari paso will be there. First of all, a dues of the workmen. Okay, dues of the workmen of the last 24 months. Last 24 months means just before the liquidation commencement date or just before the date when the liquidation process had started or when the liquidator was appointed just before that of the last 24 months the dues of the workmen would be paid then uh, that will be pari pasu with the secured creditors who have relinquished who just gave who just relinquished their securities okay these both will be paid in pari pasu that is if suppose we have any deficit of funds then these will be paid proportionately right after this we are going to pay to the employees for the last 12 months Okay, after this, we are going to pay to the other employees for the last 12 months. See, first we paid to the workmen. Now we are paying it. See, I have written it in the block. Okay, then we are going going and uh, we are going to go and pay to them in the uh, for the last 12 months in the third priority. After that, we are going to pay to the unsecured financial debts. Okay, we are going to pay to the unsecured financial creditors. Okay, unsecured financial creditors. See, secured financial creditors, we have already dealt with them, right? And now we are talking about the unsecured financial creditors. We are going to pay to them. Then in the fifth one, in the fifth one, we are going to do pari pasu with two persons. First one is the government taxes for the last two years, and the next one is to the deficit. Remember, in the secured creditors, if we have got the deficit, then to those we are going to pay it here. Okay, so basically, secured creditors are done, unsecured financial creditors are done, employees are done, workmen are done, then government taxes are done. So now who is left? The other creditors. Right, so the other creditors, other OCs, other OCs, other operational creditors would be paid here. Then the workmen of before 24 months would be paid here. Employees before 12 months would be paid here. Government taxes prior to 2 years would be paid here. All those would be paid in the 6th sequence here. And then, and then in the 7th point, in the 7th point, we have the preference shareholders. Uh, if, we, if, if, if it's a company, then we'll have preference shareholders. We'll have preference shareholders, we are going to pay to them. We are going to pay to them if we have any. And last, if we have any money left, if we have any money left, then we are going to pay it to the equity shareholders. Right? So these are the eight pointers. These are the eight pointers, or these are the eight pointers in the sequence in which we have to compulsorily. Okay, if we are following IBC, if we are following IBC, if we are following IBC, then we have to compulsorily follow this particular sequence. Okay, we have to compulsory follow. We have to compulsorily follow this particular sequence. Okay, so now I'm just repeating. I'm just repeating the sequence once more without looking into the book. You can just try along with me. First one was the insolvency process cost and the liquidation process cost. Second one was pari pasu, that is workmen dues for the last 24 months and secured creditors who have relinquished their security. Third one was the amount payable, amount payable to the employees for the last amount payable to the employees for the last 12 months. Okay, then fourth one, fourth one was uh, about the unsecured financial creditors. Fifth one, again we have pari pasu, that is government taxes of the last two years and the amount payable to the secured creditors in case of deficit. Sixth point was any other creditors left out. Seventh one was preference shareholders and the eighth one is your equity shareholders. Okay, this is a sequence that we are supposed to follow. This is a sequence that we are supposed to follow. And liquidator's remuneration will be paid proportionately. Okay, as per the agreement, liquidator's remuneration will be paid proportionately from each and every step. Okay, once all these things are done, okay, once all the assets have been sold, once the balance sheet is zero, after that the liquidator say he will say that my work is done. Okay, liquidator will say that my work is done, and liquidator is going to make an application to the adjudicating authority for passing a dissolution order. Okay, the day when the AA passes that order, that date is treated as the date that as if on this particular date the dissolution has been done 
and this order of dissolution will be submitted to the registered authority example roc it will be uh, you know it has to be given to that particular authority also within a period of 7 days so once the aa passes an order after that within a period of 7 days it should be submitted to the roc because even the roc should know na that this particular company or this particular llp has been totally dissolved right this particular llp or company has been totally dissolved then after that coming on to the next answer next answer is a very different answer stand alone answer the concept of uh, insolvency has totally got completed till now next one is talking about the fast track crp okay important very important answer fast track crp fast track crp means they have they have just provided a mechanism in case of some corporate debtors okay they have just provided a mechanism in case of some corporate debtors where they can go where they can go and file an application where they can you know when an uh, 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 what do you say crp can be initiated against a particular corporate debtor and the case will be completed in a very faster manner and in a very time bound manner the case will be completed okay now first of all against whom can we start this fast track crp it can be made only for the small corporate debtors then what do you mean by the small corporate debtor small corporate debtors means any corporate debtor either which is a small company as per the companies act okay any corporate debtor which is a startup or any corporate debtor which is an unlisted company whose assets does not even exceed rupees 1 crore it is such a small it is such a small corporate debtor right so against this corporate debtor the fc oc cd etc they can initiate the fast track crp okay every process etc everything is going to remain the same the only difference here is the process has to get over within a period of 90 days okay the process has to get over within a period of 90 days and here we can get a one time extension okay we can get a one time extension of maximum 45 days okay initially we had studied 180 plus 90 days now we are studying half of that that is 90 days plus 45 days within this much time the case should get over okay no extra time period for litigation etc no nothing doing okay and here if you want an extension okay here if you want an extension of that 45 days here if you want an extension of that 45 days then in that case then in that case uh, rp will have to make an application to the adjudicating authority to satisfy that sir we require an extension of 45 days but only after getting an approval of coc of 75% okay we require an approval of coc of at least 75% till now at maximum places it was 66% okay for withdrawal of application for withdrawal of application it was 90% right everywhere else everywhere else it was 66% and uh, here for fast track extension okay for fast track extension it is going to be 75% so in this way in this way basically the fast track crp has to be completed and if fast track crp if you have opted for fast track crp then it has to be completed within this particular time frame if not completed then straight away it is going to lead to liquidation okay straight away it is going to lead to liquidation please remember that point okay and one more point which i would like to tell you here in between is c for withdrawal of application we required 90% notice right for appointment of rp for replacement of rp for approval of plans for uh, yes for all those things we required 66% of the vote for fast track extension for fast track extension we required 75% voting of the coc right if there is any such section okay if there is any such section where there is no percentage return okay but we require an approval then in that case we are going to see 51% voting okay 51% is residuary just remember 51% is residuary okay and quorum percentage i had mentioned quorum percentage i had mentioned we required 33% person sitting okay we required 33% uh 33% of the members sitting for a proper meet right going on to the next concept going on to the next concept that is voluntary liquidation okay going on to the next concept that is voluntary liquidation now voluntary liquidation was a new concept which was actually introduced on 1st april 2017 okay it was introduced on 1st april 2017 in this particular ibc before this this was contained in different laws and it was also contained for company obviously for company it was contained in the companies act okay it was contained in the companies act so now they have just provided a faster method they are telling that if there is any particular company okay not llp if there is any particular company if there is any particular company which is a non defaulting company means that company is a solvent company if that company is a solvent company and if it simply wants to close down its business okay if it wants to simply close down its business then it can follow the procedure which is given under idc okay just try to differentiate between this answer and the entire thing that we were doing till now till now that corporate person was till now that company was insolvent 
in this particular in this particular case that particular person or that particular company is solvent and it simply wants to close down its business okay in three circumstances it can close down its business when when the shareholder simply passes a special resolution that okay enough now we want to close down our business then the shareholders can pass a special resolution okay or the event or the purpose for which the company was formed that purpose has been achieved then in that case we can close down or there was a particular date which was written in the aoa that we are going to close down our business on so and so date and that particular date has arrived so in these three cases in these three cases basically the uh, company can be voluntarily liquidated but just remember one thing here you should not be insolvent okay here you should not be insolvent you have to be compulsorily solvent then and only then you can go for this voluntary liquidation proceeding okay for that first of all i i'm just telling you the procedure now for that first of all we are going to take a declaration okay we are going to take a declaration from the directors that they have inquired everything into the affairs of the company and the company is having sufficient assets the company is not having any debts or if at all the company has any debts then the company has sufficient assets to pay off the debts okay basically proving that the company is solvent and the company is not the the directors okay majority of the directors are going to declare they are going to sign that they are not liquidating to defraud any person okay they are not just closing it down to defraud any future creditors etc no okay we are doing it in good faith this is what the declaration has to be given by majority of the directors okay along with that declaration along with that declaration we have to attach we have to attach the copies of the financial statement audited financial statements of the last 2 years okay if suppose you were into a uh, picture for the last 1 year only then one year but if suppose if 2 years is possible then attach the audited financial statements of the last 2 years and attach the report of the valuer okay attach the report of the registered valuer who is going to actually value your assets which shows that which which is going to show that your assets that you are solvent okay which is going to show that you are solved once this declaration etc is signed from that day within a period of 4 weeks okay from that day within a period of 4 weeks after that after that we are going to appoint we are going to uh, first of all we have to pass the sr also in all the cases okay you know if we just want to close it down or if that date has arrived or if the purpose is over we have to pass a special resolution and we are going to appoint an insolvency professional who is going to act as a liquidator for us now also can i say we'll have to make our balance sheet zero so now we are going to have a person called as liquidator who who will be appointed here okay suppose if any dues are pending okay suppose if any dues are pending if any outstanding amount to the creditors are pending then in that case along with the special resolution we we'll are we are also supposed to take the approval of the creditors okay we will take two third approval of the creditors in this case okay we will take two third approval of the creditors in this case who are going to satisfy that yes we are going to get our money okay we will take their approval also that yes they are okay with this particular voluntary liquidation okay now after this after this all the liquidation proceedings are going to be completed the assets will be liquidated right the assets will be sold the, if any liabilities etc are there then the liabilities will be paid etc once this is done again the liquidator will be like harsh i have completed my work liquidator will go and make an application to the aa aa will pass the order that order will be called as a dissolution order that dissolution order will be sent that dissolution order will be sent to the roc etc within a period of 14 days okay in liquidation it was sent within 7 days here it is sent within a period of 14 days right and the last answer coming up here is there are going to be three things okay there are going to be three things which are coming up here is first one is about preferential transactions then something called as undervalued transactions and then something called as extortionate credit transaction okay preferential transaction is such a transaction where we are where the corporate debtor has given where the corporate debtor has given some kind of priority okay where the cor corporate debtor has given some a kind of priority by transferring any asset or by transferring any property to the creditor to the surety to the guarantor by giving this particular priority to such person we have put that person in a beneficial position as compared to other creditors okay suppose if liquidation would have happened his place would have been at a later stage but now we have given him but now we have given him a preference okay but now we have given him a preference and by giving him a preference that particular person has been put in a beneficial position 
so they say that this particular transaction is a preferential transaction but just try to understand one thing if this is done in ordinary course of business if this is done in ordinary course of business if there is any agreement etc then there is no problem or if you have been doing this with this particular person or with some category of creditors since a very long time then also there is no problem or if you are transferring any asset for a consideration then also there is no problem okay basically basically no injustice should happen with the other class of creditors right and this preference has been given when this preference has been given either to a related party in the last 2 years or this preference has been given to any other person in the last 1 year okay in the last 2 years or in the last 1 year just before the insolvency commencement date this was already done by whom this preference was already given by whom this preference was already given by the corporate debtor okay then in that case if the rp or the liquidator if the rp or the liquidator comes to know about this then they will make an application to the adjudicating authority that sir so and so preferential transaction was done by the cd before the insolvency commencement so sir please pass an order okay then the adjudicating authority then the adjudicating authority is going to pass an order it is going to reverse the transaction and it is going to declare the transaction as a void transaction right that was your preferential transaction where we were trying to give preference to a particular uh, type of creditor right then going on to the next one that is undervalued transaction well, now what is this undervalued transaction undervalued transaction is if we have <coughs> <coughs> sorry if we have done any transaction if we have done any particular transaction with any person if the corporate debtor has done any transaction with any particular person at a lower value at a significantly lower value if we have done this particular transaction either we have done it at zero value that is a gift transaction has been done or it has been done at a significantly lower value which is way too less than the current market price then obviously there would be some indirect benefits that we would be getting from that particular person so if the rp or the liquidator acha again the time period remains the same here if it was done with the related party during the last 2 years or if, if it was done with with the a non related party in the last 1 year then in that case then in that case if the rp or the liquidator comes to know about this if the rp or the liquidator comes to know about this then they can make an application to the adjudicating authority to declare this particular transaction as void okay this particular transaction as void but suppose now listen one extra point here is one extra point here is if the rp or the liquidator does not come to know about this but the members the creditors etc if they come to know about this that such thing was done if the shareholders etc if they come to know then in that case they will request they will request to the liquidator or the rp that please declare this as void but if the liquidator or the rp totally ignores it totally ignores it then in that case the members creditors etc they can directly jump and they will directly go and make an application to the adjudicating authority and they will give two complaints now okay what two complaints will they give now first of all sir this undervalued transaction was done please declare it as void and second thing sir insolvency professional did not act properly sir insolvency professional did not act properly so sir please take some disciplinary proceedings please initiate some disciplinary proceedings against them right acha now declaring the transaction as void means what declaring the transaction as void means the entire transaction will be reversed okay whatever asset was transferred will be taken back okay whatever whatever benefits was accrued from that even that will be taken back okay if the asset was transferred to a third party if the asset was transferred to a third party then the asset will be recovered from the third party also okay but the exception here is if the third party had acquired it in good faith then we cannot recover then we will recover from the direct person to whom we had transferred okay so basically in short in short we are going to totally reverse the transactions okay in short we are going to totally reverse the transaction and then there is something called as extortionate credit transaction if the cd has done any such extortionate transactions with any particular person during the last 2 years okay here we do not have one year and two year if any particular transaction was done by the corporate debtor during the last 2 years and which involves very huge payments exorbitant payments etc are involved example a very high rate of interest a very high price for the goods a very high price for the goods as compared to the market then in that case again the liquidator again the liquidator or the insolvency profession whatever you want to call that particular person can make an application to the adjudicating authority and the adjudicating authority will declare will reverse such excessive transaction right similarly similarly now there are some other points last few points coming up here 
now they now they are telling us here that if suppose any financial creditor has made an application okay if any particular financial creditor has made an application once then other financial creditor cannot proceed okay other financial creditor cannot proceed to file a crp against the same corporate debtor because what's the point anyway the other financial creditor is going to come and sit in the coc so why to go and make a duplicate application okay but he can submit his claims okay whenever the uh, irp was calling for the claims etc he will submit his claims okay he cannot make a fresh application for crp but he can submit his claims okay just remember that point and another thing another thing here is another thing here is in case of real estate okay in case of real estate there are two things first of all in case of real estate the allottees okay the allottees are treated the allottees are treated as financial creditors the customers are treated as deemed as the financial creditors okay customers are deemed as the financial creditors so customers can also initiate crp okay customers can also initiate crp and one important thing here is in case of real estate now uh, at least 100 100 or 10% of the allottees of that particular project okay 100 allottees or 10% of the total allottees of that particular project at least these many of them should be there to go and file an application for initiating cr okay why would we initiate crp against a builder because maybe we have paid our money but we have not got the possession or we were assured we were assured by a return plan that okay you are going to get so and so interest till possession okay there are such assured return plans where the builder assures the customers that you will get you pay us the entire amount and we will pay you some interest till you get the possession if they had assured but we did not get that assured return then in that case also we can in that case also we can initiate the cirp right acha now another thing is quorum another thing is quorum what quorum was required for the meeting of cr coc at least 33% right at least 33% at least 33% of the members of the coc should be there in that particular meeting but for transacting the decisions or for taking the decisions etc we require at different places we require 66% we require 51% we require 75% 90% etc but for conducting a proper meeting we require at least 33% see not all not every meeting not every meeting talks about taking a decision but it can be about discussion also so 33% approval 33% of the members should be there to conduct a proper meeting if 33% is not there then we are going to adjourn the meeting okay we are going to adjourn the meeting to the next day not next week we are going to adjourn it to the next day same time same place etc right and the last answer coming up here is eligibility is the eligibility of the resolution professional and if any particular person is appointed if any particular person is appointed as a resolution professional or if any particular person has been appointed as an insolvency professional then what qualification he should be having first of all they are telling that that particular rp on or his partners or the directors of this ip firm etc they should be totally independent okay they should be totally independent of the corporate debtor otherwise what's the point okay if independence is not there then what's the point this particular person is going to handle the case of the cd so independence should be there okay if if suppose the corporate debtor is a company okay say for example if corporate debtor is a company then in that case insolvency professional should be such a person who is eligible to be appointed as an independent director okay independent director has so many pointers in that which ensures a 100% independence so if the ip is eligible to be appointed as an independent director then he is also eligible to become an insolvency professional okay and in other cases in other cases he should not be a related party okay he should not be the ip should not be a related party of the corporate debtor ip listen now just try to understand ip should not be and ip should not be an employee proprietor or partner of a ca firm cs firm cost auditor firm etc uh, of this this uh, basically ip ip should not be an employee proprietor partner of a ca firm cs firm cost auditor firm who is the ca cs or cost auditor of the corporate debtor okay it should not be its employee proprietor or partner in the last 3 years and also it should not be an employee proprietor or partner of any legal consultancy firm of any legal consultancy firm which is doing the legal advisory of the corporate debtor okay which is doing the legal advisory of the corporate debtor if if such if they have transactions between them if the cd and the legal consultancy firm have the transaction between them of more than or equal to 5% of the turnover of any particular last 3 years okay if the transaction value exceeds if the transaction between the corporate debtor and the legal firm 
if the transaction exceeds a uh, five percent of the is more than or equal to five percent of the turnover of such legal firm, then in that case, if this IP is an employee proprietor or partner of this legal firm, then this IP cannot act as a uh, insolvency professional for the corporate debtor. Okay, so basically they they have established a connection between insolvency professional, corporate debtor, and these CA, CS, cost auditor, and the legal professional firms or the legal advisory firms. They have put all these points. They have all, they have put all these points just to ensure independence. Nothing else. Okay, they can ensure they can ensure independence. They can they have just put these points so that they can ensure independence. Okay. Okay. Another thing. Another thing here is. Initially year it was ten percent. Now it is five percent. Okay, this was amended earlier year. It was ten percent. Now it is five percent. Okay. Now going on to a few case laws. A few case laws. Now uh, one, uh, two to three case laws which I want to tell you are specifically important here. Is first of all in case of a rera. Okay, in case of rera. In case of rera, or in case of real estate, we can say in case of real estate. If we have not got our possession, then CIRP can be initiated. If we have not got the assured return plan, then CIRP can be initiated. Okay. In other cases, in other cases, in other cases, suppose if the case is already going on in RERA. Okay, if the case is already going on in RERA, that is altogether a different chapter. Okay, that is altogether a different chapter. If you fulfill the requirements of IBC, if you fulfill the requirements, see, see, uh, see since this is a financial creditor case, so if there is any dispute which is pending, then there is no problem. So here the case can be initiated. Okay, RERA is a totally different thing. Here the case IBC case can be initiated totally independently if the case if the conditions of IBC is fulfilled. Okay, another thing, another thing here is another thing here is whenever the AA had to intimate. Okay, whenever the AA had to accept the application within a period, accept the application within a period of fourteen days, they are telling that this period of fourteen days and rectifying the application for rectifying the application. Remember, we had got seven days period. We had got seven days period. These two periods, fourteen days and the seven days period, they are telling that it can be treated as a directory period. That is, if there is any sufficient cause, if there is any sufficient cause, if there is any sufficient cause, then in that case, uh, that period can be treated as a directory period. Okay. Another thing. Another thing here is just remember one thing. In case of operational creditor, if any other case is going on or if any arbitration proceedings is going on, then IBC cannot be started. But in case of FC, there was nothing like that. In case of FC, in case of FC, if you prove that there is a default and if the conditions are fulfilled, that is the minimum amount of default etc. is attracted, then in that case, then in that case, IBC can be initiated. And the next most important thing here is about that MBFC thing, which we had already discussed when we were doing about the applicability. If you remember. Right. In case of NBFC, in case of NBFC, if it has got a certificate from the RBI, then it comes at par with the bank. So in that case, IBC will not be applicable. Means no IBC can be initiated against the NBFC, and in all the other cases, IBC can be initiated against the NBFC. So with this, with this, we are completed. We are done with the entire revision. We are done with the entire revision of the IBC. At let's start the super quick revision of the FEMA Act or the FEM Act that is Foreign Exchange Management Act 199. We are going to cover up all the topics. We are going to cover up all the topics except for those three ECB, ODI, and the imports as that has been covered up separately. So uh, let's start with the other super quick other topics of the FEMA Act 199. First of all, FEMA is applicable. FEMA is applicable to whole of India. First of all, FEMA is applicable to whole of India. It applies to all our branches, etc., which is located outside India, which is controlled by a PRI. Okay. First of all, it is applicable to whole of India. Then, if any of our branches, offices, etc., are located outside India, which is controlled by an Indian person or which is controlled by a person resident in India, it is applicable to them also. And if any person goes outside India and commits any contravention outside India, then also FEMA would. apply right now in the definitions now in the definitions a few definitions are very very important here especially especially when we talk about your capital account transactions current account transactions and the pri definitions these three definitions are specifically these three definitions are specifically very very important first of all the capital account transaction capital account transaction how do we define that 
कैपिटल अकाउंट ट्रांजेक्शन इज नथिंग बट एनी ट्रांजेक्शन विच हैज द इफेक्ट ऑफ ऑल्टरिंग और एनी ट्रांजेक्शन विच ऑल्टर द एसेट्स और लाइबिलिटीज इंक्लूडिंग कंटीजेंट लाइबिलिटीज of a pri of a pri which is located outside india the assets liabilities etc located outside india or any transaction which alters the assets or liabilities of a proi of a proi which is located in india if there is any such transaction which is happening then such transaction will be treated as a capital account transaction and uh, it's very simple to say that any transaction which is not a capital account transaction all those transactions all those transactions will be treated all those transactions will be treated as a current account transactions okay they had given a few examples for that example any transactions which are done in ordinary course of business any uh, credit facility availed which is a short term credit facility if we have done any remittances for our parents who are staying abroad if we are making any uh, interest payment of any loans if we are uh, doing any transaction which involves the return on the investment that is interest income on the investments etc if we are incurring any studies expenses any education expenses abroad if we are incurring any travel expenses then these these are specifically given these are specifically deemed to be your current account transactions these are specifically given to be your current account transactions right then going on to the next definition going on to the next definition that is the definition of person now person okay because in uh, because the next definition that we going to study is about the pri and the proi the full form of which is person resident in india and person resident outside india so first we have to understand what is the meaning of the term person so just like your income tax year also person does not only mean an individual person can be individual huf aop bui firm llp aop uh, artificial juridical person or any other uh, office branch agency etc right all these people all these uh, come under the term called as person now now we have now we have one important definition coming up here that is the definition of pri that is person resident in india depending upon which depending upon which depending upon which we are going to decide which transactions are allowed to whom which transactions are restricted to whom etc okay this definition is very very important just try to understand now first of all first of all they are telling that if there is any particular person if there is any particular individual okay now in person pri definition first we are studying about the individual if there is any particular individual who stayed in india for more than 182 days in the last year in the preceding financial year if that person stayed for more than 182 days then in that case then in that case that person will be treated as a pri for the current year okay for the current year that person will be treated as a pri but if any particular person if any particular person has gone outside india okay if any particular person has gone outside india even though the basic condition is fulfilled but then to if that particular person has gone outside india maybe for employment for business or vocation or for an uncertain period for any purpose but for an uncertain period then it is assumed that he has gone outside india for a very long period and that's why he won't be treated as a pri okay because he has gone outside india for a longer period he won't be treated as a pri okay or alternatively alternatively if any person is coming to india if any person is coming to india otherwise than for the same three reasons okay if any person is coming to india otherwise than for the three reasons then that person then that person cannot be treated as a pri example if any person is coming as a tourist to india then in that case that person cannot be treated as a pri because he is coming just for a certain period but if any person is coming to india for business for uh, uh, your employment business vocation employment or for an uncertain period so can i say for longer period for longer period he is coming to india and if he is coming to india for a longer period then in that case that person will be treated as a pr okay this point was applicable for an individual this point was applicable for an individual now for other person say for example if it's a company okay if it's a, a company or if it's a firm etc then if it is incorporated in india if it is registered in india it will always be a pri okay or if say for example if our main office is in india but our branch office agency is located outside india which we are controlling which we are controlling then even that outside branch office etc even that becomes a pri okay or say for example say for example if the main office of a proi if the main office of a proi is situated outside india but it has a branch in india but it has a branch in india which is which is controlled by which is controlled by us 
okay uh, which is controlled by the branch etc is in india which is controlled by the proi which is controlled by the proi the main office is outside india he is controlling the branch in india then too it will be treated as a pri because the location is in india okay so either if the location is in india or if the registration is in india or if the control is in india then in that case then in that case then in that case uh, that particular entity that particular office or we can say that particular person will be treated as a pri okay and again if any person is not a pri if a particular person is not a pri that person will be treated as a pr oi okay that person will be treated as a pr oi then after that after that going on to the next two sections that is section number 3 and section number 4 first of all they are telling in section number 3 they are putting some kind of restrictions okay in section number 3 they are putting some kind of restrictions where they are telling that a particular person cannot deal in forex in illegal manner okay a particular person cannot deal in forex in illegal manner ma'am what do you mean by the term illegal manner okay now you cannot sell or buy forex from any person other than authorized person means if i want to deal in forex then that has to be done through an authorized person only okay next i cannot do any payment on behalf of a nri person okay i cannot do say for example that nri had to pay some amount in india in inr okay but now but now if he makes a payment he'll have to make the payment in dollars and then that, that get uh, in foreign currency and then that gets converted etc so he directly told me to do the payment so i cannot do the payment on his behalf that is totally not allowed okay next one next one i cannot accept any foreign for, uh, forex i cannot accept any forex say for example if there is a student if there is a student who comes to india and says that ma'am i have some forex so please take the fees in forex no i cannot do that okay i can accept forex only through only through an authorized dealer or authorized person and also i cannot enter into any hawala transaction okay i cannot enter into any hawala transaction say for example when i went outside india i did the shopping i did the shopping out of foreign currency which i acquired from my friend who was staying there and then after coming to india i paid cash uh, in inr i paid cash in inr to their relatives in india so this becomes this is totally a, this becomes a prohibited transaction and this is not at all allowed if you want to do any such type of transactions you have to make sure that you have fulfilled all the all the regulations etc given by the rbi or which is given under the fmir and only after that only after complying all those provisions you can enter into the transaction right section number 4 says section number 4 says that any particular person cannot hold forex okay section number 4 says any person cannot hold forex okay except except as provided by the act if the law says if the law says that you can hold this much okay which we are going to study in section number 8 and section number 9 if the law says that you can hold up to a particular limit then you can hold only up to that anything beyond that or anything above that is totally not allowed okay same thing applies for just like i told you for currency same thing applies for your immovable property outside india it applies to foreign security outside india etc whatever is the regulations you have to follow the regulations you have to follow the regulations and only according to that you can hold the foreign assets right that was told that was told in your section number 4 now going on to the next one going on to the next one that is your section number 5 which talks about the current account transactions okay this is very very important section 5 which talks about your current account transaction now here they are telling that first of all to enter into current account transactions to enter into current account transactions permission will be granted okay basically the rbi basically the rbi first primarily it has made it has made the uh, schedules it has made certain schedules it has made certain regulations it has made certain rules which says that which transaction under current account transactions are prohibited which are allowed which are uh, allowed subject to the approvals etc that we are going to study here but primarily they are telling us here that primarily they are telling us here that first of all any traveling expenses to nepal bhutan that is totally not allowed any transaction with a person who is a resident of nepal and bhutan is not allowed because we already know that indian currency works well there and apart from that now going on to the three schedules now going on to the three schedules schedule 1 schedule 1 which talks about schedule 1 which talks about your prohibited transactions in that in that totally we have eight pointers okay in that totally we have eight pointers here what are the eight pointers in this schedule and first of all first of all remittance out of lottery winnings if we have earned any lottery winning here from that you cannot remit any amount outside india second one second one was if we have earned any other casual income that is racing expense uh, racing income riding income etc from that also you cannot remit any amount outside india 
third one you cannot remit any amount outside india for purchase of lottery tickets band magazines football pools etc no for purchasing that you cannot pay any money here from india next one next one is talking about the export commission the export commission that you have paid for doing investment in any subsidiary or joint venture abroad you cannot pay any export commission for exporting the goods outside india because this was a, a direct transaction between you and the other country so that is not allowed you cannot pay any export commission to any agent next one export commission under rupee state credit route is not at all allowed except for tea and tobacco where you can pay a commission up to 10% so these are the five transaction only three left now callback services payment for callback services is not at all allowed dividend payment under dividend balancing system is not allowed excessive dividend is not allowed and the last one is any interest payment any remittance of interest income any remittance of interest income out of the funds which are held in the non resident special uh, rupee scheme account if the non resident has maintained any account in india from that if he has earned any income if he has earned any interest income that interest income cannot be remitted outside india so these are the eight transactions these are the eight transactions which are given in schedule 1 plus along with that don't forget nepal and bhutan these transactions are totally these transactions are totally prohibited right these transactions are totally prohibited <clears throat> when we go to schedule 2 when we go to schedule 2 which we had remembered which we had remembered as per the story code so here so here we are going to get here we are totally going to get nine pointers here we are totally going to get nine pointers first one if you want to do any payment for cultural tours if you want to make any payment for cultural tours then we have to take the approval of the central government first of all in the schedule to whatever we are studying we are supposed to take the approval of the central government and in central government also and in central government also we they have given the respective ministries okay they have given the respective ministries from whom we are specifically supposed to go and take the prior approval okay so now here we are going to revise the transactions here we are going to revise the transactions for which uh, this uh, schedule 2 is applicable okay so first one is payment for cultural tours next one is the payment for advertisement expenses by some specified persons then after that payment for freight vessel payment for freight vessel then payment for payment for imports which are done through ocean transport then payment to our agents who are located outside india then after that container detention charges if our container has got detained then the container detention charges then after that the payment for hiring of transponders if you have hired any transponders uh, by tv channels or by internet service providers then payment for that then after that payment of prize money or payment of sponsorship uh, sponsorship remittance etc by some specific people above a particular limit etc that is going to come up here and last if we have paid any amount for protection and indemnity for protection and indemnity to any insurance club then that is covered up here okay so this way this way total nine transactions total nine transactions are covered up here total nine transactions are covered up here for which as you can see on the right hand side as you can see on the right hand side we have to take the approvals from the respective ministries right we are supposed to take the approvals from the respective ministries going on to the next one going on to the next one that is schedule 3 transaction schedule 3 transaction are those transactions where we are required to take the approval from the rbi okay where we are required to take the approval from the rbi in that they have divided it, it into two parts first part is facilities for individual second part is specifically applicable for persons other than individuals okay in part 1 they say that to an individual liberalized remittance scheme is applicable liberalized remittance scheme means what means that particular person that per that particular individual can draw 2 lakh up to 2 lakh 50000 usd without taking any approval okay any particular individual can draw 2 lakh 50000 usd from the authorized dealer without any approval from the rbi for any of the following purposes okay for any of the following purposes means what for any of the following purposes means for private visit to any country except for nepal bhutan then for gift or donation for emigration for studies abroad for medical treatment for travel expenses for maintenance of any close relatives abroad right then if we are going for employment outside india uh, or or any other current account transactions which were not there in schedule 1 and schedule 2 that is for any other current account transaction if any particular individual wants to incur any expenses then for that totally all these taken together for all these purposes taken together it can draw up to 2 lakh 50000 it can draw up to 2 lakh 50000 usd 
right now listen now listen if you want to draw if you require more than 250000 usd if you require more than 250000 usd then no problem you can take the approval of the rbi you have to take the approval of the rbi and if rbi is satisfied then it will grant you the approval right now if there is any particular person if there is any particular person if there is any particular person who is a pri okay who is a pri but he is not a permanent pri okay means he has come to india for deputation etc he is not a permanent person then whatever salary etc is earning in india he can remit to his country after paying all the respective taxes duties etc in india whatever is applicable in india whatever deductions are applicable in india after paying all those after paying all those he can remit his salary he can remit his net salary to his own country there is no problem in that again now listen the game changer thing the game changer thing whatever we have studied here that is this liberalized remittance scheme that is this liberalized remittance scheme that we have studied that we have studied that this is applicable this is applicable to individuals okay but then there was an amendment in this some time back okay long time back not some time back long time back there was an amendment in this that now this lrs is applicable even to persons other than individual that is person other than individual if they want to incur any current account transaction except for schedule 1 and schedule 2 then even even they can draw up to 250000 usd uh, from the rbi without a, uh, from the authorized dealer without any approval okay now going on to the next one going on to the next one going on to the next one that is facilities for other than individual the pointers which are given up here okay the pointers which are given up here are very specific pointers which are applicable only for other than individuals okay everyone concentrate here first one if these people want to do any donation for some specific purpose okay that is for acquisition of any position in any educational institution or if they are uh, making any donations to any funds which are run by this education institutions or if they are making any donations if they are making any donations to any institute etc which are which are in our same which are in the same activity in which we are involved if i am involved in education and if the other com company is also involved in this education then if we are making any donations to them then in that case up to a particular limit you can draw the forex without taking the approval of rbi okay the limit is the limit is 1% of the foreign exchange earnings for the last 3 years 1% of the foreign exchange earnings for the last 3 years or or 50 lakh us dollars or 50 lakh us dollars whichever is less if you want to donate up to this amount then no problem if you want to donate more than this then you'll have to take the approval of the rbi okay then if you are making any payment for commission to agents who are located outside india okay you are making any payment of commission to any agents outside india for sale of any flats for sale of any flats or plots in india then in that case you can pay a commission of you can pay a commission of 25000 usd you can pay a commission of 25000 usd or 5% of the sale consideration whichever is higher okay up to this amount you can pay without rbi approval if you want to pay lesser uh, up to this amount you can pay without rbi approval if you want to pay more than this then you'll have to take the approval of the rbi uh, okay it was 25000 usd or 5% of the inward remittance whichever is higher whichever is higher if you have uh, availed if you have availed of any consultancy services if you have availed of any consultancy services from outside india and if you wish to pay any consultancy services outside india for infrastructure projects for infrastructure projects then you can pay 1 crore 1 crore us dollars without rbi approval more than that rbi approval is required if you want to pay for any other projects then you can pay up to 10 lakh us dollars you can pay up to 10 lakh us dollars without rbi approval if you want to pay more than that then you can take rbi approval and the last one and the last one if suppose someone has someone from outside india had paid for your pre-incorporation expenses and now you are reimbursing back now you are reimbursing back for those expenses then in that case how much can you reimburse that is five percent of the amount that, that was brought to india by that particular investor or one lakh us dollar whichever is whichever is higher okay five percent of the investment brought into india or one lakh us dollar whichever is higher up to whatever limits we have studied here whatever limits we have studied here this amounts can be paid these amounts can be paid without rbi approval and if you want to pay more than this then we are supposed to take the approval of the rbi okay if you are making the payment if you are making the payment from the rfc account 
for schedule 2 and schedule 3 if you are making the payment from the RFC account then there is no problem no approvals are required okay if you are making the payment from the resident foreign currency account then no approvals are required but if you are making the payment from achha, one more thing if you are making the payment from the EFC account exchange earner foreign currency account exchange earner foreign currency account then also no approval is required but for three payments for three payments for three payments e if you are making the payment from efc then if the limit is exceeded if the limit is exceeded then the approval is required okay what are those three first one is if you are paying under schedule 2 for that protection and indemnity then approval is required if you are making the payment to the agents abroad for uh, as commission for the flats or the plots sold in india for that approval is required and if you are reimbursing the pre-incorporation expenses obviously exceeding the limit uh, then only the approval is required even if even if the amount is paid even if the amount is paid from the EEFC account then also the approval is required okay but only if the limit is exceeded then going on to the next type of transactions that is your capital account transactions okay going on to the next type of transactions that is your capital account transaction first of all capital account transactions will be allowed capital account transactions will be allowed only if it is allowed by the uh, regulations okay only if it is allowed by the capital account transaction regulation then only for that particular purpose you can draw or you can sell the forex from the authorized dealer reserve bank of india reserve bank of india has given has already given which capital account transactions are permitted which are prohibited if it is permitted then it is permitted up to what amount and what are the other other conditions that you have to fulfill when you are undertaking any capital account transactions right for that the list has been already given for that the list has been already given by the reserve bank of india okay now listen now listen you have to follow whenever you are doing any capital account transactions you have to make sure that you follow those regulations in capital account transactions regulations play a very 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 important role if regulations say prohibited then prohibited if regulations say permitted then permitted if regulations say permitted up to 1 lakh usd then permitted only up to 1 lakh usd means whatever is written in the regulations that is full and fine okay now two two uh, specific points two specific points if there is a pri okay if there is a pri if i have purchased a property in india and later on i become a proi then i can still continue to hold my indian property even when i am a proi okay even when i become a proi i can continue to hold i can continue to hold that particular property okay or if say for example i had got i am a proi now i am a proi and i have got some property as uh, inheritance from a PRI. I have got an Indian property by way of inheritance. Then also that's allowed. Okay, means means suppose if you are a PRI, then you if you are a PRI and and if you have acquired any property, if you have acquired any property from outside country, when you were a PROI, then that is allowed. Or if you are a PRI and you've got any property as inheritance from a PROI, even that is allowed no restriction in that no problem in that that is already permitted that is already permitted as per section number six okay similarly similarly if any particular proi wants to establish if any proi wants to establish a place of business in india any branch in india any office in india any entity in india then in that case again we'll have to go and check the rbi regulations for that okay we'll check the fema regulations for that if it permits then allowed if it is not permitted then not allowed if any restrictions then we'll have to follow that right so this was this was all about your section number six that is your capital account transactions now cap in capital account transaction two most important things two most important things first one first one first one is there are certain transactions which does not have any restriction at all Okay, the law has already provided that there is no restriction at all. First one is repayment of loan, that is the amortization of loan. And second one is for depreciation of indirect investments. Okay, if suppose I have done any investments in another country and I am required to maintain a particular amount. And if the amount has fallen, if the market value has fallen, then I will have to maintain a particular amount. If I have to pay some amount for that, then even that is totally allowed okay that is totally allowed that is not at all restricted these are the two these are the two transactions which are allowed with no restrictions okay these are the transactions which are allowed with no restriction then there are five transactions there are five transactions which are totally prohibited for a proi okay these are the five transactions which are totally prohibited for a proi okay if a proi if a proi if a proi is 
uh, first of all, a PRO is prohibited from doing investment in any entity which is engaged into five activities. Either if it is a chit fund company, nidhi company, it is engaged into agriculture plantation activities, it is engaged into real estate or construction of farm houses, or it is trading in TDRs, it is trading in transferable development. Right? These five are totally prohibited. Okay, for chit fund, for chit fund, there can be an exemption which can be given by the RBI where RBI can say that chit fund can accept subscription from NRI through normal banking channels. Okay, just remember in real estate, your townships, your residential properties, road, railway, bridges, your um, REITs, etc. Those are not covered means that is allowed means in that PROI's investment is allowed. Right, so five businesses in which PROI cannot invest: Nidhi Company, Chit Fund Company, Agriculture Plantation, Real Estate and Construction of Farm Houses, and Trading in TDRs. These five are totally prohibited for the PROI. Ma'am, what about the other transactions? All the other transactions, all the other transactions, all the other capital account transactions to be done by the PRI or to be done by the PROI. Okay, all the other capital account transactions to be done by the PRI or by the PROI, those are permitted but subjected to the regulations. Okay, those are permitted but subjected to the regulations. Okay, and one more thing, one more important thing that they are telling us here is the liberalized remittance scheme that we studied now, that is 250,000 US dollars. If there is any balancing limit available there, then that can be used for the capital account transactions also. Okay, that can be used for the permitted capital account transactions also. Okay, means what are they trying to tell us here is that 2,50,000 USD, the limit that was given, that is person specific. Okay, that person, that individual person can use it for current account transaction plus that individual person can use it for capital account transaction taken together. It's not 250 plus 250, it's 250 total. Okay, it's 2,50,000 US dollars total. And there was a temporary restriction which was uh, imposed for doing transactions with Korea. Okay, there was a temporary restriction which was in, uh, which was imposed for doing transactions with Korea that that for, uh, if you have done if uh, first of all you cannot do capital account transactions with them and if you have already done capital account transactions if you have already done capital account transactions with them then please then please close off that transaction within 180 days from the notification date. Okay, please close off that particular transaction please. Uh, uh, what do you say? Uh, suppose if you have done any investments, please liquidate that. Please sell off that. Okay, please do it within 180 days from the date of notification. And the date of notification was 7th March 2019. Okay, you are not allowed to do any transaction with Korea until unless it is further notified by the RBI. Further it is allowed by the RBI. Till that time you cannot do any transaction. Okay, now listen. If there is, if there is, if there is any particular, if there is, any particular PROI, if there is any particular PROI who is an Indian citizen or who is a person of Indian origin, if he is selling an immovable property in India, okay, then he can, he can, uh, after selling, he can repatriate the sale proceeds to his own country. Okay, means he, he is selling the property here, he is earning the money here, he can repatriate the sale proceeds to his own country, but that is restricted, but that is restricted to the amount that he had brought in India for purchase of that particular property. Okay, means the gains, means some amount of gains cannot be repatriated by him to his own country. That has to be retained here in India only or that has to be utilized here in India only. Right, so the, till the amount, uh, whatever amount he had brought, whatever amount he had brought, till that much amount he can take it back to his own country but not the excessive amount. Okay, and when it comes to a residential property, if he has sold multiple residential properties, then the repatriation will be restricted to only two such properties okay repatriation will be restricted to only two such residential properties and the last point suppose if suppose if we have taken a ecb suppose if we have raised money by way of ecb external commercial borrowings from the other country okay if we have raised any money by way of external commercial borrowings from some other country and if we have given and if we have given any uh, asset as mortgage if we have given any asset as mortgage to that external bank to that external bank then and if I default in making the repayment of that particular external commercial borrowing, then then our country's authorized dealer give full rights to the external bank to sell off that property and to realize the money from that. There is no restriction in that. And if they realize any surplus, okay, and if the external bank realizes any surplus, then whatever is the uh, surplus after paying off the loan that has to be repatriated back to India, right? This was, this was all about your capital account transaction. This was all about your capital account transaction. 
Now going on to the next topic which talks about your export transactions. Which talks about your export transaction. <clears throat> yes, everyone here, let's go to the export transaction. Now, whenever we go to whenever we go to export transaction, they are telling that export can be of goods, export can be of services, export can be of softwares, etc. Whenever you are doing any export, you have to make sure that you give a declaration. You give a declaration to the RBI about the full export value that you are going to receive. Okay, if you do not have the exact export value available with yourself, if you do not have the exact export value available with yourself, then you can write a tentative amount, you can write the expected value so that the RBI is aware that okay, how much amount of forex are we going to receive from the other country. Okay, so this is a declaration, this is a specific declaration that you have to give it to the RBI. Okay, whenever we are exporting services, okay, whenever we are exporting some services, for that, for some specific services, the declaration form is not notified. Okay, the declaration form is not notified. That does not mean that you are not going to realize and repatriate that money to India. No, you still have to realize and repatriate the money to India. Just that you are not required to give the declaration to the RBI. Okay, now listen, now listen. What is the regulation telling you? Whenever you are exporting goods to any country except for Nepal and Bhutan. Okay, they are going to repeat the same thing. Whenever you are exporting any goods, services, software to any country except for Nepal and Bhutan, you are required, you are required, you are required to submit a declaration. Okay, you are required to submit a declaration to the RBI along with the necessary evidence that how much is the export value that you are going to realize. If you do not have the exact export value available with yourself, then you will have to write the expected value then you'll have to write the expected value that you're going to realize from this particular export. Okay, if there is any particular service to, to which the declaration form is not applicable, no problem, but it is your responsibility to realize that money from the outside country and to repatriate the amount to India. Okay, now there are certain transactions, there are certain transactions for which declaration is not required. Okay, if there is any particular transaction which does not involve any consideration, if there is any particular transaction which does not involve any consideration, example, when we are sending any free samples, when we are, uh, you know, repairing and sending back the goods, okay, or we are sending some goods for repair to the other country, or if say, for example, when we are exporting, when we are sending our own personal effects, when we are going for traveling, etc., for such cases, okay, or say, for example, say, for example, when you are re-exporting the aircraft, helicopter, etc., which you had taken on lease under the Cape Town Convention, etc. For that, for that, the declaration is not required. Okay, for that, the declaration is not required. Here, they have given certain list. One thing to be remembered from this particular list is whenever you are sending any goods as gift, okay, whenever you are sending any goods as gift, then also the declaration is not required, but provided only when the value does not exceed rupees 5 lakhs. Okay, when the gift value does not exceed rupees 5 lakhs, then declaration is not required because you just have to write there that the value does not exceed rupees 5 lakhs. But if the value exceeds rupees 5 lakhs, then you'll have to give a proper declaration that uh, so and so value of goods have been exported, etc. And this is not for commercial use and so on. Okay, so that was one point that you have to remember then. Another one, another one is whenever we are submitting these declarations, okay, whenever we are submitting these declaration in case of goods and services, that declaration has to be given in form number, form EDF, that is export declaration form, which is in duplicate. Okay, we are going to submit it in duplicate to the Commissioner of Customs. Commissioner of Customs will check the original one and it will send it to the nearest office of the RBI. Okay, and then the duplicate copy will be given back to the exporter so that we can give it to the authorized dealer. Okay, in case of software, in case of software, we are going to use a form called as Softex. Okay, we are going to use a form called as Softex. Softex will be submitted to the Ministry of Information Technology in three copies, means in triplicate. Okay, original one, original one will be given, original one, the Ministry of IT is going to check and give it to the RBI. Okay, the duplicate one will come back to the exporter so that I can give it to the authorized dealer. And the triplicate copy will be retained by the Ministry of Information Technology. This can be used for MCQ purpose. Okay, this can be used for MCQ purpose and whenever we are submitting the declaration, we have to make sure that we give, we attach the evidence that we are a PRI and we have a place of business in India. Then only we will be treated as an Indian exporter now. Then only we will be treated as an Indian exporter. Right. Next one. Next one. Whenever you are exporting the goods. Okay. Whenever you are exporting the goods, the export proceeds must be realized within a particular time frame. Right. The export proceeds must be realized within a particular time frame. And what is that time frame? 
that time frame is normally it should be realized within 9 months from the date of export or within the extended time period given by the or such time period which is given by the reserve bank of india whenever we are sending the goods to the warehouse okay whenever we are sending the goods to the warehouse then in that case the time period instead of 9 months it will be 15 months or the or such other period as given by the rbi okay whenever the goods are exported by the scz eou export oriented units scz scz etc then also it is by default that is the export proceeds must be realized within a period of 9 right i hope i am very very clear till here now listen now listen the next thing now listen suppose if we are not able to realize the export proceeds okay then in that case the rbi is going to intervene in between rbi is going to intervene in between and it is going to make sure that either you realize the money from outside india or you bring back the goods to india okay either of the two if the goods have been sold then please realize the money if the goods have not been sold then we will we are going to bring back those goods back to our okay and whenever the payment is coming okay whenever we are realizing the export proceeds from outside india we have to make sure that we are receiving the payment in a proper manner we are receiving proper amount unnecessary deductions has not been done right and the payment should not be delayed if any of such things happen then we have to take the approval of the rbi or we have to take the approval of the authorized dealer right now the last point here the last point here that is advance payment against exports many a times it happens that we first take the advance money and then we export the goods so for that also the central government or the rbi has made certain regulations they say that three points are there they they say that first of all if you have received any advance money okay if you have received any advance money the goods must be exported within a period of one year okay if you have received any advance money then the goods must be exported within a period of one year or the uh, more period whatever is written in your export agreement second one if there is any delay then interest payable will be will arise that is libor plus 100 basis points and whenever you receive any advance then the authorized dealer through whom you received the advance that same person should be intimated when you are sending the goods see first you would have received the advance and now you are sending the goods so that particular authorized dealer must be intimated about this particular and whenever there is any delay in shipment of goods whenever there is any delay whenever you want to pay any interest etc that can be done only after taking the prior approval that can be done only after taking the prior approval of the rbi okay now now listen next one next one comes as project exports project exports means when you are exporting any goods or services uh, outside india outside india say for example you are engaged into any turnkey projects turnkey project means where you are building a particular project you are uh, undertaking you have undertaken a particular project where you are going to give the finished product to the ultimate user okay you are going to give the finished product or you are engaged into any civil construction business etc outside india then for entering into such project for entering into such project you have to take the prior approval from this particular authority okay you have to take the prior approval from the approving authority in india approving authority in india is nothing but the exim that is export import bank of india or the authorized dealer before you accept this before you accept this uh, project exports okay in that in that the other country other country or the other person can also require performance guarantee okay so that performance guarantee can be given by us or that performance guarantee can be given by the authorized dealer there is no problem in that okay performance guarantee means a guarantee given by us that yes we will complete your taken project okay we are going to complete your project don't worry about that okay similarly 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 for doing the work there we might require some credit facility okay we might require some credit facility so even that credit facility can be availed for the uh, pro, uh, for this uh, uh, project exports right am i very very clear till here this was this was talking about this was talking about my export provisions this was talking about my export provisions now two stand alone provisions two stand alone provisions that is section number 8 and section number 9 section number 8 simply says section number 8 simply says that section number 8 simply says that whenever you have earned any amount from outside india okay whenever you have earned any amount from outside india you have to make sure that you realize that money and you repatriate that money to india compulsorily mandatorily okay now now once that amount is repatriated to india we have certain exemptions for that okay now listen just try to understand first of all an authorized person okay first of all for an authorized person an authorized person can hold forex up to that amount which is authorized by the rbi an authorized person authorized dealer or authorized person can hold that much amount of forex for which the authorization has been received from the rbi okay that much amount can be held by the authorized person 
for other people you can hold certain amount in the foreign currency account as approved by the rbi okay plus if you had acquired any forex before 8th july 1947 or you had acquired uh, such currency this 8th july 1947 prior currency by way of inheritance then you can still hold it with rbi permission okay you can hold foreign coins you can hold foreign currency coins of any value there is no restriction in that and when it comes to currency notes bank notes travelers check etc then you can hold maximum up to 2000 us dollars okay you can hold maximum up to 2000 us dollars this is the restriction given this is the restriction given to you okay to up to this amount up to this amount you can hold this particular for okay now last points last few pointers which talks about your miscellaneous provisions everyone concentrate here say for example let's talk about the authorized person okay authorized dealer who is this authorized dealer okay who is this authorized dealer this authorized dealer is nothing but your money changer who comes under the purview of the rbi who has the powers to purchase and sell this particular forex to the end users right he comes under the purview of the rbi so the authorization to this authorized person the authorization to this person the authorization to this person will be given by the rbi if this person if this person contravenes any provision or if it is required to do so in in public interest then the rbi then the rbi can cancel the authorization the rbi can cancel the authorization but only after giving a reasonable opportunity of being heard okay so first point was this person comes under the purview of rbi second point was this authorization can be revoked if required and whenever this person is doing any transaction with the end users this person this authorized person has to take a declaration that this transaction will not lead to any contravention now okay authorized person has to make himself secure that yes this transaction that he is doing on behalf of the client is a genuine transaction going on to section number 11 which says that rbi has the power to issue directions to the authorized person that we already know and if rbi issues directions to the authorized person and if rbi and if the authorized person does not comply with those directions then the penalty given on the next page would be applicable right rbi also has the power rbi also has the power to do the inspection also rbi also has the power to do the inspection of this authorized person when when or when does it have the powers suppose if it wants to check whether the information given by the authorized person is correct or not whether it wants to when it wants to gather more information from the authorized person it can do the inspection and when it wants to check whether when it wants to check whether all the provisions have been complied with or not then it can do the inspection rbi can do the inspection of the authorized person and whenever someone from the rbi whenever whenever someone from the rbi comes to do the inspection it is our duty to provide them with the necessary information and to cooperate with them okay to provide them with the necessary information and to cooperate with them if not okay if the authorized person does not uh, listen to the rbi direction or it does not file any returns to the uh, rbi etc then penalty will be applicable up to rupees 10000 and even after giving warning if it continues then further penalty of 2000 rupees per day would be applicable okay then a common section if any particular person contravenes the provisions of fma act it contravenes the rules regulations etc and if the default is a quantifiable default then up to 3 times the amount involved if it is not quantifiable then up to rupees 2 lakhs okay and in case of further offense common point and in case of uh, further offense uh, the further penalty will be 5000 rupees per day okay it will be 5000 rupees per day if you do not pay the penalty if you do not pay the penalty then imprisonment will be applicable okay imprisonment up to 3 years can be applicable if the penalty amount is more than rupees 1 crore if the penalty is a smaller amount then imprisonment up to 3 uh, if greater amount of penalty was involved then in that case imprisonment up to 3 years if smaller amount of penalty is involved then imprisonment up to 6 months will be applicable and if you have done any capital account transaction if you have done any capital account transaction more than the limits then additional punishment will be applicable that is imprisonment up to 5 years and fine will be applicable okay all these all these penalties etc will be determined by the adjudicating authority adjudicating authority it receives the complaint okay after it receives the complaint within 1 year it has to handle the complaint it is going to come ahead okay within 1 year it has to handle the complaint once it handles the complaint after that it has to determine whether there is a default or not 
if it determines that yes there is a default then it is going to impose the penalty which we are supposed to pay within a period of 90 days which we are supposed to pay within a period of 90 days if not paid within a period of 90 days then the issuers show cause notice on us okay if we do not reply properly to show cause notice or if we are still a defaulter we are trying to abscond india etc then in that case then in that case that person will be directly arrested in some cases if that person is a defaulter you need not even give a show cause notice that person can be directly arrested ma'am arrested for what period the same period that we studied on the previous page that is bigger penalty imprisonment up to three years smaller penalty imprisonment up to six months okay so first he determines the default then he imposes the penalty then he uh, then he issues a show cause notice and then then the arrest can be done okay then the arrest can be done now within we were given a time period of 90 days to pay this penalty if the adjudicating authority thinks that we will not pay the penalty within 90 days means the adjudicating authority is impatient then it can appoint it can appoint enforcement officers to recover the penalty without even waiting for 90 days to complete it, it can appoint the enforcement officers to recover the penalty from us within a period of 90 days itself and they will recover it as if it is as just like your income taxes uh, recover Okay, now listen, as soon as, as this is one opportunity given to the defaulter, as soon as a penalty order is imposed or passed on this particular person, he can go and apply to the authority for compounding. Okay, a compounding authority here means the RBI officers or the ED officers. Okay, we can go and make an application to them for compounding. The time period is not specified there. But once we make the application, within a period of 180 days, within a period of 180 days, the authority has to do the compounding okay within a period of 180 days the authority has to do the compounding and once the compounding is done then no penalty can be increased means no other proceedings can happen on that particular person and the compounding will be full and fine okay to impose the penalty to check whether penalty should be imposed or not to do the confiscation etc all these powers all these powers vest with the adjudicating authority that is given in section number 16 okay that is given in section number 16 which we have uh, just given here i've written i've already written here it's a one time read section okay now listen two time limits that we have already studied is one is penalty has to be paid within a period of 90 days okay another thing is compounding if we make an application to the authority for compounding then compounding can be done then compounding can be done within a period then compounding has to be done within a period of 180 days okay whenever aa receives any complaint aa has to consider this complaint within a period of one year i have already discussed about this okay aa will consider this complaint within one year it will adjudicate within a period of one year right if if say for example if we are not satisfied with the penalty order given by the aa we can go and file an appeal to the special director of appeals within 45 days if not agree if not agreed with special director we can go to the appellate tribunal within 45 days appellate tribunal has to try to dispose of the appeal within a period of 180 days if we are not satisfied with the decision given by the AT, then we can go and file an appeal to the high court last level only on question of law. Only on question of law within 60 days plus can be further extended by another 60 days. This was, this was all about your appeals, right? This was all about your appeals. Then in enforcement directorate, in enforcement directorate, CG is going to establish this enforcement directorate who is going to have a particular hierarchy. Okay, it is going to have the director, it is going to have the additional director, it is going to have the special director, it is going to have the deputy director, it is going to have the assistant director and such other officers as required under this particular law. Okay, as required under this particular law and all these people, all these people will come under the control of whom? All these people will come under the control of the central government. All these people will come under the control of the central government. If, if we do not want to appoint, if we do not want to appoint these officers, then apart, instead of these, instead of these, you can appoint, you can appoint police officer, you can appoint customs officer, you can appoint excise officers, you can appoint government officers. These people can be appointed and they are going to have, they are going to have all the powers as that of the income tax authorities, as if they are IT officers, they are going to have all these powers right this investigation suppose if we want to find out suppose if we want to find out whether uh, whether uh, what default has been occurred or not okay that is generally done by the adjudicating authority but adjudicating authority can delegate this work to the ed also okay investigation etc can be done by the ed officers also 
and now the last few common points here last few common points first of all if during search seizure investigation etc if there if they have found any documents in our premises or in our possession then that is by default deemed to be ours okay the signature on it the handwriting on it is deemed to be ours and unless we prove it to the contrary if i prove it that it belongs to some other person then okay otherwise it belongs to me only it is assumed as if it belongs to me only okay then cg has got the power cg has got the powers to impose certain restrictions on you and to remove the restrictions on you from this particular act cg has got those powers for that cg will have to pass a notification in the official gazette and cg will have to present this notification before both the houses of parliament okay cg has the power to give directions i have written here cg has the power to give directions to the rbi which rbi will have to comply rbi has the power to give directions to the authorized dealer which the authorized dealer will have to comply right then if there is any fema contravention which is done by a company then this is a common provision the company would be liable okay but mainly for imprisonment etc the person in charge would be liable okay all the directors officers managers secretary etc those people would be liable but if they prove that they had exercised due diligence okay they had uh, they were unaware about this particular offense or the uh, contravention took place without their knowledge or they had not given their consent etc then they will be relieved otherwise all the directors managers officers sec secretary etc everyone would be jointly and severally liable okay now say for example if the defaulter person has passed away or if the defaulter person has become insolvent then the case does not get over okay the case does not get over in case of death it goes on against the legal hire okay and in case of insolvency it goes on the amount can be recovered from the estate of the insolvent person for which we are going to appoint an official assignee or the official receiver just remember legal hire legal representative they won't be personally liable but whatever assets they have of the deceased person or of the insolvent person from that the amount can still be recovered and the last point that is bar legal proceedings the last point that is bar legal proceeding which says that if any mistake if any mistake has been done if any mistake has been done by the cg if any mistake has been done by the rbi or if any particular mistake has been done by the officer under this fema and if they prove that it was done in good faith then no legal proceedings can be initiated against them this was this was all about your this was all about your fema provisions okay we have covered all the important pointers we have covered all the important pointers of the fema provisions i hope you are very very clear with this now